Welcome to NDC Melbourne. We are so glad that you can make it. Even though we can't meet up in person, there was no way that we would miss an NDC event. That's right, William. Despite all the hurdles and challenges in the last 18 months, we just had to put this event on. So thanks everyone for attending. We have a great lineup for you, starting with Scott Hanselman in just a few minutes. And thank you to all of our other speakers as well. Remember, you can use the YouTube chat to connect with other attendees and speakers. Yes, exactly. The chat will also let you win prizes and ask any questions that you might have. To the sponsors, partners, and all the volunteers behind the scenes, thank you. You rock. We would not be able to do this without you. We have an incredible program lined up for you. We've got news, Q&A, yoga, and quizzes, so you can win some really awesome prizes. And speaking of prizes, make sure you visit the official Expo site at expo.ndcmelbourne.com. With that, enjoy the show, and we'll see you online throughout the day. I'm so sorry. That's supposed to happen on a Zoom call. Welcome, everybody. I was on mute. And welcome to NDC Melbourne. It's nothing like a Zoom call, though, isn't it? Um, we are live here from Melbourne in Australia. And yes, we are three of us, but you'll meet the other two in just a minute. Um, I'm Lars Clint, and I am here with William and Melissa. And we have a whole day planned with tech events uh, stuff. So tech content, tech quizzes, tech prizes, well, lots of tech things in general. and um, I think maybe we should first up, though, go to a gentleman who probably doesn't need an introduction, to be honest. Um, he's a purveyor of very fine thrift stores. He's a loved YouTube creator. He's a former professor, a current blogger and podcaster. And in his spare time, he also works as a principal program manager for Microsoft, sort of getting the world really excited about development content. So welcome, Scott uh, Hanselman, and thank you so much for joining us. This is quite the honor. Is it though? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I had to say that. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would, I, I was going to do the whole I'm on mute thing and then maybe spice it up a little bit with like a, a can you hear me? I'm going up tunnel. But, but, but you yeah. can't do that because you're not in Australia because we are on Australian internet, right? So we can do that gag. I don't think yeah. you're allowed to. Yeah. 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 I could pretend yeah. to be like buffering. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You got to be. You got to get pixelated though. But, yeah. Oh yeah. I don't know yeah. how to do that yet. I'm working on that. I need to stretch for yeah. to be pixelated. Oh, that's awesome. Welcome, mate. That's um fantastic to have you here. And uh, you don't have to get up at five a.m. to do this because it's your evening. So that's even better. No, I don't. You know, and I even went out of my way to make my lights match, and then I ended up on the right side of the screen where the purple is. So mm. I made yeah. all that. All this. All this incredibly hard IoT. There it is now. See? Yeah. 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 We have. Uh -huh. We have tricks. <laughs> That's amazing. Look at that. Yeah. Lower um, your no, expectations, people. Yeah, absolutely. That's I went for the for the orange, pink, the red thing. Um, because it matches my skin color. I don't know. Um <laughs> so what have you got in store for us today, Scott? I have a talk about uh mentorship, uh about the difference between mentorship and sponsorship, and then what oh, yes. what what we and by we, I'm putting you in the we now. I was going to say I, but now you're one of us. Uh, what we can do is people who are maybe a little farther along in our career, right? Yep. I think that there are a lot of exciting things happening right now in software, even though we're in the middle of a panini and it's very stressful to everyone. Uh, there's early in career people. There are people who started this year. We have interns that have never been to Microsoft that started this year. They never met a person. They've just been, they went from their bed to now they work at Microsoft. And uh, we want to encourage them. We want to move from mentorship into sponsorship. We'll talk about what sponsorship is. And then what we, what we can do as the elders to mm. encourage them with our stories and with the technology information that we have. So as I head on the way out to retirement and, I don't know, learn to golf or something, uh, they will be heading back in and how we can lift them up and lend our, uh, lend our privilege. That's awesome. Yeah, this is, um, I've been doing professional mentoring as well for, for quite a while, actually. And uh, I love it. Professional mentoring as opposed to the yeah. amateur mentoring that I've been doing. That's right. As in, I've charged people money for it and they paid. I don't know why, but they did. Yeah. I um, have never yeah, got to that level. I have got to the point where someone bought me lunch once. So that's the level <laughs> of, of mentorship that I have, a taco-based mentoring. 
Oh, tacos. Yeah. No, so it's it's really a, an area I think is super important. Um, like, How do you know where you're going if you don't have someone to guide you? Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that because you are. Um, I should just mention before we start, though, that there is a Slido link, and we will share that in the chat as well, that you can ask questions to Scott about. And there it is. Yeah. And I will make sure that I... Can you actually hear me when that's happening? I'm not yeah, sure. I can I think, hear you. I want oh, to, we can, can you hear see you. that Very QR good. code again. I'm going to go to that QR code myself. Yeah, the QR code. Yeah. So okay. throughout the talk, I'm happy to uh, to vet through the questions, and I'll ask anything uh, to Scott. I'll just rudely interrupt him. So feel free. Ask your questions. Go for it. Yeah. And, uh, and but use the slide point, link. To that point, I want to make sure that you're clear, that the, the audience is clear, that when we do live events like this, when NDC puts on a live event, it's really live. It right. Is. It isn't that I recorded it and then you have a list of what Scott's going to say and I recorded this last week. That's it's right. really us. I really did forget to go off mute. That, yeah. that was me. I did all that. Yeah. And <laughs> I I made the observation that, you know, we could just watch a YouTube, but that's no fun because we do yeah. live events here uh, at NDC. So yeah. I want Lars to interrupt me. He's going to interrupt me and he's going to bring your questions to me. Exactly. And it's going to be awkward and you're going to be like, why is that guy jumping on the key on the uh, keynote stage? Get him off. But, but that's what you would get if you were at NDC Live, uh, at least yep. down under, would be Lars just running on stage randomly and interrupting uh, the invited keynote speaker. It's the first time I've been asked to actually interrupt. I normally just do it. So just be I'll yourself, do. really, is what we're asking you exactly. to do, which I think is a challenge. But enough yes. of me. Take it away, the Scott. Audience, and, uh, by the way, Lars, the audience says yeah. that muted Lars is the best Lars. So I, I have heard that many times for some reason, <laughs> yet I still get to produce videos. So I don't know. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's do it. Thanks, let's, give a, let's give a talk, my friends. All right. Someone in the comments said that I really love tacos of late. If if by of late, uh, you mean in the last uh, 30 years? Yes, of late, I have been super interested in uh, in tacos as a uh, as a potential meal. So every great uh, keynote starts with a slide in uh, Comic Sans, because that's the way to go, my friends. Let's go ahead and have somebody who's uh, a part of the NDC Melbourne crowd uh, drop the Slideo link into the chat because the folks uh, over on the YouTube are asking for it. That'd be great. We'll have the uh, questions for the speaker. So starting with Comic Sans, I'm told that that is unprofessional. So I'm going to improve that by putting in a fancy font, a little bit of drop shadow. Uh, Michelle is offended by my, uh, my Comic Sans. So then I will add not only better fonts, but evocative stock photography as well as my cash me so you can send me money. Hi, Sophie. And uh, also just be noted that I am not only an old man, but also a TikTok influencer. I'm huge on the talk, my friends. Um, you know, when you're getting in started in tech, people show you uh, pictures like this and they imply that that is their space. That's their, this is, this is my office, right? That's clearly what everyone's technical office looks like, right? No, no, it doesn't. This is what an office looks like, right? That's like a realistic view of what a computer person's office looks like. Uh, CDs that they've never used. These are like MSDN CDs and stuff like that. But no matter whether your office looks like this or whether your office looks like that, then uh, I want you to know whether you're early in career or later in career uh, that we welcome you. We welcome you to the technical community. We welcome you whether you're old or young and whether this is your first NDC virtual or whether you are an NDC long timer and you love hanging out with us here uh, at NDC. But what I wanna talk about is community attitude, community style, what we can do as a community in order to be welcoming and what we can do as engineers who work with people who are early in career to make sure that they are successful in what they're doing. Okay, I want to show you this this uh, uh, magazine. This magazine was from March of 1984. March of 1984. Look at this. We have a young woman on a computer magazine. It says Enthusiast 99. That's actually 1984, and they are using a TI uh, 99. Um, and uh, is that a TI 89? Now I'm confused. But it is in fact a, a magazine from March of 1984. We have a young woman who's programming here. She's got her bubble gum and her pigtails and her dress. And that is and was how computing should be. So I hope that even though as we struggle to diversify tech and that we see challenges for people who are not the majority, that we are reminded that this is the way it was supposed to be, is that everyone is supposed to be programming and enjoying themselves. Because you know we hear a lot about like inclusions, being asked to dance, you know, uh, diversity is being invited to the party. These are all different quotes that people use to talk about the difference between diversity and inclusion. But one of the ones that I really liked from Janu Daniel Jude's uh, blog was that inclusion is being a member of the party planning committee. Isn't that great? 
What a great idea. That's a much better way of saying inclusion, right? Inclusion is the opposite of exclusion. You see our cartoons, the childhood cartoons there that we grew up with. You notice how there's basically one of everybody. Oh, you got like, you got one Chinese person, you got one black guy, can't have two because it's cartoons. That's called Power Rangers diversity. That is totally artificial. That's when you're doing pie charts and you're like, you know, we need a slice here and a slice there. But inclusion is just making sure that everyone is welcome, is included, and is a part of the planning committee, not just being invited to the party. So what we can do as we are inviting our new friends into tech, whether they are remote, whether they are differently abled, whether they are whatever, that they feel welcome. Back in the day, back in the day, not just in the 80s and the 70s, but I'm talking about five, six, seven hundred years ago, there was this thing called the priesthood. And this is where priests would not let the plebs, the regular people, read, where knowledge was hoarded. The priests knew how to read. They would stay up at the top of the castle in their cloister, and they would have that knowledge available to them, and they would read to people, but they didn't want them to read and paper and things like that were exclusive resources. What we don't want is for computers to be like that. All this knowledge should be available to everyone. We shouldn't be hoarding any knowledge, keeping any knowledge secret. That's why we're on a live stream right now and our friends at NDC are making this stream available free on YouTube because that knowledge and allowing you to have access to experts in the fields is so exciting. This was a, a quote here from 1974. 1974, where they were already recognizing this gentleman, Ted Nelson, in his computer lab was noticing that that the technology priesthood, the priests of tech, were already putting people down. Oh, you know, you're no, no true programmer uh, is a programmer unless you've written your own Linux kernel. You know, unless you've written your own C, C compiler, can you really call yourself a software developer? We don't want uh, that kind of an attitude in our environment, right? We don't want to see gatekeepers. Those gatekeepers are standing at the gate. They're standing in front of the club and they've got the velvet rope that they can open up and allow you in. And we don't want anyone to be controlling that information flow for an entire social system for technology, whether it be JavaScript or .NET or Python or whatever. We want that information to be available. And what we can do is set up our new friends and our new uh, early and career folks for success. We can set them up for success and allow them to be involved in technology. And that's a thing to remember, to remind ourselves of. How did you get into tech? What was the thing that got you involved and what keeps you in tech? And just because you've been in tech three years or five years or 10, it's never too early to be sharing your information. A lot of early in tech folks might say, well, what am I to say? I'm just a, I'm just a junior developer. It's, I don't wanna start a blog. There's nothing for me to talk about. No, no, your experience, your, um, uh, your journey into tech is important. So what I want folks to do, no matter what level they are, is share their energy. Got to put out the work, put out the things that you're excited about. Don't waste your keystrokes. I'll talk about that in a second. Your experience is more interesting to me than whether or not you're an expert in .NET or expert at Python. I don't want someone to say, I'm not going to do a C-sharp tutorial. They've all been done. Well, I haven't seen the one written by Lars or David or Michelle or Chadius or Sophie or Mich you know, These are the people whose experiences into C-sharp is interesting to me. Oh, well, I found it to be easy because of this, or I found this to be difficult, or I like video content. I like textual context. Put those experiences out into the world. Keep your blogs running. Blogging is dying, and it's not my blog. I'm not the one causing blogging to die. You all need to be blogging more. Put that information out, and then that energy will come back to you. I like to joke that if you blog occasionally uh, for uh, a number of years like me, uh, for the last 20 years, you too will be a mid-level computer person that people have uh, maybe heard of once or twice. Hey, oh, Scott. My goodness, have... it's Lars. He's left Hello. on stage. He's interfering with everything. Get off the stage. <laughs> yes, sir. I just wanted to uh, say we've broken the ice of the question pool. So now the floodgates are open, got? I believe. But it's actually a really good question. It's Isaac's asking, at what point in your career did you realize that your strongest skill as a mentor is your storytelling? I thought that was a pretty, uh, pretty good question, actually. That is a lovely question. I will actually <laughs> defer that a little bit because I'm going to get to a section about storytelling. Uh -huh. But I would, I would offer this answer, this short answer before I get to that, is there are people who will find that their gift is that they're the best at what one thing. 
I'm the, the .NET MAUI person. I'm the Xamarin person. I'm the Python PyTorch person. And then there are people who will be Swiss Army knives, funny little knives that aren't good at anything. Um, and uh, then there will be people like myself where I figured out a couple of years ago that I'm a pretty average programmer, but I'm a pretty darn good teacher. So my job is to knock the doors down, to open the gates and say, come on, everybody, let's go. The water's fine. Everybody in the pool. Fantastic. And that's what I like to do. So I would say it took me a while to come to that. I am not a coder. I'm a teacher, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Coding enables your teaching, basically. It does. Well, I'm, I, think I'm a, I think of myself as a professional enthusiast. You know, mm -hmm. I really like people who are enthusiastic about their jobs, right? There's some totally people agree. who, there's some people who keep knocking on my door and they say, have you heard the news? And I don't know what the news is, but I'm very excited that you're excited about the news. Come on in. Let's talk about the news. <laughs> I'm running around about IoT and Raspberry Pis and open source pancreases and C Sharp and F Sharp. Have you heard the news about .NET? Have you heard the news about open source? Come on. How can you not be super excited about this stuff? Mm. That's the best teachers, in my opinion. I agree. All right. I'll go back again. Ah, you're a star. You're lovely. Thank you so much. All right. So back to the slides, my friends. So you share your energy, which is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get you excited about this stuff. That energy will come back to you. But I made a comment here in the middle. I said, don't waste your keystrokes. Don't waste your keystrokes. When I say conserve your keystrokes, that's really significant. This is really important. Um, you have a finite number of keystrokes left in your hands before you die. That's a really intense statement, right? We've gone from this super high energy talk to being like, uh, okay, thanks for that bit of mortality. But let's say, I'm just looking at the flow of chat here. Let's say that Sophie emails me and she's like, hey, Scott, great talk. Saw you at NDC. You're awesome. Here's a question. I mean, I know Sophie from the internet, like Twitter, but I'm not going to go and give Sophie 2,000 of my keystrokes for free. I'm not going to be like, tappity, 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 write a whole long email. And then she's like, thanks. Okay. What happened to those keystrokes? They were thrown out into the universe. But what can I do with them? I can put them anywhere with a URL. I can put them in a blog, in a Medium post, in a, in a SharePoint, in a Word doc, in a Google doc, somewhere, in a pamphlet, in a book. I could do a YouTube video. When someone emails you, when an early in career person emails you a question, it is a gift. They have given you a gift of an awesome question. Wouldn't you rather give them a URL to the answer to that question than to just type, 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 burn a half an hour, and then it goes out there? The best part is that when I go to sleep, that email that I that 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 um, that URL that blog post that I put out there works for me while I'm sleeping. See, so you might say, well, no one's going to visit my blog. Maybe I'm only going to have like two people visit my blog. Well, then if two people visit your blog, you just double the number of keystrokes you have. But most likely, ten, a hundred, two hundred people are going to visit your blog, right? And what that means is that that is going to uh, multiply your power. Like I said, I'm a mid-level blogger. You know, I'm kind of known, but like I'm, I can't go. I'm not, I'm not getting recognized at the grocery store. But in the computer world, hey, oh, yeah, someone's a pretty good guy. That's because I show up consistently for the last 30 years, and I share my stuff as much as I can. And I think that we as a community should do the same. You're here right now. You're in the top one percent of programmers. I just made up that uh, statistic because you're here at NDC and you're watching this talk. If you have a blog even higher. If you're on social media, you're sharing your information. If you volunteer at your local school, if you have a mentorship relationship like Lars is talking to people and lifting them up and lifting their voices, you're in the top uh, percentage of, of programmers because you're not just coding, you are sharing the knowledge. Chad makes a comment in the chat here where he says everyone's blowing the cobwebs off their blog right now. Own your URLs, my friends. Own the URL. Own your own your words. Don't give Facebook your words. Don't give Twitter your words. Your words should start at a domain that you own, that you control, and then you share them on social. But where's MySpace? It's gone. Where's GeoCities? It's gone. All those websites are gone. Your keystrokes belong in a place where you control it. You control it. All right, my friends? So... Oh, Michelle makes another great point. If you raise your hand, if you paid for a URL with the intention of a blog and never did anything, I have 49 registered domains. So I've been there. Trust me. There's only one that matters. It's my name. Yes, 49. Lars. 
Hello. Yeah, I just pop up from time to time. This is fantastic. Um, so, I, yeah, I had another question, and it was pertinent right to what you were saying before. And Bron's asking that the you know the number of topics and everything is is not a problem for blog articles. Lots of ideas, but the hardest part is the example code, and actually kind of making it usable, like a tutorial kind of thing. Any tips for that? Mm. Well, ultimately, uh, I would say back in the day it was snippets, right? You help people with like five or ten snippets. These days, a GitHub repo or a gist is a really great place to do that kind of stuff. Uh, I think it's fair to say that GitHub's not going to go anywhere. Uh, usually, if it's a complicated thing, I'll zip it up and I'll have a release. And here's the sample, like babysmash.com, a game for babies, is a sample that I made a number of years ago. Um, I, I usually use GitHub for long, complicated examples. And I always make it so I can go git clone, and then you type build. right? And everything sucks if you go to clone or GitHub repo, and it doesn't build. So then nobody oh, God, we all been there. Right? So I recommend that. <laughs> but I wouldn't get overwhelmed. I wouldn't get overwhelmed to the point where you feel that you need to have a complete sample. Right. Yep. Sometimes just, you know, 20 or 30 lines of code is all people need. Keep in mind that all of Stack Overflow succeeded very well without fully downloadable, perfect samples. Therefore, your blog can, too. That's true. Very good. Thanks, God. All right. Um, now, moving on to the next thing, you might say, well, I don't want to kick off my blog. I don't want to go and blow the dust off my blog because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm an amateur. Oh, they're actually, by the way, they're arguing now about gist versus gist. I've never heard anyone say gist. Tell me the gist of your day. No, it just, and it's gif, hard G, gist, soft G. But now it's gonna become a whole thing. And everyone's arguing now and they're gonna go off and talk about other things. We're all amateurs. We're all amateurs. There are no professionals. I went to school 30 years ago. My degree doesn't mean anything anymore. It just taught me, my degree taught me how to learn. My degree taught me how to absorb information. My degree taught me assembly language and object Pascal and, and C. And other than C, I'm not using any of those things anymore. So the argument that there are everyone's a professional and an expert is, uh, is, 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 is those days are over. I think that sometimes people come around saying, you know, I got, uh, I got 20 years experience. I've been doing this for 20 years, doing this for, for 30 years. Well, do you have 20 years experience or do you have the same year's experience 20 times? This is a really important thing. This is one of those like pause for effect type, like things that make you go, hmm, hmm, right? Do you have the same year's experience 20 times? We have to be honest with ourselves. I want you to think about this and maybe post it in the chat. Let's say you have five years experience or 10 or 15. Do you feel good about all of those years? I've been doing this for about 30 years. To be really honest with you, here live at NDC, I would tell you that about seven of them, I kind of slept through. I slept through those years, meaning I wasn't present. I wasn't intentional. I wasn't in the moment. I wasn't really there. And the experience that I could have gained by being present in the moment, taking classes, taking notes, being conscious in meetings, not sleep walking through it because life happens. Uh, those years were wasted. Those years are over. So the truth is I probably have about 23 years experience, not 30. Maybe of the last five, the pandemic was your year where you know nothing got done. I didn't learn anything. I didn't, it didn't grow. What this is for me is a reminder of two things. One, to be honest with myself about, you know, well, I stayed at this company five years and I didn't really learn anything. So I wouldn't really feel like that was five good years of experience. But also uh, whether or not I want to you know stand in my stand in my own understanding of computers and say yeah the first couple of years were rough but the last 5 years were great it, ask yourself how much experience you have and whether or not uh you uh, uh you want to assert those years i'm looking here uh in the chat here someone says same years experience a number of times interesting uh michelle is pointing out how incredibly old i am so thank you for that gift and uh oh i love this uh, Sirdar is saying that they've learned more in the last two years and the previous change because the job change was a good kick to get their mojo back. I love it. This is fantastic. Really great stuff. Bad experience can be good experience, but also poisonous companies you might need to get out of there. Make sure that you are conscious. And this is a moment for you maybe after this talk to sit quietly and ask yourself, what did I learn this year? What could I do if I wake up tomorrow and change my perspective? Maybe I'll feel like I could get my mojo back and uh, go ask different questions or listen more at work. I really love this slide with Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee, of course, you know, was one of the inventors of the World Wide Web. And notice his 
job title. He didn't say the. He didn't say he's the web developer. Like, you know how I really wanted to be senior web developer. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait till I get senior in front of my title. And now here's Tim Berners-Lee. And he could have just said the. I'm the web developer. Yeah, I made it. That was me. But he's modest. And he says web developer. So if he's got that good attitude, then I too am going to have that good attitude. I love that. Sophie points out no more sleep living. A lot of really great stuff happening in um, uh, in the chat here. Uh, Sardar is pointing out humility, humility 100%. I love that. Another thing that's worth pointing out is the idea of finding a mentor. We talked a little about this in the opening with Lars. Finding a mentor. You're never too old to get good advice. Remember how I said uh, I wanted you all to become mentors. I also want you to find one. I want you to find a mentor. That means that, uh, you know, I could go around with an attitude of like, hey, I'm old. I should mentor as many people as possible. Who's my mentor where I'm the mentee? Maybe they're younger than me. Maybe they're going to give me a fresh perspective. What flavor of mentor do you want? Do you want a, a life coach? Do you want a uh, a coding mentor? I might you know, hire a 22 year old or be, befriend a 30 year old to teach me Python. It's not about the age. It's about the difference in experiences. So I don't want to be uh, egotistical imply that I don't need a mentor. But then if you're early in career, maybe you're only three or four years into programming, you're not too young to share your experiences. So you can go back and share because you're just a few years ahead of those people, right? You're just a few years ahead of people. Now, here's where things get really interesting because when programmers start thinking about word definitions, they start to parse those words, right? Because with object-oriented programming, you know, uh, naming things is important. You might look at the words mentorship versus sponsorship and not think that they're any different. But mentors, they help you with your strengths, they advise you, they guide you sponsors, they are spotlights and they are kind of creating luck. They are inventing luck, creating luck, and they lift you up into new spaces. A mentor says, you should try to get into that meeting. That could be good for your career. A sponsor takes you into that meeting, sits you at the table, and then backs away, which is a very different perspective. So you'll have a collection of mentors and a collection of sponsors, and they'll come and go. They'll come and go in your life. Uh, you won't necessarily have lifelong mentors. That's another important thing to think about. You can even go and look at sponsorship as a spectrum, as a spectrum from more passive mentors that give you advice, all the way up to someone who's fully advocating at you for you. And you may already have one of these at work. Who's the person at work who's the opportunity giver? Who's the person at work who's a connector and connecting you to, uh, to new uh, opportunities and new people. Uh, that's gonna be different perhaps than the person who is the strategizer, who's helping you plan your career and think about your strategies and things like that. So we, myself as a later in career person, can start what's called lending privilege. Lending privilege can be like my positional privilege, like I'm kind of a, you know, a high up person at Microsoft. So someone who's earlier in their career, who has a lower rank, I can lend my privilege and I can say, you should come into this meeting. You should join us in this standup and I'll lift them up. And I have unlimited amounts of that. I can bring an unlimited number of people into uh, a meeting like that. Uh, I can share opportunities with them. I should say, you could come speak at, uh, uh, at NDC. I have a feeling like Lars is gonna pop in at any moment. He's stressing me out. Ah, there he is. Here I am. <laughs> yes, sir, that was, what's on your mind? That was eerie. I did not prompt that for you, and here I was. Anyway, <laughs> um, we've got another question, which actually I can relate to quite a lot because I live in the middle of absolutely nowhere. I travel in to Melbourne today to host this so that we wouldn't have to talk through you know, two cans and some string and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I live in a rural area. How do you find mentors in a rural area? Because it can be mm -hmm. really, really tricky. Yeah. Well, I think that we all learned over the last year that video is a thing. And yep. uh, it's funny how we have discovered, uh, keep, keeping in mind that I've worked remotely from a rural area in rural Oregon for Microsoft for the last 15 years. I've never, everyone thinks I live in Seattle. I have never lived or worked in Seattle. And I occasionally drive up there, but I haven't been up to work in two years. So I've been telling people, myself, Phil Hack, Damian Edwards, we've been saying, video, video, video for 15, 20 years. Now we've proven it. Mm. Now we have Discord, we have Twitter, 
We have StreamYard. We have Zencaster. We have opportunities to have these, these, these get-togethers. So you can organize a virtual get-together. You're, you're organizing your game, your gamer friends and your D&D friends on Discord. Why don't you get involved with a mentorship ring? Not just a one-on-one -on -one mentorship ring, but a, a pool of people who all need different things at different levels. And I've assembled a couple of mentorship rings uh, at, uh, at Microsoft, and I'm trying not to be the leader of the ring, but rather the facilitator. And then it's a matchmaking kind of thing. Oh, like, you know, uh, I don't know, rock climbing, compiler design, you should talk to so-and-so, they're interested in compiler design. And then you have a, an engagement for two weeks, three weeks or whatever, totally. you learn what you need to le learn. So you wanna kind of have that, um, that connective, connective tissue happening. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. The people that I mentor, uh, I have never, oh, I've met one of them, but the others I've never met face to face. Yeah. So it's very, very possible. Yeah. But it's all about what feeds your spirit. Again, this is about being intentional. Mm. For me, I have a, a bagel shop that I go to uh, and I meet people there at the bagel shop. So we commiserate over bagels, but then I have people who are in other time zones and we do our kind of our Skype calls or our team calls and we have those conversations. The important yeah. part is not to just show up and talk it's to have a plan. Like, what are we gonna talk about today? Set a, a light agenda. And the thing that I need to always remember as, a, uh, as an older person, as a, an, an elder, is a mentorship relationship with, let's say, 20-year-old Lars should not be, Scott lectures Lars every week, no, like absolutely. an uncle. And you go, oh, thank you so much for your wisdom, old man. And then that's our relationship, right? I can't wait to get a gray beard myself. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's coaching, it's encouragement, it's strategies, and it needs to be, yeah, people are saying peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. Those yeah. are the kind of things. I think the yeah. key word's intention. I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's yeah. got to be intentional. And, and and actually, one other thing, Aaron uh, Dandy in the chat here is saying that they went into the Rust Discord and they got a stranger to par with, pair with them, rather, on a, a bad program. They Remember do. how I said, all I've done all Lars has done in the last you know, 20 years is shown up. You're known in the community because you arrive, you are there. If you show up in the Rust Discord for some weeks, it's not gonna be weird for you to say, I'm looking for a mentor. No. Right, if you show up on day one of Twitter, one follower, you said nothing, I'm looking for a mentor, you're basically taking a chance, who knows? But if it's like, oh yeah, that's so-and-so, that's JT, he's always at the user group, good dude. You should introduce them to Sophie, you should introduce them to Chattius. They could hang out together and mentor. Showing totally. up is a big part of life. Fantastic. Uh, I'll go back in my hole. Oh, lovely. All right, cool. Are we having fun, my friends? I hope this isn't, uh, isn't boring you. This is good. All right. The other thing that people don't remember and they don't realize about mentorship is that it happens in phases, right? Mentor in phases. What is your career phase? What is their phase? And um, make sure that you're conscious about where they are positionally, especially if they're th that you're, they're at your job. If they are diagonal to you at your job, that's ideal. That means they're not your boss. You don't have your boss mentor you or your boss's boss mentor you. What you do is you find someone who's above you in rank in another org. That means that they can't affect your reviews. They can't mess up your reviews. They can't hurt you but they are a parallel universe, a low key variant, as it were, of yourself. That's a best kind of mentor, someone who is a future version of you. And as we mentioned before, when Lars popped in, mentorship is a two way street, not a scheduled regular lecture from an old person, super important. Okay, so let's talk about some stories. I'll tell you a couple of fun stories that make me happy and you can tell me if they're stupid. That'll be fun. Remember before I mentioned Swiss Army knives, this is a big thing for me. I really am a fan. I actually have the Swiss Army knife that my dad bought me when I was 12, and I keep it always available to me on my desk here, not just because it's got cool, you know, hex screwdriver type stuff, and, and the Swiss Army knife has a pen. It's got a freaking pen, so I can look at that. Can't really see it. Oh, that's tweezers. That's because I'm blind. It's got a pen in the thing. It's got tiny screwdrivers in the thing. The thing about the Swiss Army knife that's interesting is that the Swiss Army knife is a really a lousy pair of scissors. It's not really good at anything. It's kind of mediocre. It is a generalist. It's okay to be a generalist, right? It's okay to be a funny little knife that isn't amazing at everything, but we can, we can say one thing about the Swiss Army knife is it is a good knife. So, when you are thinking about technology, often you're gonna to try to say, should I, should I just specialize in jQuery? 
Should that be my thing? I'll just be the best person at jQuery. And then jQuery goes away or React or Angular or whatever, or technology du jour goes away. What doesn't go away? CPUs, memory, storage, distributed systems, design patterns. None of those things are technology specific. Be a good knife. Yes, Lars. <laughs> oh, you did notice. Um, there's there. Uh, questions are coming now, Qu thick and fast. Yeah, that's yeah. lovely. I uh, know it's really good. So um, I got two that are sort of related, but um, I'll go with the first one first. What tips do you have for a mentee? So how can a mentee get the most out of it mm -hmm. uh, from a mentor, obviously, and, and besides buying tacos for him? Yeah. Bribery, of course, is gifts is really what it's all about. Um, what a mentee can do, and this is this is important, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stare into the camera for this one. Show up. Yeah. I have had mentees ghost me on meetings. I've had mentees show up and have nothing to say. I've had mentees complain about how everyone sucks but them. I've had mentees not take responsibility for the things that they're doing. Show up with questions, with an agenda of three items, and pull the information from your mentor. What do you want to know? I'm dealing with a difficult person at work. I don't understand hash tables. Please explain the cloud to me. And that sets your mentor up for success. If you do that, then you're going to get what you want out of it, as opposed to a lecture from a, an elder once a week. Yep, T completely agree. Um, yeah, yeah, be Lovely. prepared. And then the other one is, as a consultant, it's sometimes difficult to be a mentor because I can't build the time. Should seniors use a percentage of their time to mentor? That's Ooh, a really good question. That's a tough one. As a consultant, when you're thinking about your life in the context of hourly, that is a challenge. The way that I did that when I was a consultant is I thought about not just my billable hours, but I thought about all of my hours, meaning all of my waking hours, and be intentional about that. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this every day, but what, what an interesting challenge it would be um, if you wrote down every single hour for a week, not 40 hours, I mean seven times 24. Mm -hmm. And you have to be honest with yourself. Sunday afternoon, sat in the garden for three hours, 2 a.m. on a Tuesday, binge watched Netflix because yep. my job sucked that day and I needed to revenge nighttime procrastination and steal the time back because my job sucks and I hate it. So I watched something stupid on Netflix for three hours. Be intentional about it. Then look at that and think to yourself, wow, I wasted what? Some amount of time. Now I'm not saying I'm advocating for hustle culture or what's called productivity culture. Every minute counts. No, like you can take a leisurely crap on the toilet and scroll on TikTok. That's allowed. But if you burn three hours watching Netflix, maybe burn two hours watching Netflix. Maybe mm -hmm. walk on a treadmill and watch Netflix. Like what can you do to combine things, to fold hours together, right? I started doing TikToks on my treadmill, on walks, combining two things, right? Um, and I bet you you could find an hour or two that you had wasted that would be a gift to someone else and it wouldn't affect your billable hours. Good answer. Thanks, Scott. Good stuff. Lovely. Lars adding value. All right. Let's try to get through some of these interesting questions here. These are uh, some stories and some stuff that is uh, that I'm thinking about. First, young people and problem solving comes up. I think that problem solving is asking yes, no questions at scale. All right. Yes, no sec questions at scale. Yes, no questions at scale is how you debug. And when you as an early in career person sits down with a later in career person and you wonder why I've been trying to debug this for six hours and they just they just had it right there. I'm going to share with you the reasons that those senior people can do that. And one of the fundamental things that they can do is they can eliminate entire classes of problems with a yes, no question. All right. So here's a question for you, my friends. Actually, Lars, pop in here for a second. You're going to be the young person in this experiment. Pop in here. Pretend that you're a uh, Hi, person. Scott. <laughs> Maybe don't do that. Too much? No, that sorry. A little too much. A little too on the nose. <laughs> All right. Lars, young person, my toaster is broken, and I really want toast. We're going to learn how to be a programmer today. I need toast. Help me out, buddy. What's, the, uh, what's going on with my toaster? Have you got a lighter? You <laughs> You just put a lighter. What does a lighter have to do with the toaster? You're toast solving it. Will I just burn the toast directly? Well, toast is just you know carbohydrates turning into sugar. You just add heat, isn't it? 
<laughs> All right. I need it to actually, I want to use the toaster I paid for. Oh, you do? Okay. Plugged yep. it in. It's not working. Uh, you know, a simple-minded person might say, well, just buy a new toaster. Yeah, no, no, yeah. no. But we're going to debug it because you and I are systems thinkers. Okay? Yes. So give me some questions to ask. What are some yes? Oh, uh, there we go. Hassan says, is it plugged in? Yeah, I was he about says, to buy a new one. That's a good one. It could be a hardware problem. Have right? you tried turning it off and on again? Okay. Is the power on? I like that. How would I mm -hmm. test to see if the power to the toaster is on? We put something else into the PowerPoint. Oh, look at that. Plug in something hey. else. See how it's like, we did not plan this. No, okay. we didn't. <laughs> I plugged, we didn't, we didn't talk about this. Ahead of time. I plugged in a light. The light is not turning on, which uh -huh. I do know. Call electrician. No, you see if uh, you're sure the light's working. Well, you can keep going down that path, but yeah, yeah. there's that path. What else right. is broken? Okay. So uh, is it connected to the Wi-Fi? Peter says. Good question. <laughs> yeah, I, <think. laughs> I hope not. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I, I plugged it in. I got no power anywhere. So is the power even on in the mm -hmm. house? How would I go and see if the power in the house is even on? And, and if it's see bigger the than neighbor's that. got power. Yeah. Look at you. How did you know that? Cause it happens frequently when I leave, when you live rurally. As you live rurally. in rural Australia. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Do the neighbors have power? That's mm. a great question. We started this whole thing. I just want burnt bread. And it's now right. we're asking a fundamental question about does the neighbors have power? And if you wanted to take it, you know, maybe as far as like Dylan Beatty would take, was there an EMP? Has there been an attack? <laughs> have the aliens uh, taken over, right? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves. All of this is part of the system, right? It's always DNS, whatever it is probably. But the point is when you're a programmer, you need to be thinking about systems. It's not about toaster expertise. It's not about no. having a degree in toast. It's about, well, where does the toaster fit into the system? If someone were to, by the way, I don't, know, I don't know if you saw this last night, but I was doing something stupid. I recorded myself taking LinkedIn assessments live on my phone for products I don't know anything about. Did not see that. <laughs> so Sounds amazing. I go onto LinkedIn and it's like, you should become uh, certified in, in AWS. So I'm like, okay, I don't sure. know anything about AWS, right? I know it's a cloud. <laughs> So I recorded the screen and I started taking the test and I passed and I'm now certified in AWS. That is fantastic. So a new job opportunity. Fantastic. Exactly. Does that mean I'm smart and I know lots about AWS? No, no, not at all. It means systems thinking, right? Yep. Computers have CPU and memory and subnets are things. I have, an, I have a funny example for that actually. Well, let's not say funny clown, haha, -ha, but interesting because I like cars, right? But I grew up with 10 thumbs. I had no idea about fixing anything. But applying software debugging skills to cars actually goes a really, really far, uh, a really long way. Because it's so like, yep. what's not working? Okay, that's working. Then you do the next thing. And it's this exact same approach. So Systems thinking is the deal. So if we go back to the slides and we look at someone who's early in career versus someone who's later in career, the reason that you're Googling a lot for stuff, hopefully with Bing, you are, you don't know what question to ask. Later in the career, it's not that we know stuff. It's that we know questions to ask. Right. And as the American president, Abraham Lincoln said, it's always DNS. I made a list on the left hand side here of things to check. This is literally just a silly list that I just made up of like a young person comes to me and asks me what's wrong. And I ask all these questions and then they fix it and they go, oh, my goodness, how did you know? You're so smart. Oh, wow. I can't wait till I'm experienced. Now, I don't know what's going on when, when non-technical parent calls me. And I'm like, look for a gear, click on the gear. Like, is there anything like a gear? It's and not if that they ask, if they ask to fix the printer, you just run away because yeah, you never can turn it off and turn it on again. Yeah. And then as my, and the other thing to watch out for, right. Is uh, if you see, if you hear hoof beats, you want to think horses, not zebras. Uh, as my sons were watching Sherlock Holmes recently and this lady killed her husband. And then she was also seen on the other side of town. And Watson says to Sherlock Holmes, it was twins. That's how they did it. There's twins. And Sherlock Holmes says, it's never twins. It's too obvious. It's never twins. These are all just things to check. You, as an early and career person, will collect these items. So problem solving is collecting questions and asking yes, no questions at scale. Let's bang through the last couple ones here as we get towards the end of our chat. So layering is when you start hiding complexity. It's vertical, vertical layering. And layering in computer science is actually not layering. It is lying. It is the computer lying to you. When you call an API or you make a function in a virtual machine, it's an abstraction on top of something else. That layer is meant to hire 
other things, to, to hide other things rather. Um, and typically the things that it's hiding may be reused. It may be a thing that you already know about. Here's an example that I always like to use. Um, people know about HTTP, right? You all know how to like call an HTTP get and things like that, right? Um, but no one really thinks about email. No one presses F12 tools and looks at an email getting sent. This is an actual on the wire email with name value pairs, content type plain, encoding, and look, a, a little separator. Here's another separator. Here's the plain part of the email. Here's the HTML part of the email. That looks surprisingly familiar, does it not? This is posting a multi-part email, a multi-part HTML form, and this is sending email. So all this time, email, which has been around forever, is name value pairs with separators because multi-part form data is a specification. And here's posting an HTML form. So would you, have, would, you should be surprised. I hope you're surprised that email and HTML are similar. This is a really important thing that makes it seem like later in career people know more than they do. It's not that I know more, it's that I've seen more and that I'm, I've realized I probably already know a thing. HTML is text that goes over HTTP over a port. Email is text that uses SMTP and goes over a port. It's all just internet traffic. If you understand things at the text level, just like Lars was using the example about cars, right? It's got wheels, I can probably drive it. We've seen that in the movies where a mechanic is like, it's got wheels, I can drive it, it's got wings, I can fly it, okay? Now, that means we can reuse good ideas. On the left-hand side, we have a spinning hard drive, physical hard drive. On the right-hand side, we have an old record player, an old Victrola. And in both instances, we have a circle with encoded data that spins and a head that picks it up. And we have a circle with encoded data and a head that picks it up. And this might be terabytes and invented last year or made last year. And this might be 150 years old, but the idea is the same. A Blu-ray, a hard drive, a record player, they are the same, they are the same. Now, in computer science, we have composition. Composing things has a, it's all part of layers. Uh, layers are on top of each other. Uh, composition are things are inside of each other. Uh, this is a real story of a thing that happened to me and, and understanding how things fit together was how I solved it. This gentleman here is my now friend, Chris Connor, who uh, is an actor. And he was in a great show on Netflix called uh, Altered Carbon. And in the film, he played an AI named Poe. He was basically an AI a construct that represented Edgar Allan Poe. And I met him on Twitter and I said, you know, I'm a big fan of your work. You're a great fella. We should hang out sometime and have tacos. So we did. So we hung out and we had tacos and he's, he's amazing and I'm a nerd and we hung out and, uh, you know, we, he's a good dude. Then I came home after podcasting with him and this is what I found on the SD card. This is me wondering where my files are from the interview with my new, uh, best friend, right? Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, this man is never going to be friends with me again. And we're not going to hang out at all. How am I going to call this actor and say, hey, man, can we redo that podcast that we just burnt an entire hour on? Because I'm an idiot and I lost the file. And you can see here that the hard drive had an infinite recursive empty folder. The files were gone. I don't know anything about SD cards. I don't know anything about file systems, but I do know that File Explorer is a uh, an abstraction on top of a bunch of things. Yeah, I thought I was gonna die. I was sick, literally sick. I was like, well, do I just ghost the guy? Do I apologize? There's no scenario where this goes well. I went into File Info and I noted that File Info said that 300 megs were used up on the disk, okay? So this is a black box, right? That's a, an SD card. This is one of the SD cards that I would use. And this card had nothing on it. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm dead. But it's all about bytes, right? It's an array of bytes. It's specifically 345,776,936 bytes in, a, in an array. 
let's go look at them. So I dumped that SD card. I made an image file of it because I didn't want to hurt it. Because, you know, when things are corrupted, I want a copy of the corruption. I don't want to mess it up. So I made an image file. I just Googled for how to make an image file out of an SD card. And I started poking around. And I knew that it was a, a FAT or file allocation table card um, because you have a FAT file system. And I started poking around and looking at the structures and noticing an awful lot of zeros. And the starting cluster should definitely not be zero. And I didn't know this stuff. I looked it up. You know this stuff. You know this stuff. You just don't acknowledge that you know this stuff. It's literally the difference between driving a car your entire life and never knowing there's an engine versus having a, eh, a passing familiarity that you can open the boot, you can open the, the trunk, you can open the front of the car and find an engine inside and go, wow, there's an engine. I'm not saying that every early in career person should become a mechanic. I am saying that a familiarity with how your car drives will make you a better, more powerful engineer, and it will allow you to be more in control. The best way to do this is to know one layer below your comfort zone. So just pick your comfort zone and go one layer below there. And like folks are saying in the chat, Google is your best friend. So I ended up fixing those bytes in the image file, found that the two files, the WAV files uh, in there, and learned a lot about how applications talk to the file system and they talk to IO control, which talks to devices and dug in below my comfort zone and discovered how these things are composed. Exactly, Hassan is saying, go one level down, my friends. And finally, what makes later in career people seem magical and what we can do to make early in career people successful is by helping them understand pattern recognition. I've seen a thing before, that seems familiar, I've heard of that. One time I spent 13 hours debugging a segmentation fault in a Raspberry Pi. And, um, oh, there's Lars, I'm almost done Lars, like two minutes. Okay, okay, we'll take it after, we'll do it. Are you here to now. kick me out because I'm running late? No, 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 we're not late. I feel like Just I'm keep late. going, we'll do questions okay. in a minute. Okay, well you can, oh, there he goes away, he left me alone. Oh God. All right. I spent 13 hours debugging a segmentation fault in .NET Core in a Raspberry Pi, and I would I made a file, said hello world. I copied it over to the Raspberry Pi, and it crashed. I was like, that sucks. And I pounded on it for a while, and it was awful. And then I even made a folder, and I put a folder called good, and I put my application in there. And I made a folder called bad, and I put the application in there. And I noticed something weird. Let's squint, shall we? Let us squint. Here's a zero D. Here's a zero D. Here's a big blank space. Here's a big blank space. Where, where are all the zero Ds? The one that doesn't run has no 13s. Zero D is 13. Why is that? That's super annoying. Well, it turns out I was using FTP file transfer protocol to copy my files over. And you'll notice right here that this is a executable called Raspberry Pi running on Linux. It doesn't have an, an extension because Linux doesn't use extensions. And in my transfer program, there's been a bug which the, uh, the owner of the, uh, the, the manager of this open source project, FileZilla, refuses to admit as a bug called treat files without an extension as an ASCII file. ASCII, of course, being the standard American standard of something, something character encoding, yada, yada, yada. It's the thing that describes like an A is 67 and a B is 68, those kind of things. And I realized, where have I seen zero D before? Where have I seen zero D before? Well, zero D is a 13. Like I said, it's a carriage return. And a zero A is a line feed. So my executable, my program was being treated like a text file and it stripped out the carriage return and replaced it with nothing because on Unix, on Linux machines, they don't use carriage returns, they use line feeds. So it corrupted the file because it said it has no extension and it ripped it out. So then the question is, my young friends, what's a carriage? Why is it returning? We have people learning Git right now and they're setting features like auto CRLF. They're wondering why their text files get corrupted and they don't realize that in fact, a typewriter has a carriage along the top here, 
that carries the paper. And this item right over here, the carriage return is used to go push it all the way back. So you go type, 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 do, 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 do. carriage return, ding. And then the knob turns, the what's called the platen, turns and feeds the next line. Carriage return, line feed, carriage return, line feed. Isn't it weird that a typewriter that was later hooked up as a terminal to a mainframe in the 40s somewhere, and then ASCII was invented and someone decided that 13 moves the carriage and 10 feeds the line, is now causing us consternation and frustration in the year of our Lord 2021. How do I know that? Because I dug deeper. How do you know that? Because you watched this wonderful talk at NDC and we had all kinds of fun. And now if you ever bump into an issue like that, you're going to be like, 13, 10, that's carriage return line feed. Patterns, asking the right questions. How are things layered? How are they composed together? And problem solving at scale allows us to make cool stuff. And that is itself super cool. I'm going to actually skip ahead and just say to you all how happy I am that you are here and invite Lars back on to interrupt me in that way that only Lars can. And we'll do a couple of questions as we head out to our next talk. Interrupted. Consider Hello. yourself interrupted. Yeah, we do. Um, actually, I had a question as well, but we'll get to that after this one. So um, Sergey is asking, while having the right solid foundation and attitude, Generals tend to struggle with practical hassles like getting a job. Any mm -hmm. advice on that? Yeah, that's a tough one. I have a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old right now, and one of the things that they're struggling with is uh, handshakes, looking people in the eye, uh, small talk. These are squishy things that we never really learned, we never really taught. And we get all this stuff about data structures and discrete math, but not how to be noticed. I don't have good answers for that other than try to be as well balanced as you can be, be visible, be kind, show up. User groups, I would say, is how I got my start. I got my start speaking. My first talk ever was a talk on the emerging new, brand new technology. It was called XML. And I gave a talk at the Oregon Software Association on this new technology that was taken over the world called XML. And I talked to 20 people at a luncheon and I showed up and they're like, oh, there's that guy again. Show exactly. up at user groups, be visible. People who are in the chats right now are visible. I know half of these people. Um, we've got a, a very kind gentleman in the chat here who's saying that uh, they're 42 and they struggle with handshakes and look people in the eye and small talk. It sucks that being good at computers and being good at humans is a thing that we have to balance and then you aren't always mm. um, measured and metric on just simply your ability to ship. Um, and it seems sometimes like people with snazzy personalities get the job. Um, I would say, you know, learning to network, learning to be involved, learning to show up. What do you think the answer is, Lars? I think there's something to it uh, from what you're saying. I, I usually say that if you're uncomfortable in a, like, say, a meetup setting where there's 40 other people, the uh, people's favorite topic is usually themselves. Ooh. Or, yes. And you go, so the only thing you have to say, you walk up to someone and says, Hi. What do you do? And you're off. Yeah. Right. I used to, not uh, much more to use. <laughs> I used to sell computers at a place called Incredible Universe that's now was Fry's Electronics and then recently went out of business with a computer store, big warehouse. Mm -hmm. And all the other uh, you know, geek squad people would go around and say, uh, you good? You're finding everything okay? Can I help you? Right. And then you always like, just browsing. Just browsing. Like, don't talk to me, right? <laughs> Pretty but, much, yeah. But I bizarre person that I am would go up and say, are you having fun? Have you seen anything cool today? And yep. then they would go just browsing and I'd go, that's great. But have you seen anything cool today? Hmm. And, th and then they like reset and then suddenly you're talking to someone and you're, you're, you're good friends. You can practice, you can practice yeah. at the McDonald's drive through at the Starbucks. You can learn, you can practice your, how to be friendly and personable on the produce guy at the totally. publisher. And the interesting thing is that people are usually in the same situation, right? They mm -hmm. don't want to start either. So if you can get, you know, past that initial kind of, oh, God, what am I doing here? Yep. Kind of feeling and go, hey, you look interesting. You don't look threatening. I'll start there. What do you mm -hmm. do? You know, as you said, what's a cool thing you learned tonight kind of thing? Exactly. And just having that little exactly. tiny icebreaker can mean so much. And again, if 
the person doesn't want to talk to you, they'll let you know, you know, move on to the next one. So. There is a great YouTube channel called Charisma on Command. Oh. And what they do is they watch people who are demonstrably charming and they mm -hmm. analyze their interviews. And one of the best episodes of uh, Charisma on Command is when they take Russell Brand, who is a UK kind of like rock star type, and he's yep. known to be universally charming. And uh, they put him on a, on a very awkward, um, certain direction leaning talk show where they're basically passive aggressive and they're mean to him and they're kind of a jerk. And it's like, mm -hmm. wow, why are we watching this incredibly painful thing? And then you see him using his body and his position and, his and, and the way he turns and the way he presents himself. And in about 10 minutes, he turns the interview around and he's got them eating out of his hand. And then the, the commentator on this yeah. Charisma On Command show explains, notice what he did. He physically turned his body to, to rebuff this person who had insulted him, but he did it in a classy way. He turned, yeah. this, this was an insulting question that he answered with a question, thereby putting the honest on the person to answer. It was just full analysis of what charisma That's truly is. Yeah. Check it out. That is very interesting. It's lovely, lovely ah. stuff. Um, well, to change the subject, we have a uh, question from our mutual good friend, Adam Kogan. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Yeah, that you should be scared. No, yeah. that's fine. Um, <laughs> he's just asking if you can talk about how you found your migration to TikTok. TikTok is a joy. The deal, though, with TikTok is if you just jump in, within about two days, you're going to see a bunch of inappropriate stuff and things you don't want to see. And you're going to be like, if you're, you know, uh, not interested in dances and skimpy clothing and bikinis and stuff, you're going to be like, why am I on TikTok? You have mm. to teach TikTok what you like. It takes about three days and you'll see some inappropriate content. That's a problem. And that turns people off of TikTok, particularly okay. older people. However, once you start liking stuff and, and the hard press, not interested on the things you don't want to hear, I have this most amazing TikTok. It's called the FYP for you, for you page. It's your personalized feed. I've got woodworking, uh, inspirational quotes from gurus. Uh, I've been, I, I found my way somehow to Native American First Nations TikTok and I'm learning about their culture, learning Japanese, right. uh, Spanish grammar, uh, geometry lessons for my kid in, in his high school. I've got a curated stuff I'm interested in, Star Wars things, Marvel fan theories. And I'm not seeing like the stuff I don't wanna see, but if I texted you a TikTok, the one you saw would be awesome, but then the next one would be something that's probably, yeah. they're just rolling the dice and you're gonna end up seeing something you don't wanna see. Yeah, right. I have found my way on TikTok by finding what a joy it is. Uh, yeah, and here we go. John is saying in the chat that he watches it with his son and keeps it, and they've, they've kept away from any dodgy videos. Sophie makes a great point. It's like Twitter, it's what you teach it. Yep, that makes sense. Um, I have not used TikTok, I must admit, but uh, I have heard many different varied stories D about it. DM me use. and I'll send you two or three favorites. One of the other fun things about TikToks is people will say a thing and do a thing. And then the sound can be marked as a sound. So I could go to the TikTok, see a thing where you're ranting about a barista mm. at the coffee shop, hit use sound, and then talk over you. Basically, I would lip sync to your sound. <laughs> and then that's how things go viral, right? <laughs> So there's this yeah, one right. lovely one where this woman is in the New York subway and she sees a rat and he's eating something in the subway. And she's like, you know, people ask me why I moved to the city. And it's just that I love the charm of New York. And there's just so much happening in the culture. And she's saying this while the, <laughs> so then right. now people use that audio to show just horrible things that are happening in New York. And, and now we have code talk and programmer talk and tech talk. It's a really, very supportive, fun yeah, uh, yeah. community. That's a neat feature. Um, yeah, and yeah, I don't have right. to do any funny dances or anything. No. Yeah, and you get to listen to sea shanties and stuff. It's wonderful. There <laughs> will um, be more questions. Keep coming. Um, uh -oh. What's your opinion on boot camps? Do your research, and the number one way you can tell if a, if a, uh, a boot camp is a good idea is talk to someone who graduated. A boot so just camp to clarify, what is a boot camp? Oh, okay, so a boot camp know. would be um, a a fixed length intensive program that is to not necessarily simulate a degree or give you a degree, but we'll call it a nano degree or a micro degree. They're going to say, I can teach you PHP in six months. And when they mean six months, they mean 40, 50 hours. Like you quit your job, live at your parents, you know, mm. you, you can't have a job and do a, do a boot camp. 
it's right. a boot camp. Like we're going to put you in combat in the next six months, which is different than the kind of the gentle four years of a of an undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen people come out of boot camps incredibly successful. I think of um, uh, Saran Yatbarak from Code Newbies, who you know did a boot camp dropped out of medical school, became a very successful programmer, created code newbies, et cetera. There's a lot of people. A lot of people though will find that boot camps will charge them 20,000 US. They'll have to do huge loans and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's I've heard about that. imposed discipline. The structure of the boot camp provides discipline and a, a curriculum. The mm. challenge is that you could create your own curriculum online. The, it's all available. But yep. that requires a lot of discipline and a lot of familiarity. But I would encourage people to take out things like free code camp and, and think about the structure of that. And also CS50, the free class at Harvard and some of the open courseware things, as well as the Khan mm -hmm. Academy computer science, khanacademy.org yeah. slash CS. And see if you could put together your own one. Um, I, would, I would look at that before. And then I would, uh, would talk to other folks as well. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Graduates. Um, no, I had a question as well, and there's uh, from sort of way at the start of your talk, you mentioned that you try and instant, you know, you only have a finite number of keystrokes, and am I going to use 200 keystrokes on Sophie or not if I can write a blog post? So from that, when we talk about mentoring, at what point and how do you decide whether this particular piece of advice f is for a single person? that you're talking face to face, or you're going to turn it into something that you can either present at a talk like this or in a blog post or a YouTube video, like, because there's value in both. So how, mm. how do you define, how do you decide? Um, general purpose stuff. Like I'm always looking for things that happened privately that could be shared with more people. Um, Mads Torgerson, one of the designers in C Sharp shared an internal email recently about hybrid meetings, meetings that are both mixed and in person. And I was like, wow, this is huge. It's like, nine paragraphs and it's great stuff. Can I use that as the jumping point of a blog post? So I asked him, could I credit you and write a blog post about this? Um, that's something that's generic, right? Mm -hmm. If someone sends me a, well, how do I get started in podcasting or what microphone should I uh, get? I say, go and Google Hanselman, good, better, best. And I know that Google and Bing will send them to my starting a, uh, you know, getting a good webcam or Hanselman getting started podcast and they'll find those things. So I've mm -hmm. got those keywords in my head. Um, but if it's, very private or personal, then I keep those things separate to the to the mentee. But I would say 80% of things like dealing with difficult people or compiler errors are a very much um, for everyone and not for yep. just one person. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And um, so I'm just checking the chat here if there were people that were asking anything, because that is all the questions we have and we are almost out of time. Lovely. So if there's nothing else, I just want to say thank you, Scott. Because that was really cool. And there was, a, as always, there was a tech element to it. I was freaking out. Writers. I was like, I don't know if this is what they want to hear. I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. Oh, was no, scary. I liked it. It wasn't scary at all. <laughs> well, thank you for your help. I appreciate it. And thank you to everyone in the chat for keeping things Absolutely. moving. And thanks for everyone uh, who are giving us good questions. Absolutely. Yeah, that that's, uh, was very good. So thank you, Scott, from everybody. And um, oh, we have a few minutes before our next speaker is going to come up. And I'm just going to check our schedule here and see what we're doing. Uh, so maybe we can move over to William because we is, he's ready. And he's probably got a bit to say before we uh, go in and talk to our next uh, presenter for, for NDC Melbourne. Now, I will just mention as well that throughout the day, you can win stuff, win prizes. There are a couple of quizzes that are going to come up. So we have one at 11 which is a developer quiz, and we have one after lunch. I mean, we're not providing lunch, but whenever you have lunch. And uh, and that's more on Melbourne. So if you're not from Melbourne, that could get really interesting. But you can win hoodies like this one that I'm wearing. Eh, it says Melbourne on it, and you see Melbourne. Might not be exactly this one because I'm wearing it, but you can win hoodies. And there's also prizes at the end of the day. But make sure that you uh, use the Slido, which we'll get to as well for the quizzes so you can win as well as the end of the day. So lots to come still, also yoga. So get your yoga mat out. That's at 12 o'clock. So what's that, two hours from now? Um, but lots of stuff. But um, let's, uh, yeah, visit the expo. That's right. Go to expo.ndcmelbourne.com. That's how you can win uh, the grand prizes as well, which is uh, tickets for next year's NDC Melbourne, which will be in person, fingers crossed, and all access pass for that. Um, so go there, make sure you put in your details, visit all the sponsors, because they're the ones that makes this happen. 
But I think that was all I had to say for now. I'm going to move it over to William, who is uh, going to say hello and introduce himself as well. Take it away, William. Thanks, Lars. Hello, everybody. I am William Liebenberg. Uh, I work here at SSW in Melbourne. And um, before we actually get started with the next speaker, uh, I would just like to uh, let our sponsors uh, um, give them a moment to show, show their videos. The idea behind Distinguished Engineers is really to assemble a diverse team of our top level engineers and some of the best engineering minds on the planet to really solve the most complex problems both for CBA and for our customers. Our Distinguished Engineering program started internally by us having a good look at who'd really shown amazing engineering leadership or technology leadership already inside the group. And we basically started assembling those people and focusing them on a really important problems both for us and our customers. I get to actually roll up my sleeves and actually really help solve some really tricky problems in the bank. One of the, the big challenges we have right now in X15 is how do we get small teams of engineers to be able to, within just like a few months, go for an idea and get it into our customers' hands. If we can crack that, I think that's an incredibly tough engineering problem, but it also means that we can make a massive difference in Australia. One of the main reasons that engineering is important at Combank is just the scale of impact that we have across Australia. For Commonwealth Bank, we're the largest lender in Australia. And so the scale and importance of digitising a process like that has an impact on all Australians. The thing for me that's really appealing about engineering at Combank is the combination of really important problems for Australia and really difficult engineering problems. Hello again, everybody, and I'd just like to personally thank our sponsors because without them, uh, this event wouldn't have been possible. Um, so today, the first talk we're going to have is from David Wenger. Uh, he is a developer at Microsoft, and here he is. Hi, Dave. G'day, Will. How's it going? <laughs> going very well. I'm, I'm always impressed by that uh, Lego collection you have in the background there, Dave. <laughs> Ever growing. Do you do you ever just pick one off the shelf and take it apart and rebuild it, or they just build ones, leave it forever? Uh, so, sometimes they fall off the shelves and get rebuilt, but uh, usually I try to be nice. My kids, not so much. <laughs> um, now, I mean, same. I love Lego. Uh, do you find uh, you know Lego sort of helps you take a break from programming, but still keep your mind active in a sort of way of uh, you know? Programming in a way, nice and procedural, there's always instructions? Yes. Or do you just like building random things? No, I'm definitely not the random builder. Uh, I leave that to the kids. I'm definitely uh, follow the instructions and uh, I like to, uh, so, you know, there's cars and stuff behind me. I like cars. Um, what I like about it is as you're putting it together, you can see some of, you're seeing how it works and how it fits together. And then, of course, it's uh, it's greater than its parts kind of thing. Uh, that's mm. the same thing I like about programming. So there's definitely parallels. <laughs> now, you are talking to us today about records, but I'm assuming it's not the old uh, music records. There's something uh, very different. Uh, C sharp records, right? That's right. Yep. And uh, uh, so can you maybe just give us a hint uh, before we start? Why would I choose to use records over classes and structs, for instance? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, that's kind of, you know, maybe what I'm going to answer, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I think the, uh, Scott kind of, 
I won't say he stole a line from me because I'm pretty sure I stole it from him, but I have used it before in talks. Uh, when he was talking about looking, you know, one level below what you understand, um, I love that idea. That's what I do as well. And that's sort mm. of how I approach uh, records. So for me, it's not so much about when you would use a record or a struct or a class. It's what's more important is to uh, understand what a record is Mm -hmm. under the covers so that you can make that decision because it's always going to be you know dependent on what you're doing uh, i'm looking forward to this dave because uh uh I, i've got questions of my own about records for you but uh, i'll leave that to the end i think uh we'll go through your talk so uh the stream is yours take it away all right thank you no pressure following uh that wonderful keynote but uh hello thank you for tuning in uh, my name's dave let's talk about records what is a record? Uh, that's a tough question that I don't know the answer to because, well, I didn't prepare for this talk at all. Um, no, uh, a record is a funny thing to define because in C Sharp 9, a record is another way of defining a type. Uh, but in C Sharp 10, even that statement is not true. And a record is now just a thing. Uh, and it's another way to define a thing, but it's not really its own thing. And, um, what I think a record is, and this is a very well led to by William's question, which was completely unscripted, I promise, uh, is a record is really just the collection of its parts, right? It's it's all the bits of a record put together. That's what define it. And I've sort of put six uh, of those features, I guess, uh, on the screen there. To me, this is what defines a record. It's just a record has these uh, has these qualities essentially. Um, what's interesting about records or about these qualities is that five of these, which I have circled with a squiggly square, are not exclusive to records. And so, like I was saying before, one of the really cool things about records is even if you're never going to use them, by understanding how they work and understanding what the compiler does to achieve uh, recordness, um, you can bring some of those concepts to your existing code, even if you don't use records, or maybe you will use records, or maybe you use records and you'll take some of them out. So that's kind of what I want to talk about. Uh, and I'm just going to barrel through. Here we go. Um, so the first one up is simplified declaration. And as of right now, uh, and including C Sharp 10, which is coming out in November, um, this is exclusive to records. The only way to get this uh, simplified syntax is to use a record. You can't put it on your own classes and things. There's lots of requests for that, but you can't at the moment. Um, and what this essentially is, is, well, I mean, you can see there, right? It's a one line declaration. It kind of looks like a type declaration because it's public something car, right? It's not a return type, it's a thing. It kind of looks like a constructor because again, it doesn't have a return type, but it does have brackets and parameters. So it kind of looks like a method call, right? So it kind of looks like a constructor and it kind of looks like a type declaration. And it turns out it's kind of those things in one. That numdoors uh, parameter there explodes out and becomes a parameter of the constructor and a property of the class that this would generate. And that's really what a record is. At the end of the day, a record is a different way of defining a class. And it has some other behaviors, but that's kind of what it is. Um, now, full disclosure, if you know what records are and how they work, uh, that's a lie. It's not a set. We'll talk about that later. And there's a lot more that gets uh, generated with records. It's not just uh, one constructor. But we'll cover all of that. Um, but simplified declaration is, uh, for me, the sort of the quintessential thing about a record. I love that you can define a class in one line and use it and it has properties and it does what you need it to do. It's really good for you know data transfer objects, those sort of things, those small classes. Um, I just have you know a file and put 20 records definitions in, it's 20 lines and you're done. Um, so it's really nice and if nothing else, uh, it, it's was well, probably one of my favorite or second favorite feature of them, um, even though it's arguably the least interesting. Um, but that's what a record is, essentially. So let's get going. Uh, I said that records was a class, and in C Sharp 9, that's true. In C Sharp 10, that's not true. So what you can now do, or well, now if you're using preview versions of VS and in future, um, is you can actually tell the compiler what type of thing you want this record to be. So you can say public record class car, and that will generate a class. And of course, 
If you can say class, well, then you can say struct and that'll generate a struct. And this is also why records aren't really anything because a record is just a class or a struct. It's not a new kind of type in .NET, um, which it seems like it is at first, but it's not. It's just the features, you know. Um, I just saw Melissa's question about David's room and I thought she was talking about Lego. Uh, yes, if you ask questions on Slido, that's what that QR code in the corner is for. Um, okay, so immutable, back to records. Uh, records are immutable by default. Um, someone, uh, th there's many people who disagree with that statement. Uh, there's often, uh, I won't say heated debates, but there's discussions about this concept. Uh, there's some in GitHub on like the docs page where it says they're immutable by default and people complain that they're not. Uh, on C Sharp Discord, hello everyone on C Sharp Discord. Uh, I say things like, yeah, they're immutable by default and everyone says, no, they're not. Immutable is controversial. So let me let me talk about this. When I say by default, what I mean is that simplified declaration of a record, right? this one liner. If you define a record in one line like that, then it is an immutable object, guaranteed. The problem with immutability in records is you can't essentially know whether a record is immutable or not. There is nothing by definition that says it's immutable. So this record definition, right, single line, this is immutable. This record definition is exactly the same, but it is not immutable. And from a consuming point of view, you can't tell. Obviously, you can look at the source code and tell. If you can look at the source code, well, that answers all the questions, right? But if you are given uh, an instance of type car and someone tells you it's a record, that doesn't mean anything, right? This record down the bottom there is a mutable record because it has a set uh, accessor on that property. You can set that whenever you like. So as I lied to you earlier, that's not how the c -sharp compiler generates a record. What it actually generates is an init accessor. So this is a new thing added in c -sharp 9 for records, um, but it works on any property. It works on structs, it works on classes. And what it does is it allows you to define a mutable, sorry, an immutable type, so one where you can't set properties, or the init properties anyway, except you can set them in if you're initializing an object. And there's essentially two ways to initialize an object in C Sharp. Uh, number one is the constructor. Whoops, that's the constructor there on the screen. Thank you. Um, so as you can see, right, in the constructor there, we're setting this numdoors property but well, we've said we can't set it. So how does that work? Well, the compiler knows that, okay, in the constructor, you can call an init property. And it is very specifically in the constructor. You can't set an init property in a method, even if the method is called from the constructor, like it is specific. The other initialization case, which I skipped to earlier, is object initialization. So pretend we didn't have the constructor. You can construct an object in C-sharp like this. You just specify those properties and C-sharp will let you, the compiler will let you, even though you're setting a property, because you're initializing the um, initializing an object. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, they did. Uh, if you try and set the property the normal way, then you get an error because the compiler cannot know or doesn't know that you're initializing an object, kind of. Like, I mean, you look at that and you're like, well, obviously I am, but you don't get what I mean. Um, so let's 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 just dig into that because fine, that's immutability. It's easy to say, yes, there's an internet accessor. But the interesting thing comes, as I said, from knowing why. So this is SharpLab. Uh, if you haven't seen SharpLab before, SharpLab is an amazing tool. It's a website uh, written by a lovely man just across the pond in New Zealand. And what it does is as I type out code over here, uh, which I will do right now, it is compiling my code into IL. And then it is uh, using, sorry, using the latest bits of Roslyn so C Sharp 10 essentially. And then it is decompiling my code, but it is telling ILSpy, which is the decompiler, it's saying, hey, I wrote this code with C Sharp 1. So none of these features uh, are sort of available to ILSpy as it's decompiling. So if we look at this record I've just defined, what it does is it explodes out to, well, here's our class car, and there's a bunch of stuff. Here's our backing field for our property. Here's our property. And we can see it has an init accessor. All right. That's Cool, doesn't really tell us much, but okay. Um, if I create a variable 
of this type. Uh, I can, this is a bit weird, but I can set the property, even though it's also set in the constructor. Uh, you wouldn't want to do it, but you can. Uh, but you can see here, this is my object initializer, right? This is what it compiles to. It compiles to create a car and then set the numdos property. The compiler is allowed to do this because it's the compiler. It knows, right? It trusts itself. If I paste this over here, I'm going to get an, uh, an error. So this is the compiler enforcing, hey, you've got an init property here, right? It says here, you can't just do this. So how does an init property work? Well, if we switch to IL, which is very scary, scary and I don't like doing, so I won't do it again. But if we have a look at what this really generates, uh, and actually, you know what? I'm going to change this because it's too scary for me. I'm just going to make this a, uh, what did I say, num doors. I'm going to do it the old fashioned way on a class, which means I now need to get rid of that. So this is a class with an init property. Uh, sorry, I'll just go back to the C sharp just to prove there's no magic here. So this has just got a field property in an accessor. Get rid of all that record junk. If we go down the bottom, here's our properties. Here's a property called numdoors. It's an int. Now properties, if you didn't know, they're really just get and set methods under the hood. So our get says get numdoors. And our set is set numdoors. So in IL, right, in a .NET DLL, there's no such thing as init. It's a C sharp compiler thing. Uh, An init is really just a set with a hat on. And this is the hat. Uh, it's a mod rec. I have no idea what that means. And it basically annotates it with this type. And then the compiler knows, hey, if something is annotated with this type, it's an init property. And so it doesn't let you set it. So why is this interesting? Well, there's two reasons. Number one, firstly, you can use init properties in your normal classes, right? You don't need to use records to get this feature. That's pretty cool. Uh, number two, this type is defined in uh, .NET, right? It's in .NET Core, I don't know, 3.1 or whatever. If you're not targeting .NET 3.1, you can't use init properties. Uh, you get an error that says, hey, there is no type called this external init. And you look at that and you're like, what the hell are you talking about? Well, it turns out if you work out what the compiler does, you can do this and go public static class is external init. And uh, I'm going to get rid of the IL, it's confusing me. Um, if you do that, <coughs> actually, no, I'm not. If you do this, you can use init properties. If we look down at our property here, you can see our mod rec. Now, if you were keen eyed, this is actually slightly different. Before, this said system private call lib in front of it, right? That's where the type came from. Now, the type is coming from our assembly. So we've just essentially put in part of the runtime and uh, you know now we can use init properties everywhere. It is a little bit tricky in that you wanna be careful making this public because if you've got something consuming you that targets 3.1 or whatever, but Good question. Um, Graham, good question. Can you get a property by reflection set it? Yes. So this is the, the asterisks here for immutability in C Sharp. Uh, C Sharp loves backwards compatibility. In fact, so does all of Microsoft. <clears throat> so we don't like breaking people. So as you can see, this is a set in IL. This is still called set numdoors. You can set this in reflection. Uh, a, now the good thing about that is it means that a deserializer will still be able to set it. So you can use a record or you can have a class with an init property. And if you're deserializing it from JSON or whatever, that's cool. Your init properties still work. They can still be set by the decompiler, but also your immutability still works. Uh, and so you know that, you know, no one else can change this property, which is cool. So the one uh, drawback, if you like, to init properties, or not, not drawback, but there's a bit of a gap still within the properties, which hopefully will be fixed in future. Uh, and that is around nullability. So if I define a class and I have a nullable string address, then fine, we can make that init property. You can only set it during initialization uh, and that's it, it's great. But if I define a non-nullable string and I don't have a constructor, then I get an error because nothing is initializing this property, which means its default value is null, but you've said it's not nullable but you don't want to initialize it because you want the people to initialize it and they can't set it. Like, so it's, it's all very, these kind of features kind of bump into each other. And there's a few ways around it. You can just have a constructor. And I mean, that makes sense, right? If everyone has to set a name, then have it in your constructor, right? 
The other way around it, if you're sure that someone is going to set the name, like for example, if you know your code and you know for sure this is only ever going to be used when deserializing um, you know, some input, then you can sort of work around the issue. So one way is to assign it to null and then use the exclamation mark, which is the null forgiveness operator, which is the compiler shut up and get out of my way operator. Um, and this will work. And this just says, yeah, look, okay, fine. I've initialized it. Don't worry, someone will follow up later. Um, and obviously you could just make it nullable as well, but that's a bit annoying because then you've got to you know, check for nulls all the time. So what's coming in C Sharp 11, <laughs> It, it, it recently got cut from C Sharp 10, sadly, um, is required properties. And I mention this because this is just going to make everything so much nicer and it's really going to fill in the, the sort of the, the complete picture here. So within it properties, I can say this can only be set during initialization, can't set it anywhere else. With required, I can say this has to be set during initialization. Um, and so that really completes the picture. And then you can really create classes that you can control how they're used uh, fully. When would I use an init property over a record? Uh, I will leave that question till the last slide. Thank you, Aaron. Um, value semantics. So value semantics is the next property we're going to talk about. Next property. I shouldn't use property. Can't, it's really hard to talk about types and kinds and classes and objects. Uh, value semantics is the next feature we're going to talk about. Uh, what is value semantics? Good question. Uh, what does this code do, right? What is result? Is it true or false? Right? Who knows? No way of knowing. Um, value semantics, or sem the semantics that we're talking about here is, what does it mean for one thing to be equal to another thing? I'm going to switch to uh, Visual Studio for this one, which is over here. So uh, feel free to yell at me, producers, if I need to zoom. I will, in fact, a little bit. There we go. So I have a different type of record here called a point. And uh, I'm constructing a point. It's got two properties, X and Y, right? Pretty boring. Uh, I'm actually going to make another point, though. And I'm going to set it to the same, uh, the same values. And then when I do equals here, uh, so it does P1 equal P2. And I run my code, and I look for the console window. Hello, console window. There it is. That's not the right one. Um, Oh, there it is. <laughs> Sorry, that took a while. So yes, what can I say? Um, so that output's true, right? Those two points are equal because they point to the same point. If I change one, it's now false. Great, makes sense. If I make this a class, not of last, but a class, and I run this, it's still false, right? So why isn't this why was it true with a record and why was it false with a class? Well, that's value semantics. So records have no sense of equality of themselves. They, they sort of pass that on to their constituent parts. Um, the real answer here is that um, for a class, the default equals does uh, p, p1, p2. So the, the default uh, equality for a class is reference equality, which means is this literally the exact same instance, right? So what a record does is it does value equality. The value equality means, yeah, these represent the same thing. They're still not the exact same instance, right? That second check still returns false, but they mean the same thing. Now, if you've used uh, structs before, structs also have value equality. So, and this is another thing where records get weird, right? What's a record? Well, it's a class. Well, except it can be a struct. What's cool about records? They have value equality, but so do structs but records can be structs, so they already have it. It's kind of weird. Um, and this is kind of why I didn't want to answer the when would you use question, because it's it depends. So if a struct has value equality, I can achieve value equality now, great. Uh, if a record has value equality, I can use that to get it. What about a class? Well, it turns out you can achieve value equality very easily. You can just override the equals method here, and I can say return, now I get to type on camera uh, while making lots of mistakes, uh, and p.x equals x, I'm just going to describe, oh look, thank you IntelliCode, oh, yep, mm -hmm. you compile, oh, I missed equals, no one in the chat is yelling at equals, I'm shocked. So I've just made this class 
have value equality. So what's so good about records, right? Like this is where you have to uh, you have to pick and choose what you're using. Why would you want to do it? Well, so value equality is really good in some circumstances. For example, a point class, it's pretty, uh, well, I won't say obvious, but it, it might be common that uh, we don't care what instance is what, we just care where is this point in physical space. And so that's what value equality provides, right? And so you can achieve all these things, but again, it's just a cool thing to know. So now the question becomes, or rather, uh, back to here. Whoops, nope, wrong one. There we go. So value semantics. So classes have reference equality, but you can implement value equality if you want. Structs have value equality. Records act like structs, which is good. So why would you use records? Well, it turns out records are better at being structs than structs are. Um, so this uh, is a benchmark.net output thingy. Um, and so this is just calling the equals method. And a record, uh, the equals method take, took 20 nanoseconds. I think this had two int properties. It was basically the point class I had. Um, and a struct took 340 nanoseconds. Now, that's a very short amount of time, um, and 104 bytes allocated is not a lot of memory, but sometimes people can uh, care about these things. Um, and if you do, you might want to choose a record. So how is this speed achieved? Well, for that, we have to go back to Sharp Lab, and we go back to making this a record, and we go back to C Sharp, and we look at the equals method. The equals method in a record is right here, and it does a bunch of rubbish, but essentially it does what I did in my class. It says, hey, are these two fields uh, equal? And if I, in fact, add another field here, uh, private int underscore new field, we will see in the equals method, um, at the end, at the start, there it is. Nope, that's get hash code, sorry. There it is. We will see that it is including new field in its uh, in its equality check. So a record will generate an equals method that checks every single field. And that's how it does equality, right? So it's the constituent parts. A struct on the other hand, and if we look at the source of .NET, we can find this out. So all structs inherit from value type, uh, which is confusingly a class, but ignore that. Value types equals method happens to be at the top of the file, which is very convenient for me. Um, and if we look at what it does, we get to this line, and if you know what this line is, you'll know why it's slower, right? This is reflection. And if you think about it, this kind of makes sense. A struct at runtime has to work out, right, what fields do they have? Okay, let me loop through them. And, and you know, this, this gets the value of both fields and checks the equals. Like, it's the same logic, but this is happening at runtime, working out which fields you've got. This is happening at compile time, generating an equals method. So records are sort of, I wouldn't say they're cheating um, because they're not, but they're a form of code generation. And if you've looked into source generators, and if you know me, you know that I love source generators, um, that's one of the advantages, right? Is they can look at your code and they can do things and therefore can get faster results. And with expressions, uh, this is good, we're banging through them. Hopefully there's lots of questions waiting for me. Maybe please ask questions. Um, all right, with expressions. So uh, here I am defining two cars. A Honda S2000 is a car with two doors and a Honda Accord Euro is basically the same as a Honda S2000, but with four doors. Uh, now, if you know cars, you now know what car I drive. And it's not the convertible. Um, so uh, what am I doing here? Like, what, what is this new with rubbish? Um, so what this is doing is this is, now firstly, it's setting a, uh, setting a property, which, well, hang on, isn't that illegal because of init uh, properties? Well, it is, but this is another form of uh, initializing types. And well, it's kind of the same form. This is like an object expression, but with some other stuff. But so what this is doing is saying, hey, here's an instance of a car, Honda S2000, take that, make a copy of it, and give me a new one, but set the num doors to four. So it's still initializing our Honda Accord Euro object. It's just that as part of that initialization, we're going to get most of it from uh, the existing object, right? So let's go back to here and we'll zoom the browser as requested. Sorry for not noticing earlier. Um, 
So what are we going to do? So here we go. So we have a car. We have a thing. And I'm just going to see with, oops, with one doors. Now this one is a pretty silly example because car only has one property. But let's just have a look how it works anyway. Uh, scroll down. Here it is. So this is our with expression. Now it's not very clear and you just have to trust me on that, but it is. Um, the way a with expression works is a little bit more compiler magic where the compiler gets to cheat. So you're not allowed to set the numdoors property in your code, but the compiler can set it in its code because you know it's the compiler, right? So what the compiler does is it makes a copy of the car and then it sets the property and then it gives you back the car you wanted. Now, these variable names get confusing. That's because the decompilation doesn't know your variable names. Um, but so it calls this weird clone method, right? Now, so <laughs> I did this before and I'll do, I'll do it again. If we copy the code to here, you'll find this is illegal code, besides the fact that the car doesn't exist. Um, not only because we're setting the property, which is this error, but the name clone doesn't exist, and there's an end of file expected, and things just get weird. And that's because of this, I mean, right? This is not C sharp code. Mm -hmm. So, what is this nonsense? This is what is referred to as an unspeakable method. So, this is a method that is valid in IL as a name, but it's not valid in C sharp. And so the compiler uses this all the time to generate things that it doesn't want people to call. In fact, you can see it right here in the backing field. It's the same thing. The backing field of a property is unspeakable because the compiler doesn't want anyone to be able to get at it. So why don't we want people to get at the clone method? Well, in order to maintain immutability, we have to know that there is a way to make a 100% accurate copy of this instance, right? Uh, we have, if, if, the, if the act of copying changes something, then that breaks immutability. So the clone method uh, is down here. It doesn't look very interesting. It just calls this constructor. Here's the constructor. It just sets fields. Uh, in fact, again, if I can, I can add a field here as well. Uh, yep, a loop. Uh, you'll see the the new field is here as well. So again, all fields get uh, generated into this. But so this, what this means is that there is a, a way the compiler trusts to clone a record. And as soon as it knows, well, okay, if I can make a faithful copy, and that means I can set some properties, and that means I can sort of maintain immutability, but allow for it's not really modification because it's always copying, but it allow for, uh, I guess, deriving new instances. And so that's what with expressions do. Uh, so the other thing with with expressions, oh, this is just, I love this. Um, you can nest them and it makes for really expressive code. So this is actually from my uh, train game. Um, it draws a bunch of stuff on the screen. So I have a background and when you mouse over things, I want to hover them. So I can define the hover background and saying, hey, the hover background is the same as the background. It just has a different color. And so then whatever I do to the background, I know hover background will sort of inherit it, right? It's not inheritance, but you know what I mean. Um, and same thing with the colors, right? I want light blue, but I want an alpha of 85%. Um, so it's really nice syntax once you get to use it. Um, with expressions are not exclusive to records, but they are exclusive to things the compiler knows it can copy. So in C-sharp 9, that means records. And in C-sharp 10, that means record structs. In C-sharp 10, it's also going to be available on every struct, which is pretty cool. So every struct you might have out there, you can now use with expressions. And anonymous types. So anonymous types is another one of these things where the compiler generates code. And since the compiler generates all of the code for them, it knows it can make a faithful copy. Um, if we look, uh, let me make a new anonymous type quickly. Oops, there we go. So the anonymous type, here it is, unspeakable names again, right? Um, the anonymous type doesn't have anything interesting. It has an equals method, it has a two string, like there's nothing here to clone, but because the compiler generates, well, essentially all of this code, but it generates this constructor, the compiler is going to, uh, when you use a with expression, it'll just call the constructor of this type, pass in all of the properties from the existing one, except for whatever you set on here. Uh, unfortunately, I can't demo this because um, this version 
uh, TWIDS. I don't think Sharp Web, uh, this version, this branch is up to date today. Uh, and unfortunately, the, ma the master build of uh, Rosalind is currently failing, and um, it's not my fault. All right, so that's with expressions. Fully customizable. So this is the last, my, my last point. Uh, we're doing well for time. Uh, they're fully customizable. And so I'm just going to go back to here. We've actually seen this already, uh, and we've seen this in basically every demo I've done. Uh, let me get rid of all this stuff. In fact, here, look, I'm customizing a record. Um, that one sometimes gets confused. There we go. Um, what the compiler does is it wants to generate a bunch of code for your record. Uh, it wants to generate a property. And what it does is for everything that it's going to generate, it checks whether you have first. So here, it would want to generate this numdoors property. Sorry, no, it won't. Wait a minute. Now it wants to generate a numdoors property, but I got there first. So it's not going to. So if I comment out my property, here's a numdoors property we get. If I don't comment out my property, well, we still get it, but this is mine. Now you can't tell because I've done it the same way, but if I change this to a set, and now this number of property has a set. And so this is true of every part of a record. So if you want to change how a record's two string is uh, done, you can just, oops, you can just do this and you can go, oops, see. And now when we look at the generated code for a record, the two string method says return NDC. So you can take the bits of the record you want. And if you want to change them, then you just change them. What this means is uh, you can take this equals method and you can put it here and you can return false. And now you don't have value or quality anymore, right? Um, and so this is, I mean, you probably wouldn't do that. Please don't, right? But this is, where records, again, they get kind of weird, right? A record could be a one line declaration that does everything for you, or you could have a 3000 line file that has methods and properties and fields and whatever else. Any fields you define, the compiler will put in your equals method. Any uh, properties, the backing fields are going, right? So you can customize as much as you like. And so that goes back to the question of, you know, when should I use a property and method? Well, see, uh, and what is a record, right? A record is anything you like. It can be immutable, and some would argue that it's immutable by default, but it's also not necessarily. It can be really simple to declare, or you can declare it in a really long, verbose way. Um, it can have value semantics, or it cannot, right? So what I like about a record is that I get to look at how the compiler team at Microsoft, who writes C Sharp, think a immutable class should be written. And so I get to look at the get hash code method and go, hmm, what does this do? How does this work? Um, more importantly, I get to not write a get hash code method because I'm not smart enough and I don't want my dictionaries to break, right? Um, I get to take advantage of the things from a record that I want, but not get the things that I don't want. On this though, I strongly recommend if you're going to do this, that you uh, invest in uh, using SharpLab to, uh, to have a look at what's going on. And I'll give you an example of why. Uh, let's just make, I'm gonna make this a record. That's gonna have an, an X and a Y. Uh, and we're gonna, I, I don't know. Let, let's just, we'll, we'll define one property and we'll let the compiler define the other and we'll try to correctly use a cursor. So we have a, we have a point, it's got two properties, great. I'm initializing it to one and two, great. So what should this output? You would think that it should output one and two and it's just building and it's gonna be really slow. Oh, there it is. But it outputs one and zero. So why is that? So the danger of customizing is that the compiler might be doing things you don't know. In this case, uh, it's because I never set this property. Now it's gonna be one and two. Right, so if you're going to customize it, please be careful. <laughs> but uh, you can. So it's kind of nice, but it also you know can be a trap. Um, the compiler does tell you here. There's a little green squiggle, and it says uh, that parameter y is unread. So 
that's nice. Um, it just it, it means that the the you shouldn't necessarily assume maybe that uh, things are going to keep working the way you want. Which is again, that's you know that's why I said you can't tell a record is immutable. Well, in this case, here's a record with two properties. You can't tell whether the one is used or not. Right? And I can't set this, so this record's just fundamentally broken. This Y can never be anything but zero. That's not a good thing. Um, but anyway, whoops, hello, you're still on the screen. Oh, wait. Yes, so records can be anything, but what's sort of important is that you look that one level le le that one level below what's going on and therefore you'll know what's going on and but you can take those bits you can take the bits you want use them in a class use them in a, in a struct uh you know change your existing code maybe i don't know it's up to you um and with that hopefully someone has some questions because i am done but i'm pretty good for time oh it's just me hello uh, I have <laughs> That's fascinating, Dave. There's uh, a whole lot to learn about the, the C-sharp compiler and, and records there. Um, and we do have some interesting questions, actually. The first one comes from uh, Aaron Powell, and he's asking, when would I use an init property over a record? Yeah. I mean, essentially, this is up to which bits do you want? If you only want init properties, then you probably just want to use one. And if you want unit properties and some of the other stuff records provide, then use records. And my dog agrees. Um, <laughs> you, um, yeah, it, it really just is a matter of, I mean, essentially, you know, write, write down the pros and cons and pick which column has the more things. And it's very much case by case. Mm, so, mm. No, that's fair. cool. So the next question is from Harry asking, how does inheritance work with records? And that's, that's, for me, that's an interesting question as well. What do you think? Yeah, so so inheritance is is uh, it's I didn't get into it because it makes the code well it doesn't make the code harder to understand but some of the features of records are the way they are because of inheritance so things like the clone method and things like if you noticed when there was a two string method it called something called print members that is there to support inheritance and so if I have a record mm -hmm. that inherits from another record, then the two string of the outer one will call print members on itself and then print members on the inner one, not two string on the inner one. So that the output looks better. So there's a bunch of things around like, yeah, with clone, especially like with immutability where they, the code they generate is specifically to handle inheritance. So the mm -hmm. answer to the question is it works totally fine. Um, you can't <laughs> inherit you can't inherit a class from a record or a record from a class. So, uh, maybe you can inherit. So you always have no, to. You can't. Oh, okay. It's always inherit record. from a record. Yes, it's exclusive. And again, that's because of those immutability guarantees, right? If you could inherit mm -hmm. from a class, then that base class could do anything you want. Hmm. So um, the next question from Graeme. Graeme, I think you've already answered that question before. Uh, can you get a property by reflection and set it? Uh, yeah, so, so none of this none of this stuff is really sort of runtime um mm. effect, like there were yeah there is a slight change to the runtime for records which is that is external in it type but yeah at the end of the day these classes are just plain old dotnet classes you can set properties but then that's also true with private setters and private fields and private properties so that's sort of not you know that's not new right read only fields same thing mm -hmm. reflection right yeah, you can do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think, you know, in some ways, use records because you sort of would prefer the, the generated code. It's, it's like you said, uh, or showed the one benchmark, it's a, a lot more optimal to use the generated yeah. code. It's smarter, you know, it's, it's real code. Um, yep. Mm. Cool. So that sort of segues in the next question. Uh, when we combine records with the with keyword, <laughs> yeah. um, and if you have a, a complex record, for instance, it has... Uh, a dictionary or a, an I list to a collection, and and you then you know, with that add another value to that record. Does that complicated type or complex type get cloned exactly correctly? Yeah. So this is this is uh, yes. It, uh, sorry, no, it doesn't. Um, oh. <laughs> this is where records get uh, a little bit hairy, and in fact, so do structs. Right? Um, mm -hmm. There's no deep cloning ability like there's nothing baked into dotnet right the if there was the compiler wouldn't have had to generate that clone method so there is no way to know 
essentially know how to clone a dictionary, right? We can say, I know mm. how to clone a dictionary because we understand what the dictionary that's in the framework happens to do, but there's no guarantees, you know, someone else mm. could write a dictionary that does something different. So mm. no, you're not going to get a deep clone. You're not going to get an exact copy like that. So, you know, you essentially are copying a pointer to the same dictionary across to the new instance. Um, so mm. you do need to be careful of that. You know, you can't mm. get immutability out of mutable things. Um, that's, you know, that's just life essentially. Uh, this <laughs> isn't gonna, this isn't gonna reinvent the world. Um, mm -hmm. So you do have to be a little bit careful. You know, I, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't suggest going and changing all of your classes to records just because you want to, you know, I don't know. I don't know why you would anyway, but uh, you probably get <laughs> um, But yeah, so you do need to be a little bit careful. Um, they mm. are, I mean, the value equality thing is, it's, the, you know, what is the value of a dictionary, right? A, a when you compare two dictionaries, it doesn't compare every element. It doesn't, right? I think, and I think as .NET developers, we sort of understand that, that that's different. And so when you think mm. about, well, how would that work with value equality? Well, the answer is it doesn't, right? Which mm. I think makes sense, but maybe not. So to so give a recommendation is if you had a record uh, with you know, arrays, for instance, just a, a, a simple array or something very basic rather than a, a dictionary, that cloning would be more guaranteed or more you know, correct. Yeah, definitely. If you, I mean, so this is sort of not, I guess, not relevant to records really at all. But essentially, if you're going for immutability, everything has to be immutable from the ground up. Like you mm, just have mm. to, and and you certainly can achieve immutability without records. Like the init accessor helps, but I mean you can do it traditional ways, right? With constructors and private setters, uh, you don't get a with expression, but you can make with methods that do the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating, David. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've all got a fair bit to <laughs> take away and uh, learn from your talk. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, just everybody to so you know, we have the NDC Melbourne Expo website. So uh, NDC, well, expo.ndcmelbourne.com. If you go there, please sign up, you know, check out the sponsors. Uh, there's some great prizes for you to win at the end of the day. There's Uber Eats vouchers, there's AirPods, uh, Keep Cups, you know, Xiaomi Bands, um, an Apple Watch or Samsung Watch. There's a whole lot of prizes. So uh, definitely go and check it out. Now. Next, I'm going to hand over to my co-host, Melissa, and she's going to take us through the developer quiz. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks, William. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa, and I'm a lead software engineer at Azenix, and I'm super stoked to be here coming to you live from Melbourne. And we have a very fun tech quiz. It's going to be on Slido. So I'm going to activate the quiz now. And if you go to the quiz room on Slido, you should be able to join that. And I have my very special quiz master hat that I will be wearing. Uh, so register for the quiz and the top three winners will win a one of these super awesome NDC hoodies. So get your name in there. Try to sign up with your Twitter handle, your full name, some way that we can reach out to you and know who you are so we can get you your awesome prize. And do keep in mind that Slido, uh, the live stream does have a bit of a lag if you're watching on YouTube. So watch everything on Slido so that you can get the questions in right on time and, and then they will come up later on the live stream. So watch as it's going on Slido. I see a bunch of people jumping in there now. As long as we can figure out who you are and get you your prize if you win, that's all we need to do. Cool, lots of names popping up. Get your names in there now and get ready to answer some. This is gonna be a, a tech theme quiz. So get your cool tech hats on and get ready to go. Cool, we have 27 people. There's tons of people on the stream, so I think we can go more than that. So wait a little bit more to get some more people up on our special quiz. See, someone's commenting on my, my nice plants I have around me. It's my, my greenery background. We were saying before I might be on like a, a gardening show or something like that. <laughs> cool, so make sure if you're not finding the quiz, go to the, the quiz room within Slido, enter in there. Try to enter uh, either your Twitter handle or some name that distinguishes you from other people so that we can figure out who you are and get you your prize, which would be a hoodie if you win. 
Cool. So we are at 44 participants. I think that's getting up there. 45. Let's see. Do a little countdown. Last chance to join the quiz before I kick it off. Okay. Okay, we got to 50. So I think that's a good number to, to start off the quiz with. You can still join in after it goes, but you have to be quick to answer the questions. And remember to watch on Slido because there is a bit of a lag on the live stream. So starting the quiz. Azure functions natively support any of the following except what answer do you think it is? Get it in quick. Cool. We have 76% of you were correct. It is C++. So let's see what the leaderboard is looking like. Looks like Graham Foster is up at the top so far. Oh, there's a whole bunch of people. <laughs> it's tons of people um, tied. Obviously, one question, but let's see how we go. OK, next question. Get ready. What does link stand for? See the answers coming in? Cool. And we have 72% of people said language integrated query. 28% said language interface natural query. Let's see what it is. Good one. Cool. Who is at the top? PK and a whole bunch of other people tied for its top place. Hopefully we can get some questions wrong. So there's a distinguish, distinguishing people up at the top there. So next question. Who is known as the father of the World Wide Web? You have 20 seconds. Cool, it looks like lots of people said Tim Berners-Lee, is that correct? And it is. <laughs> Yay, who's at the top now? Still tons of people tied. <laughs> we got lots of winners so far. So hopefully, uh, we'll, hopefully we can get this going. Get some free hoodies out there for you all. So what does MPEG file extension stand for? I think this is a difficult one. I can see the, the votes coming in all spread around. Cool, so there's a bit of a tie there. Is it motion picture export graphic or is it moving picture experts group? Let's see what it is. And the moving picture experts group is the correct answer. They're actually the ones who defined the extension standards, which is pretty interesting. I just learned that recently. So we still got a whole bunch of people <laughs> tied for first place. I don't know how many hoodies we have, but we might have to procure a whole bunch more to get the <laughs> to get all of the winners some hoodies. <laughs> cool. So this this one, I think you might be able to get. Let's see. What HTML tag can you use to apply CSS rules to a document? Cool. All right, looks like most people are in. It is style. Cool. Up leaderboard, still tons of people <laughs> tied for first place. I think um, it's showing the people who are the fastest at the very top, so that'll help us distinguish who gets the hoodies. Next question, get ready. Who is considered the world's first computer programmer? Yep, 
Let's see. How well do you know your computer science history? The thing I love about this question is that all of these options are wonderful women in computer science and women in tech. And the correct answer is Otta Lovelace. So well done to 72% of people. Let's see if it's distinguished our leaderboard. Cool, we've got PK and, and Matt fighting out at the top. Get ready, next question. What does SDLC stand for? So you get some, looks like you get some extra points for speed. So you gotta be really quick to answer the questions there. Cool, looks like most people have got it. Were we correct? Nice. Good job, everyone. Software development lifecycle is what it is. Go to the leaderboard. Who is the quickest to get in there? So PK, Matt still battling out at the top, but PK is winning this time. Cool. Where is developers, developers, developers from? I like this question. This one is one of my favorite questions. Where do you think it might be from? Let's see if you know your tech conferences and software history. Cool, so there's a bit of a, a split. A big portion said from a Microsoft developer conference and the other portion says the tech conference known as DDD, which is correct, is actually from a Microsoft developer conference. When the CEO went, developers, 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 go find that GIF and that meme out on the internet. It's awesome. And that's where DDD conference actually got their name from, but it originated at the Microsoft conference. So well done, 58% of you that got that correct. And leaderboard, still Matt and PK battling out at the top, getting in there quick with your reaction times. Next question, which programming language came first? So again, you got to know your computer science history on this one. Cool, answers in. This one looks like it was a bit more tough, a bit more spread out between all the different answers. So was it the top two are PL1 and Fortran? Which one came first? And the answer is Fortran. PL1 is programming language one, but it unfortunately was not the first one. If you look at the history, Fortran actually came first. And leaderboard says Russ. Now jump to the top with the quickest time. That's awesome. Good job, Russ. Cool. Just one more question left. You can win. What did NDC originally stand for? See how well you know this conference that you are constantly, you're in, tuned into right now. Last question, get it in quick, try and win your, your hoodie. Top three winners will get an awesome hoodie. Cool, and time's up. Let's see who our winners are. So it stands for Norwegian Developers Conference, because it originated in Norway. So we have some awesome people currently behind the scenes located in Norway helping us out. So thank you, team. And overall winner, Russ, well done. You got to the top in the end. Nice. Congratulations, Russ. Congratulations, Graham Foster. And congratulations, Ruben. All three of you win a hoodie. Actually, I just got word that we can actually give out four hoodies. So Vat, you get an extra hoodie as well. Well done, everyone. <laughs> Good job, team. So thanks for participating in the awesome NDC Melbourne Tech Quiz. And now we have an awesome video and words from our sponsors. I love running this company. I love running it because uh, of the people I deal with. It's such a great team of people. From a career perspective, it's the best move I ever did. Being a great consultant, which we are, this is W, is half-half between technical skills and communication.
it's given me the opportunity to work with lots of different types of technology and explore some stuff that I maybe only dabbled in at university or before. SSW is a company that makes enterprise software solutions uh, and that's what we do. We build software for clients uh, on demand. We build bespoke solutions using the latest technology and the latest best practices. I've been involved in the development of some mining software, been involved in the development of software for a legal firm and everything in between there. Even in just under two years, I've been working across so many different projects. It's just a really great place to come into and I always look forward to coming to work. As an investor or wealth professional, you want a wealth provider that is flexible, smart and tech savvy. A provider with fresh eyes who sees opportunity to present wealth solutions differently. A partner who can administer wealth your way. NetWealth was created with an entrepreneurial spirit to do all of this. We exist to help you see your wealth differently, to realise your potential, to inspire you to discover a brighter future. At our core, we are a technology company, a super fund, an investment specialist, an administration business. But in our daily lives, we are you. Mums and dads, call centre operators, sales and marketing professionals, analysts, netball teams, friends, technologists, developers, and most importantly, family. To investors, we provide award-winning superannuation and investment accounts, products, and services. To wealth professionals, we provide a market-leading platform to better their business. Underlying all of this is cutting-edge technology anywhere, everywhere. With us, you can see your wealth differently and more positively. We identify new opportunities with our fresh perspective and natural curiosity. We provide choice through our flexible approach to business and product design. We prioritise your security to give you peace of mind. We are involved in your world. In schools, we support financial literacy, helping our younger Australians also see wealth differently. We are a team of talented people working hard to make life better for more Australians. We are creators. We are curious, always looking to spot the change that matters. We are authentic and genuine. We believe that strength is in teamwork. We are agile and nimble, upbeat, energetic and optimistic about the future. With us, you can see wealth differently because we are different. In our approach, our attitude, our commitment and our spirit. Partner with us to see what's possible. All right, welcome back. That was, uh, <laughs> I love that quiz. That was awesome. And there was just a couple of questions in there that were just a little bit harder just to kind of throw people off. But we still had four people that got all of them right. So well done, everybody. And you get a hoodie. Yay. Now, I should just mention again, please go to the expo.ndcmelbourne.com website and sign up for prizes. Just check out our sponsors because we wouldn't be here without them. So, and you might even win a prize from it. So do that. And, um, Someone was asking about the agenda for the entire day. The agenda is on ndcmelbourne.com, um, and you can check it out there to see when the breaks are and who else is on. Um, but next up, we have Michelle Mannering, and she's also known as the Hackathon Queen or the Queen of GitHub. Hello, Michelle. How are you? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, good. Now, rumor has it that you have a particularly rare uh, sample of GitHub stickers with Octokitty. Now, is that uh... true? Uh, I do not know of what you speak, but I have a very <laughs> large collection of stickers with lots and lots of Octocats. So, um, That's yeah, awesome. hopefully when we go back to IRL events, if you ever see me, I always have a big stash of stickers on me. So please always ask. I'll always be happy to give you lots of GitHub stickers. <laughs> Ooh, now you heard it here. Um, now I believe <laughs> that you are today going to give us a bunch of tips and tricks and hidden gems on how to use GitHub a lot better. That is correct. Super excited. 
<laughs> That's awesome. Now, I am going to monitor the questions uh, in Slido as they come in, and we might take those at the end. Or mm -hmm. as you prefer, you can also um, you know, interact with the YouTube ch chat as well. We're pretty informal here. So um, I will let you do your thing. And um, thanks again, Mish. Sounds fantastic. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Really excited to be here with you all. It's super great to see the chat popping off. I love watching that quiz and seeing people get things right or wrong. I, I, I'm from New South Wales, so I was like, oh, somebody clicked New South Wales for the NDC. I was like, yay, New South Wales represent. Uh, so it's really exciting. Uh, the talk's been great so far, and I hope this one is going to be just as awesome for you. I will be watching the YouTube chat at the same time. Um, so feel free to comment. I make my, I might make comments on what you're saying as well, uh, but feel free to comment on um, things as we're going or say hi, uh, and we'll take uh, questions at the end from Slido. So let's jump into it. All right, so get up like a boss. So lots of people will say, oh, you know, Mish, what are some of your top tips during GitHub? So this is going to be what they are now. Um, also, I just realized I didn't change my title on that one. I am now the developer advocate, not developer community manager. That was one oversight that I did. That's all good. Uh, so if you haven't seen me around or heard from me, I am Mish, uh, also known as Mish Manners Online. As I said, also Hackathon Queen because I've run a multitude of hackathons now. But if you are looking for me, you can find me on pretty much any social media platform known to men. Um, you can find me on um, Twitch streaming, both coding and video gaming. Obviously, you can follow me on GitHub and plenty of other places as well. I'm on the DevRel team at GitHub. As I said, my title is now Developer Advocate, which literally changed like a week ago, which is why I hadn't changed that one. Um, but yeah, I'm the Developer Advocate at uh, GitHub on the DevRel team. We have a few of us in Australia now, which is really exciting. Uh, and it's a, such a great company to work at, but also an awesome product that we have. So I'm here today to talk to you about a bunch of top tips on how to use GitHub, how to GitHub like a boss. And then we'll also have a demo as well, something that um, is really fun. I'll show you some of the ways that I use GitHub pretty much on a daily basis. So all the things I'm talking about are things that I do every day things that we use all the time and I hope they're really exciting and useful for you too. <laughs> I just love Michelle's comment in uh, chat actually, like Mish has all the stickers. Um, last time I did catch up with Michelle, she did get lots of stickers, so um, can confirm it's a thing. Uh, but today's top tips, um, I've broken them up into a couple of sections. Uh, so the first one we'll talk about is personalization, so how to actually personalize GitHub for you. The next one is collaboration. GitHub is very much known as this social coding platform. So um, yes, there'll be a lot of collaboration happening here. Uh, talk about the way that, uh, not just the way I work, but the way that you can work on GitHub. And, and I mentioned uh, a demo as well. Uh, now, I've seen some couple of um, comments in the chat about the laptop with stickers. That is actually my laptop. Um, so yes, when you do save it in person, that is literally what my laptop looks like. Okay, so the first thing on GitHub is personalization. So I love Lego, so I always try and fit a photo or something about Lego into my uh, presentation, so I thought about this one. So in the same way you would customize like your Lego models and you build something um, and something that's really you, you can customize your GitHub profile too. Um, now, one of the first things to do that is similar to the way you would do a social media profile. So when you open up a social media account for the first time, some of the first things you might do is go in, add a profile picture, write a bit about yourself, and just kind of like set it up a little bit. Uh, well, you can do that now on GitHub too. So we have this new thing called um, a profile readme. So not only can you add really cool things like a profile photo and that now, you can now add a readme to your actual GitHub profile. And the cool thing about this is that you can add anything you like to showcase you. You can add a bio of yourself. You can add um, some of the top projects you're working on. You can add um, some links to like maybe a website that you write about, articles that you're doing. Um, you can obviously write some code in here. Um, the whole thing's written in Markdown. So the sky's really the limit here in terms of a GitHub profile. So in order to create a profile readme, all you need to do is um, create a repository that is the same name as your username. And when you do that, you'll see that you've like a little 
thing will pop up here saying you've created a special repository. Now you can, you know, showcase this on your profile as a freebie. Um, as I mentioned, it's all written in Markdown. So anything you can add into Markdown, you can pretty much add into a profile. Um, so that includes um, things like gifts. So this is Monica's one. She's got like a cute little gif here of her OptiCat, which I really love. And I loved it so much that I added, I added it to mine as well. Um, you can add um, images and you can even add, um, as I said, it's coding. So you can add all these really funky things with code. Uh, one thing that I've seen a lot of people add on their profiles now is games. So they'll use GitHub Actions to set up a game that's running on their profile and you can jump in and be part of that game, uh, which is really, really fun. Uh, and I see Phil Dash has said that some people have forked his um, profile really, um, which is generally confusing. Uh, it kind of is, but uh, I'll show you a little bit about that too. We can jump on to Phil's one later. Um, but often when I'm looking for something, people say, what's some, some of the best things to do for a profile readme and to set up? One of the cool things to do is to just look around on GitHub. And when you see a cool profile, um, I often just click the edit button to see how they've actually done it. And when you click the edit button, it forks their, um, their that repo. So then you can actually have a look at it, copy some of the code. Um, as Phil said, it kind of, kind of is a little bit confusing because you're like, why is somebody forking my personal repo? But it's because they, they like what you're doing and therefore they want to do the same. Um, so that's one really good way about going into um, building your profile review, see what other people do. Uh, the next one about really customizing things is something that not a lot of people do on GitHub. Uh, I often forget about it and then I'll come back to it after a while. I'm like, well, that's a good thing to remember. Uh, it's the notifications. Um, we've changed the way notifications work quite a lot. Um, so notifications, if you haven't um, seen them for a while, if you go into like your just github.com and you're signed in, you'll see there's like a little bell up the top and that is your notifications. Um, so you can click that and if you haven't been on there for a while, you can click that bell and it'll say like, hey, would you like to clean up some of these notifications you haven't been on here for a while. Um, but one of the cool things that we've changed recently with notifications is a better way to filter them. So because I not just work at GitHub, but I have a lot of um, organizations and teams that I'm part of on GitHub, sometimes I want to see certain things. I want to be able to filter certain things. So for example, when I come in on a Monday, I don't want to see all this stuff from all my weekend projects or open source teams that I'm working with. I just want to see stuff from my GitHub org. So I can go into the notifications and filter by the organization. I can say, yep, just show me stuff from GitHub. Or if I'm like, oh, I wonder what my team specifically say B Dougie. I wonder what B Dougie's um, got for me. So I can go and filter by um, author as well. So I can go and filter that down. So I can really help man manage my notifications, which is really cool. Uh, the next one is reminders. And reminders are a really good way to control the way you work. Again, I don't always want reminders um, for all my orgs. So we can uh, set up reminders specific to each org that you're part of. Um, and what you can even do is that reminders that um, are linked into Slack. So I'm integrated into Slack, so I can set up a reminder to say like, hey, if I haven't touched this issue in a few days, send me a reminder um, on Slack. Um, you can set up things like Sleepbot as well, which tells you like, hey, no one's touched this issue for 14 days. It's going to close if no one does something to it. Um, so you can go to your profile, um, go and choose the organization team that you're part of and click on settings and set different reminders that you need and really help take control of your work that way. Um, so as I said, you can connect into Slack too and you can set um, organization settings. So for example, if I only wanna see um, Slack notifications to my GitHub org, I can send them to my GitHub Slack. Or if I wanted to set them to my open source org, I could set them to my open source team on Slack, um, which is really, really awesome. And I see people are already stalking one another on how to do stuff. So um, I love that. Um, so Aaron's got a GitHub action on his profile um, to update his readme whenever he publishes a blog post. I really love that. And I'll show you some of the actions I have running on my profile as well. Um, now talking about personalization of GitHub before we jump into a few other features. Uh, one of the things that people really, really ask for and something that we launched last year um, at Universe, you've probably seen this GIF making its way around, the all the video making its way around. Uh, this is one of our most loved tweets and we put it out last year um, at Universe was our GitHub dark mode, which is super exciting because um, like many people, I was also using a, um, like an extension 
fun fact, the extension I was using was open source and available on GitHub. Um, but yeah, I was using an extension, but now we have dark mode um, available natively in GitHub, which is really awesome. So if you haven't seen it, you can go to your profile and you can flip across um, up the top um, on your above your readme profile and you can flip to dark mode. Um, and if you want to go into it a little bit more, if you've already used that feature, um, you can flip it up in your repository or you can even go into your settings as well. Uh, we also have a new dim mode as well. So if you go into um, your profile settings, you'll see uh, there's also a dim mode. So you can have like a dark mode, like a high contrasty type dim mode, or you can have light mode. Uh, now, because I am a huge fan of dark mode, uh, where possible, I'm going to be using dark mode for the rest of this presentation. And when we do the demo, I'll be using dark mode as well. So the next one is collaboration. So here's a few ways to collaborate on GitHub. Now, one of them is project boards. So this is our project board um, that is publicly available and it shows all our uh, public roadmap. Um, and our project boards are a really great way, not just for tracking overall progress of a project, but it's a really good way for developers and non-developers to work together. So with a project board, you can link to different issues, you can add notes, um, and it's just a really, really great way um, to collaborate. And it's something that I really love. Um, something that is also coming new is a new way to see and view projects. So um, this is currently available in um, public beta. So for example, instead of just having um, the overall board, you can now add and track specific issues and see their status, their assignees. Um, you can see, you can add different um, categories that you want to add and filter by. And then once you've got this kind of like project board type thing set up, um, you can create different um, views and things like that as well. So for example, if I like this game loop view, I can go and add that um, as a new view here, which is really cool. So I can change that to a new view and I can always have that done. You can view things as tables and boards and this this is stuff is like super exciting. These are some new things that are coming. Uh, another new thing that is coming, which is built into the project side of things is task lists. So when you create an issue now and you've got a list of tasks that you want to do, you can go in and um, convert those tasks to issues. And then as you close them, they'll get ticked off on the original uh, issue, which is really exciting because lots of people will often go in and start planning for a project. They'll like write a whole list of tasks and go, hey, we need actually issues for each one of these tasks. So now you can go and automatically do those. So as I th said, those, um, those couple of features are coming soon. You can actually go in right now and sign up for um, the beta on those. Um, and I'll show you where to do that. That's just on our, um, our page for this um, new project planning stuff, which is really cool. Um, so another way to collaborate really well with people on GitHub is discussions. Um, so if you haven't used discussions at all, or you're not part of a an open source repo that is using discussions, discussions are really, really fun. So with discussions, you can talk about different things and discuss uh, certain issues. Now, the reason, one of the reasons we decided, well, one of the reasons discussions exist because often if you have a look back at issues, you'll look at some issues and go, wow, that thing really wasn't an issue because an issue was really designed for like, you know, telling people what issues are, whether it's a feature you want or bug fix or things like that, mostly bug fixes, right? So often people go, oh, you know, we want this you know, new feature request. And it ends up becoming this giant big conversation, like why isn't this uh, in a forum type thing? So now you can have a discussion about that. Um, and if you ever find that your issues are becoming too much of like a conversationally type thing and you want to make it into a discussion, um, you can. So you can just go in and you can convert an issue um, into a discussion. So here we've got an issue and I'm like, oh yeah, um, this would be really cool. We should just convert it into a discussion. There's literally a button that says convert this into a discussion. It's super easy. Um, so it's really exciting. So discussions can be enabled at a repository level. And some of the other project -y type things that I mentioned, like having that big giant project board, um, that has to be enabled at the organization level. So you can then track projects across different orgs. But discussions is specific for each repo. So you can set up a discussion for each repo if you like. Uh, another thing that we have that we just launched 
um, publicly in beta on the 23rd of June and is now accessible in all public repos is issue forms. So if you are a maintainer of a project or um, you've got a team and you're like, okay, every time I get my team to submit an issue about a bug or a feature, like half the stuff isn't filled out. And no matter how much I create a really cool template for them to use, the half the stuff just isn't filled out. So what we've done is we've created this single issue forms. So if you want specific things to be added into a form, um, compulsory, uh, you can now add those in. You can add tick boxes. You can add bullet points. You can add like little description boxes. You can add categories and things like that. So it's kind of like a Google form, but it's built into issues, which will make, make uh, things a lot easier for maintainers and like team admins and things to start collecting information. So um, it's really cool. This is something that we'll um, go through a little bit in the demo too. Uh, so as I said, that one's publicly available to um, all publicly accessible repos as of the 23rd of June. It's currently in beta. So if you have, if you are using this or you end up using it after this talk, um, please give us feedback. We love your feedback. So um, I'll show you where to do that too. Now I'm going to dive into, we talked about some of the new features and things that have came up, um, come up from like using GitHub. Now I'm going to talk about some of the ways that not just we use GitHub, but I use it personally every day in a way a lot of our users use GitHub, but also some of the ways that you might want to think about using GitHub if you really want to take your GitHub usage to the next level. So the first one is GitHub for mobile. Now, I love GitHub for mobile because it allows you to take GitHub with you literally wherever you go. Um, so it's available on both iOS and Android. And since it's available on both those platforms, it's not just available on, say, your mobile phone. You can also use it on your iPad. Um, now, what I like about GitHub for mobile is it allows you to do a whole bunch of different things like quickly comment on issues, review a bug fix, merge code. There's even discussions on mobile. So we have a look at a couple of the mobile screens. Like, say, for example, this is a home screen. Um, so in the morning, like, say, on a Monday morning, I wake up, I roll out of bed. Um, actually, I don't even roll out of bed. I'm still in bed, but I check my phone. Uh, but I can roll over in bed, pick up my phone, open up GitHub, and see, all right, what issues uh, have been assigned to me this week? Now, it's Monday my time, um, so it's usually like Sunday still in the US, um, but we have a whole lot of GitHub actions set up to automatically open cer certain issues at the start of a week. So I can wake up, roll over, click on my issues and see what has been assigned to me um, for that week without even having to get out of bed uh, before I make breakfast, which is really cool. Uh, I can also have a look at like what pull requests I may ha might have missed from like an open source project or something I was working on over the weekend. Um, and I can really just like look at all these different things and like have a really good sense of what's happening. Now, I can't just, I don't just have to do this in bed. Obviously, we've been in lockdown, so I haven't been anywhere. Um, but it's really useful when you're traveling on the go. I don't always have to pull out my laptop. I can be sitting at a cafe um, or in an airport, and it's just like really, really easy um, to check. Uh, there's also a couple other cool things on the mobile app, like GitHub Explore, so you can see like, um, featured repositories and featured trending things. You can see like we've got some coding interviews and stuff. Um, and there's even some new things that like you can see, like all our release notes straight on mobile now, which is really, really awesome. <laughs> like Phil Nash is like actions to open weekly issues sounds really interesting. It's actually really, really useful. Um, so no one from my team has to go and open an issue at the start of the week. It's just automatically done for us, um, which is really great. Uh, now, the other cool thing about mobile is we're always shipping new features to GitHub, um, GitHub for mobile. So there's a couple of new things that we've shipped kind of recently, as I mentioned, release notes. Um, but now there's a whole lot of new ways to filter things on mobile, which makes it really, really easy. Now, going back to that whole idea of personalization, being able to filter and manage your notifications, being able to filter all this stuff on mobile is super awesome. So I can filter issues by... Um, like labels, assignees, I can filter issues um, by like multiple labels as well, um, which is really cool. Uh, someone's saying it's um, greatly improved since you last used the app. As I mentioned, we're always updating mobile. So if you haven't um, updated mobile in a while, go and update it. Um, I think the last time I gave this talk, it was like a month ago and we've already updated it since then. So this is new since that last talk that I gave a month ago. Um, 
And the other cool thing about some of these filterings is I'm just looking at the GIF now. You can actually filter by emojis, which is really cool. So if you want to filter by like, oh, which issues have given me a thumbs up, go check it. Um, so as, um, as you mentioned, yeah, we, we do a lot of updates to mobile. So go and check them. Go and check it out. Uh, download GitHub for mobile if you don't have it uh, or go and update it um, if you've already got it. So it's a really great way to just use GitHub on the go. As I mentioned, uh, it's on iOS and Android, so you can have it on both phone, iPad, tablet, whatever you're using, which is really cool. Um, another way that I like to use um, GitHub is GitHub for desktop, um, or GitHub desktop, which is available on Windows and Mac OS. Now, the reason I like GitHub for desktop is it's a really good way to manage your repos. And when you're working on a local, um, like piece of code or like a local repository, a local Git environment, GitHub on desktop is a really, really good way to manage that and see what you need to pull in or push out. Um, as a, like a non-developer by background, um, I love this because like I'll pop into GitHub for desktop after I've made some changes and it'll be like this big blue button that says, hey, you've got changes to push or you've got things to pull in. Um, and it's really, really great and I love it. So. Um, GitHub desktop is awesome. And obviously, same thing when you're pushing a, um, online, um, when you're making changes and you're about to update your, your main branch, you'll see that um, you can see all the changes that have been made to each file there, which is something I really like. So again, we're always making changes to um, desktop. So if you've got the desktop version, go and check it out and make sure you're up to date. Um, so if you uh, not super into GitHub for mobile or GitHub for desktop, um, or you are a bit sick of using GitHub.com, so there's three ways. Uh, you can use GitHub the fourth way, which is our GitHub CLI. This is something, again, we launched last year and is constantly in development, and there's so many exciting things that are always being done to the GitHub CLI. Uh, but developers are loving the CLI because it allows you to work seamlessly in one window. Um, you can do so many things on the CLI. You can create, edit, view issues. You can check out PRs. You can merge PRs. You can do my personal favorite, which is coining repos. Um, you can now manage all your SSH keys from CLI as well, which is really, um, really, really useful. So, um, yeah, it's available on Windows, Mac, OS, and Linux. So it doesn't matter what platform you're using. Um, the CLI is amazing. Um, and fun fact about the CLI is the CLI is actually open source. So if you want to contribute to the CLI, you can. Um, obviously, there's no obligation for you to, but it's a really fun uh, product to use. I've been using it quite a lot as well. So speaking about using things quite a lot, uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about and show you a demo about how I like to use GitHub. Um, this is how I use GitHub on my live streams, how I use GitHub in my daily work. And it's super fun. So I'm going to switch to a demo. So if the team in StreamYard can put me on full screen um, so I can stop sharing this screen and go start sharing a new screen. Um, and then give me a second before I actually show everything because right now there's going to be some funky Inception stuff going on. Um, all right. Let's pop that over there. And then, cool. So now you should be able to see my screen share. Awesome. Sweet. So this is GitHub, obviously. Uh, using it in dark mode, which is really fun. Um, so this is my GitHub profile readme. And there's a whole lot of cool things going on in here. Now, as I mentioned, you can add lots of different things to your profile readme. So I thought I might just go really briefly through some things I've got. Um, so I've got a GIF, which is really fun. People ask me where I got this GIF made. It is actually a GIF of my room, as you can see. Um, some of the things in here are obviously show up in the image. I got that done on Fiverr, so I'm not an artist. Go to Fiverr if you want really cool stuff. Um, I added a bunch of social media links. These are all just little images. A, another GIF. So if you want a GitHub OctaCat like this, you can go to my OctaCat generator and build your own OctaCat. Um, so I will pop this link in the chat for everyone. So you can go and build your own OctaCat. So you can go click get started. Let's see, move this over to the side. And you can go and build your own OctaCat, which is really, really cool. Um, this is something we launched 
a couple years ago. Now people absolutely love it. You can go in and change different things and colors and add funky tops and do all kind of fancy things. So that's how you get that one. Uh, the next one is GitHub Skyline. So if you haven't checked out um, Skyline, uh, Skyline got a lot of hype when it went live um, last year. It feels like we did a lot last year. Um, so if you chuck in your username into the little bar here and click Create Skyline, you'll see a 3D contribution graph of your GitHub um, contributions, which is really awesome. So you can grab this, you can flip it around. There's some cool music. I've got it muted at the moment. Um, if you want to grab a cool GIF of this, you can turn the UI off and just see it like that. Um, you can also download the SEL file so you can go and 3D print it yourself like this. Um, or you can go and get it printed by someone else as well. So that's really cool. Um, then there's some bunch of GitHub stats and things. And I also have some GitHub actions running on my profile. So this is a little snake um, that comes on my profile. So each every six hours, I've set this action to generate a contribution graph um, of the last however long. And then the snake comes along and eats it. Um, if you want to know how to do that, I wrote a dev post um, on how to do that. So I will grab that one for you and pop that in the chat. So this is something that I set up and, um, well, I didn't set this up, sorry. Uh, something that I wrote um, on Dev2 and somebody else created this amazing action. I wrote a tutorial on how to actually put it in. Um, so you can see it here, how to have an awesome GitHub profile and I've linked back to here, uh, which is the person who created. If you ever share any open source stuff um, or anything that someone else has created, Go and, go and um, shout them out. This is a nice thing to do. So I've added them in here, which is really cool. Uh, there's a bunch of codes for this profile one. There's a bunch of code snippets on how to create an amazing profile. So on to GitHub itself. So one of the ways I love to use GitHub every day is when I'm either coding or I want to add some changes to a repo, um, what I'll do is I'll often come into GitHub see which repo I want to do, make sure it's cloned onto my personal computer, use VS Code, make some changes, and then push that all up to GitHub. Now, I'm going to show you the process I use to, um, to do that and some of the different GitHub features because I'm one of those people who likes, I like using all the things. Um, so when I use GitHub each day, I'm using the, the, um, the desktop, the CLI, um, the web, and you can choose which way you want to use it as well. So I have this repo set up called GitHub Like a Boss. It's a public repo that we use to do a whole bunch of demos and cool things like that. So say if I wanted to make some changes to this readme, I could obviously click edit and make some changes. But what if I want to do it on my personal machine first and then make some changes and then add it to um, the repo? So one of the ways I would do that is to make sure I have this repo on my personal computer first. Now, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use the CLI and I'm going to make sure that I've got the GitHub CLI installed first by typing GH into my terminal of choice and seeing if I've got it installed. So obviously it's installed and there's a new version available and literally I used this last like a few days ago. So there's new versions all the time. I can go grab the new version or I can just keep using it um, right now if I like. So I'm just going to keep using it for the moment. So what I need to do is I need to CD into the location where all my repos are stored on my public computer. And that is not it. That's my NDC file. Um, but if I go to my documents, I've got a folder here called Git Repos. So we're going to CD into that location and we're going to clone the repo into here. So if we go into this location and then we're just going to go GH repo clone. Hopefully this is big enough for everyone. I'll make it bigger. No. Um, so GH repo clone. And then because you're using the GitHub CLI already, you don't need to write GitHub for this. You just need to write the name of the, um, the repo. So if I was cloning a GitHub repo, it would be GitHub slash GitHub if I was working um, on our organization level. Um, but this one's my personal account. So it's just Mitch Manners. And it's GitHub like a boss is the name of the repo. Now if I hit that, and enter, it'll say it's cloning. Uh, it'll say done, sweet. So now if I go over to my folder, should have here, beautiful. We can see it's got a little um, OneDrive spinning thing, which means it just got added. 
Uh, now, the way I like to use these is to open them up in um, an editor of choice. My editor of choice is VS Code. This is something I was working on a little while ago. Um, when I say a little while ago, I literally mean yesterday. So I'm just going to close this folder so we can open up a new one. And all I can do is I can drag this um, folder that I've just cloned and I can dump it into VS Code and then it'll beautifully add everything in with all my nice... Um, my nice files and everything all written here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a change to the readme here. So let's just say, all right, we've got NDC talk here, um, NDC Melbourne, and um, so I've got like an image here. So this can have like a boss. I usually put like where this talk is being given. So let's just say this one abstract is same as above. We'll just make that small little change. We'll save that. Now, how do I know that it has been added to my um, repo in the cloud? And if we go back, have a look, and we click on refresh, we'll scroll down, and there'll probably be nothing there because right now the change is just made on my computer. So the way that I want to make sure that's updated, I like to use GitHub um, Desktop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this folder, this local folder in Desktop. Um, I'm going to add that repository, and sweet, so it's already picked up that I've made a change. So we can see I've made a change here, it's on line 45, it's in the readme file, and I want to commit that change to my main branch. So I can go commit. So now it's committed, but it's not pushed up to the cloud, so it's committed, it's my git on my local machine, and now what I do is commit that to the, um, the cloud, so I can click push origin. And it'll do some fancy things and it'll say, yes, you're all done, which is awesome. Now what happens if I make a change on, so let's refresh that. What happens if I make a change on um, on the cloud? So let's just make a change. Uh, let's make a real small one. Let's go show some tips and tricks, dig into the HP and sometimes even see a demo. Well, let's commit that. Let's commit that directly to the main branch. Cool. Uh, so someone's asking, what? Well, oh, I knew I would get a question about my VS Code theme. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll jump into that in a second. All right, so let's go to desktop and let's have a look if there's been any changes made. So it should. Give it a second and my internet will work, which should say... There has been a change made on the machine. And actually, let's, let's have a look here. Uh, it's taking a little bit, but let's open up VS Code. Actually, you know what? So since Aaron already asked what theme is this, <laughs> this is a really cool theme um, for VS Code. And it's called VS Code Fortnite theme. Um, uh, I think it was Sarah, her name was. She was like, this is the most useless um open source project i've ever shipped and it's a fortnite theme you can even have like clouds and chickens and um if you set it up you can even have a llama running across your screen but um i just have the colors because I, I really like it um so let's make a tiny change in here and i'll show you what happens if i try and make a change on my local and try and push it up so if i go commit and it should Make, uh, there we go, it's giving me an error, which is perfect. That's what I want. So it says desktop is unable to push commits to this branch because there are commits on the remote that are not present in local. You need to fetch these before reconciling them. So we'll grab them. So if, this is why I like desktop because it does all these things so you don't have to think like, oh, what's there or what's that command for that thing or get push, merge, I don't know what it is. So this is a really good one if you're getting non-developers to work with you as well. Um, I just like it because it's got great UI. Um, please tell me you have the llama. <laughs> no, I don't have the llama. Um, I totally did not get the llama. Okay, perfect. So that's all done and changed, which is awesome. Um, now one thing that we also shipped really recently that I want to show you before I jump back into a couple of the other features, um, was this cool thing here. So if I got a repository that I've been working on, um, so B Dougie and I did this really cool like Git Twitch um, theme where we built a um, chatbot interaction between uh, GitHub and Twitch. 
and I forked this repo and we worked on it for a while. Now, I haven't worked on this for a little while, which is why I had to scroll quite uh, down quite a bit. Now, if I have a look at this, it says my branch is seven commits ahead of the main, but it's now 11 commits behind B Dougie's branch. Um, this is, I love this UI in GitHub because it tells you like what's like how far ahead or behind you are. And it's got this brand new button, if you can see, I'm going to zoom in a bit more, that says fetch upstream. So I can click that and now I can just open a pull request straight from here, uh, which is really cool. So if you've been working on something for a little while um, and you have worked on it and you come back to it, and you're like, oh, I wonder if, I, um, how, if I'm ahead or behind of what's happening. So you can go and fetch that in now, which is really cool. Uh, that was just something I really wanted to show off because it's just, it's really cool. Now, a couple of the other things I wanted to talk about were some of the new um, issues stuff that we show. I'm just keep keeping an eye on time. We've about 10 minutes left for demo. Um, so I talked about one of the new issues we talked about, one of the new features we talked about with issues is being able to create form um, task lists. We'll come to forms in a second. We'll create task lists um, for an issue. So say I want to, um, like you like my setup, so let's... Um, Mish wants a new setup. Okay, here are the things I need for my new setup in my room. All right, I need a new, just say I need a new computer. I actually don't need a new computer, but let's just say I need a new computer. Um, I need some lights and I want maybe some new, I always spell this wrong, wrong with peripherals. I knew I'd spell that wrong. It's always pH. Okay, that's a small is Okay, cool. Let's go. So that's a pretty good overall project. Now, obviously, if I was writing a bigger project or um, if I was setting up a new house, for example, this list would be a lot longer. But for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to do three things. Okay, submit new issue. So there we go. Okay, this is pretty cool. And I'm like, oh, I actually want to build my own computer for this. So I'm probably going to need a list of that, that list. Now, one thing I could do is obviously go edit and add like a another layer of list and maybe add like of bullet points but this is probably not going to be what I want so let's cancel that um so that's not really what I want but oh actually what's this new thing okay I can convert this to an issue so let's go and convert that to an issue oh look there's, there's an issue oh let's say what well, issues are all these things okay so now I can go into here and go oh look there's a new issue that's being created sweet there's no description because obviously it just creates it with blanks so let's go right my new computer I want to be really bold. I want a 3080 RTX Ti graphics card. I want 64 gig of RAM. Um, I also might want to buy a heat sink. Oh, that'll do for the moment. Uh, I won't get too greedy right now. <laughs> um, gold for Australia. Yes, go for us. So say I've got these things and I'm like, cool. Um, this task list is now done. So it's Say I bought all these things. I've been really ambitious. You can see the progress bar at the top here is telling me how many tasks I've completed and also telling me where this issue is being tracked. So say this issue is tracked in another issue and if I can hover over that, I can see the things there. So say I've done that. So all three tasks are done. Now what if, happens if I go back to that issue? Um, would that issue be ticked off as complete for that thing? Now obviously I need to refresh, um, but it should be tracking it there and sometimes it works, sometimes not. Um, there we go. So I can go tick that off there. We have one of three tasks. Then I can go into my lights, go, cool. All right, what lights do I want here? Um, let's go, I want the new Elgato ring light, some nano leaves, like that, some Wi-Fix lights, maybe a Philips hue, and then put them all in a Google Nest using Home Assistant, whoops, I can't type today, with GitHub Actions. Wait. Done. Sounds pretty cool. So let's tick all those off. Uh, I won't tick off the last one because that, that is actually a, um, a live stream that I'm eventually going to be doing very soon. I've got a, I bought a Google Nest and we're using Home Assistant for some fancy GitHub Actions. Uh, GitHub to manage shopping lists. You laugh, but I actually use GitHub to manage my shopping lists. Uh, which is really exciting. Um, <laughs> sounds exciting, kind of. All right, let's go. Uh, I want to show you about how to do the, um, the issue forms because this one's really exciting. Um, we'll just do them directly in GitHub just to um, 
uh, for fun because I can show you the previews as we're going. Uh, but I set up one before here, this little test file here. But all I can do is I can set up an issue form. Now, if you haven't used issue templates or issue forms before, um, issue your issue templates lives under your .github and this folder called issue template. That means whenever I open up an issue and I see like these things here, these are all the templates here. But say we want to create a template, um, we want a new, we want to build a new issue form. So the issue forms are run on YAML files. So let's go add a file, create new file. Uh, and we're going to call this um, request demo. I want to I want to build a form for it. Since it's my GitHub like a boss, I want to build a form for requesting um, a live demo. Um, and I'll just do a really short one so we can jump into a couple of questions. Um, so say we want this one, we want... Um, Request a demo from Dish. Um, that did not work up there. We won't print dot yaml. There we go. Perfect. So it says now. I was like, why is it not perfect? Here we go. This is an issue template. Need help? Check out the documentation. Um, now we can obviously preview that, but it's um, it's in yaml, so that's all good. So let's go. We want a description here. I'll make this a little bit bigger so you can actually see it. Uh, let's go. All right. We want a description, and we're going to call this. Um, Ask Mish to demo something get hobby. <laughs> I'm just reading some of the comments as I'm going. Um, title, uh, let's go. Request, and then whatever the title is that someone types in. Then we want, we can add labels to it as well. So we want labels. Um, what are the labels I've got in this one? Um, let's have a look. Uh, labels. So I've got bug, documentation, enhancement. Well, let's just put one as Twitch. Twitch will do. Labels and we'll go Twitch and maybe enhancement. Enhancement, we want feature enhancement. Did I spell that right? I'm not probably coding, I always spell things wrong. Signies and we'll assign myself to it. That'll do. Read it and type there. Perfect. All right. So we want the body of this to be um, in next session. We need to do. We need to type in what type we want. So we want this to be markdown. So we want this issue to be um, done and written in markdown. We also want some attributes for it. These attributes are going to be the form that we fill out. I don't think I spelled that wrong. Attributes. Again, this is my problem with coding. I always mess up the actual spelling of things. I'm like, why does my thing not work? Um, okay, value. So the value is like the thing that we want to give people when they fill out the form. So thanks for requesting a demo. We'll get back to you soon. We will get back to you soon. Make that easy so I don't have to worry about the comma. There. Okay, now we want type. So we want this to be an, um, an input type. Um, so we want, we want people to be able to fill out this form. So we're going to go type. This is the input. So this bit up the top will be what they see be like a little bit of a text, which is why it's just written in markdown. And this next bit is going to be user input. So let's go, um, all right, let's go. We want some uh, contact details from this person. Attributes. And we want to grab the contact details. Um, so let's go description. Um, now, if you have a look at the documentation, we can make this whole bit really easy by just um, copying and pasting some of the code we've got um, here as well. So if we go syntax for issue forms, you can have a look at all of the stuff here. Um, I want to wrap this up so I can answer a question or two. Um, so let's just grab all this and then we're going to basically copy and paste this in and we can go up the top here. Uh, demo request ask 
I've just snuck in in the background here, Mish. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we didn't go. have any questions on Slido because you were very, very, very good at answering questions on YouTube. Oh, uh, there we the go. Comments. So I'll keep yeah. going for, for one more minute so we'll finish this up. And I did have a question. I... Yeah, cool. <laughs> just because. No, I just wondered because you went through a million things now. Is there one or two that you would pick out and say, hey, if you just want to focus on really getting some you know, productivity or whatever, these are the things you would focus on? Yeah, cool. So if you're really wanting to get into some of the productivity stuff, I really, really like the project boards. Um, now, as I mentioned, our um, GitHub public roadmap is available on project boards um, and it's available as project boards. If you go and look at it, it's just, it's just really, really simple and easy. Now, this is my number one thing. Now, when somebody mentioned in like the chat, like oh, GitHub for shopping lists, I actually use a project board, like a GitHub project board to manage my life. And I have a column for like <laughs> things awesome. that need to get done. I have a column for like GitHub stuff that needs to get done. I have a column for like tracking issues that I just want to like keep an eye on, but I'm not sure where exactly I want to put them. And I have, I play a lot of Pokemon Go. So I have a column for Pokemon Go, which Pokemon I'm going to be trading to my friends. <laughs> so That's awesome. What about one for program? rare Octocat oh. stickers? Yeah, so the roadmap, go and have a look at it as, a, as an example of how to do it. But I, I think the, the projects are really exciting, which is why this, um, the new, the GitHub issues is, uh, well, like the new project boards are going to be really exciting, like giving you all these different views on how to do stuff. Um, That's awesome. So I think it's really cool. And um, I will, once I finish up um, talking here, I will pop some links into the chat. Um, but basically... Cool. Yeah, like if you want to find out more about what's happening, come follow us on um, Twitter and YouTube because we're always shipping new features. And, um, yeah, just hit me up on any of the socials if you want to know more. But, yeah, it's just it's really exciting um, all the different things we're doing and um, I think the new project stuff is cool. Oh, I can, I can just – I'm just absorbing your enthusiasm. It's really cool. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Oh, thank you so much, Mish. We're going um, to gonna go to something – stretchy now actually um, awesome. but I'm, I'm actually going to join in for the yoga because i'm really oh, excited nice. for yoga so uh, i'm sticking around to join in for fantastic yoga. <laughs> thank you so much mish and thanks for being part of adc melbourne that's awesome My all right i'm going to hand it over to melissa who is going to take uh, us into the world of yoga thanks Lars. So yeah, I don't know about you, but I have been sitting here kind of a little hunched over at my desk all day, super engrossed in all these awesome talks. So it's time for us to, to get moving a little bit and get a little bit of a, a stretch in. We have a, a very special guest, Amy Dunstan from Happy Melon Studios in Armadale, Melbourne. So here local in Melbourne, Victoria, and she's a, gonna lead us through a mindful yoga session. She's the corporate wellness manager and league lead yoga and meditation teacher. She has more than seven years of experience teaching both in studios and online in this new virtual world that we have. And she's here to help us release some of that tension from sitting down at their desks. So I hope you follow along and, and get some movements in. So take it away for us, Amy. Hey, Amy, sorry, we, we can't hear you. <laughs> So let's just fix that sound so we can follow along with Amy's cool stretches, a chance to, to get out of your seat uh, if you can get a floor mask. Give us talk. Yeah, sorry, Amy. <laughs> maybe try if you're on mute, maybe. <laughs> See if you're on mute within. Oh, there you go. Unmute. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. okay. Awesome. Let's take two. I was just talking to myself, but what I was saying was that you made me sound much more famous and important than I am. Um, but welcome, everyone. We've got a short 15-minute sequence together today. So I want to get you up and away from your desk if possible. So make your way over to somewhere that's not your desk. Come up into a standing position to start. And if you've got a mat, that's amazing. But if you don't, just imagine that you've got one and you need that kind of amount of space. So when you make your way into your standing position, just slide your shoulders all the way down your back. Let your palms face forward and then close your eyes down when you're ready. Can you quite literally just stop here? Take a pause, 
before we get started and just notice where you are. Begin to draw your attention inwards, just away from the world around you, away from whatever's happened this morning and just start to find yourself very much in your body. Grounding down into your feet, take a full breath in and a full breath out. From here, reach your arms all the way out and up. Take hold of your left wrist with your right hand and then from here, lean over towards the right. Soften your knees and here, can you take a big breath into the left side of your body? So imagine your left lung is breathing here. And then bring yourself back through the centre. Take hold of your right wrist and lean over to the left. Soften your knees, take a full breath in. From here, bring yourself back to centre. Release the hands now behind your back and you can either interlace your fingers or take hold of opposite elbows behind your back. Roll your shoulder blades down your back. Soften your knees, lift your heart up, take a big breath in. From here, bend your knees and start to slowly fold yourself forward. So from here, this is going to look very different on all of us, so you might have to bend your knees quite a lot. But see if you can ground yourself down into your feet, soft knees, and then let your head hang just as best you can. From here, you might actually move your head a little bit side to side, just release any tension through your neck. And if you've still got your hands interlaced behind your back, can you gently squeeze your shoulder blades together? Now take a big breath in right in between your shoulder blades. And release your hands down to the floor. From here we take what's called a halfway lift. So you slide your hands up your shins. If you've been to the gym and done a deadlift, it's kind of like that. So you move your hips back and the sternum moves forward. See if you can find a really long flat back here. Take a big breath in. From here slide your hands down the back of your legs as you breathe out and just fold all the way down. From here, bring your fingertips to the floor, bend your left knee and step your right foot all the way back. Quite a long step. Staying on the fingertips, send your right heel back, your left knee forward. Just starting to loosen up through the hips a little bit. Can you take an easy breath? From here, lower your right knee down. Point the back foot and reach your arms up. So this is called a low lunge. And see if here, if you need to, you can have your hands resting on your thigh. Otherwise, the arms can be up and overhead. See if you can invite a stretch into your right quad. So you might lengthen your tailbone down, lift up through your spine and look forward. Take a breath. Bring your fingertips down to the floor. Tuck your back toes, lift your back knee, step the right foot forward. Now and again, fold. So your feet are about hip distance in their width. So two fists would fit between the arches. Then from here, take your halfway lift again. So hands slide up the shins, flat back, inhale. Hands down the back of your legs, fold forward, exhale. From here, fingertips down. This time, left foot steps all the way back. Left knee down. Actually, lift your back knee back up. We took an extra moment here. So send your back heel back, right knee forward, and see just how long you can get here. So big stretch for the left hip. Find your breath. Gently lower the left knee down now, then point your back foot. As you press down into your feet, reach your arms all the way up. Give yourself two breaths here and see if you can just keep inviting length. Left quad, left hip, press into both of your feet. Then bring your fingertips down. And from here, tuck your back toes, lift the back knee. And from here, I'm going to give you two options. So you can either come into a plank <laughs> or lower your knees and do a, a modified plank, whatever suits you. From here, settle your eyes forward, take a breath in. As you exhale, bend your elbows and slowly lower yourself down to your belly. So I'm hoping that you like this stretch. So you'll take your right arm into a 90 degree bend. Take your right elbow in line with your right shoulder, right hand is flat. Turn your head now to the left. Rest on your right cheek. Press into your left hand and roll the left side of your body on top of the right. So if anyone's got lower back sensitivity, just bend your knees in towards your chest here. Take a breath into your right pec, your right shoulder. I know we've all been sitting behind the computer, so just feel yourself reversing that. You're literally opening up through your front. And then from here, extend your legs straight. 
come back onto your belly and we'll swap sides. So your left arm now goes out into a 90 degree bend. Turn your head to the right. Slowly roll yourself onto your left hip, your right hip stacks on top of it, and then maybe bend your knees towards your chest. Right shoulder down your back. And then here, take an easy breath. One more. Relax your jaw. And then from here, bring yourself back onto your belly. We'll come into child's pose from here, knees a little bit wider than your hips, big toes are together. And as best you can, let your hips get heavy towards your heels. If you can't bring your head down to the floor, forehead down, you can stack your fists underneath your forehead. And I'm aware that it might not look like this for everyone, so just be nice and gentle, soften bit in front of your hips. And see here if you can breathe into your lower back. So especially if you're feeling like you're a bit depleted at the moment or you're sort of teetering on burnout, anything where you breathe into your lower back is really nourishing for the kidneys. So take one more deep breath down into lower back. And then from here, release your hands. Come on up onto all fours. From here, we'll do a couple of rounds of cat-cow. Lengthen out your spine, inhale. So here, you keep your hips stacked on top of your knees, shoulders on the wrists, tail goes up, crown of your head goes up and forward. And then reverse that, round through your back, tuck your tailbone, tuck your chin, spread your shoulder blades apart. And we'll do that a few more times with breath. So lengthen out your spine, inhale. Round through your back and breathe out. Two more, lengthen. And round as you breathe out. One more. Exhale. From here, slowly find neutral spine. And from here, make your way down onto your butt. So from here, you're going to bring your legs out in front of you. You can, you can face any direction that you like. And then from here, reach your arms all the way up. You can bend your knees if you need to. Fold forward, see if you can keep your spine long. And then when you're folding, you're folding all the way. You might walk your sit bones back. Again, it might look like this for some of us. See if you can tuck your chin wherever you are. You can always bend your knees and then let your head go heavy. Three breaths. Where every time you breathe out, it's like you're literally releasing tension. You release really stored up stress from your body, from your tissues, from your joints. It's letting go of the day that's been. And then from here, use your breath in just to slowly roll yourself up. From here, reach your arms forward and you're going to roll all the way down onto your back. Hallelujah. And as you bring yourself down onto your back, let your palms face up and just close your eyes down here for a moment. Feel the floor. Feel your breath. And then from here, bring both of your feet onto the floor, hip distance apart. Bring your right ankle on top of your left one. From here, interlace the hands behind the left thigh. Draw the left knee in towards you, right knee away from you. This is optional, so you might just leave the left foot on the ground here and take a full breath in. Big breath out. Just releasing tension through the right glute hip, softening your face. And then slowly you'll swap sides, so let go with both of your both feet on the floor, left ankle on right thigh. From here, interlace your fingers behind your right thigh, draw the right knee in towards you, shoulder blades down your back, and see if here you can take two relaxing breaths. Just give yourself some space. When you finish your next breath out, bring both of your feet onto the floor. From here, take your arms out into a big T-shape or that double cactus again. And let your knees just drop casually over to the left. Your head can go to the right. So any kind of twist is very nourishing for your nervous system. Just nourishing the spinal column, releasing any tension through your back, your belly. 
In your own time, swap it over. Your knees will now go to the right. Your head can go to the left. Soft, natural breaths. And from here, bring yourself slowly back to the center. From here, hug your knees in towards your chest. Give yourself a big squeeze. And release into Shavasana here, which is where you just lay yourself completely flat. It's probably what you've been waiting for. Slide your shoulders down your back, palms facing up. Your feet will naturally turn out and then take a full breath in. Just fill up your whole body. Sigh out your mouth. And allow yourself here just to dive quite deeply into rest. Letting your breath be natural, letting your mind go wherever it likes. I'll let you know when it's time to come back. Slowly starting to bring your awareness back. Could you relax your body even just 10% more here? <laughs> Begin to deepen your breath. And from here, roll yourself over to the right for energy or the left for a little more calm. A fetal position here so you can bend your knees, just rest on your bottom arm. And then from here, bring yourself slowly up into a comfortable seat. If there's such a thing, you can straighten your legs if you need. Kneeling is welcome. And then roll your shoulders down your back. Sit up nice and tall. Hands on your thighs and then close your eyes down. Bring a little smirk or a smile to your face, even if it's from the inside out, and notice how you feel. Notice if you found a little more room inside for breath and for quiet in your mind. Take a slow breath in. And an easy breath out. From here, please bring your hands to prayer just in front of your heart. Gently bow your head down. Just giving thanks to your body, to yourself for making this time, and to each other. Namaste. Enjoy the rest of whatever today holds. I hope that was a, a nice little pause for you and you feel like you've got some space. Thank you very much, Amy. I don't know about everyone else watching, but we in, here in the studio definitely got a good stretch in. If you go on Lars's Twitter, you can see some, some nice shots of the, the team here doing our stretches. Um, so that's really easy nice to look at. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us today, Amy. Thank you so much. See you later. Great. And now we're, it's time to get back into our talks. So I'm going to hand over to Lars to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Melissa. Um, now, just before we get into the next talk, I'm going to bang on about this expo site. Please go there, expo.ndcmelbourne.com. You can win excellent prizes. I'm just going to read out a few of them. There's, of course, a ticket or one or more tickets for next year's NDC Melbourne, hopefully in person. That is the plan. There are Amazon gift cards. There are gift pay vouchers. There are smartwatches, me bands, and there are digital keep cups. I don't even know what they are, but you can win one. So please go there, register details, and we will get to the prize draw at the end of this uh conference on this day for NDC Melbourne. Now, that brings me to our next speaker, and he is one of the original DDD Melbourne founders, which was a long time ago, uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, he uh, He's a tech lead for Willow. He is working on IoT solutions. He has Australia's largest collection of aged cheese, and he's a volunteer firefighter. I'm not sure if those two are related, but in any case, welcome, Alex Mackey, and thank you for being part of NDC Melbourne. Thanks very much, Lars. 
Oh, you're welcome. So um, you're going to talk about rockets or? I, we're not going to be talking about rockets. Well, maybe we will a little bit. <laughs> Very good. Now, I know you're going to be talking about digital twins because that's what it says in the title. Um, this is one of the things that I haven't actually played with, so I'm kind of keen to see what the possibilities are. I know it's IoT and I know that it's um, that sort of world of things on Azure, but other than that, I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, now for those of you planning to use this to go and stretch around and take a break, please, please stick around. Um, I'll tell you why I think this is going to be interesting and applicable to a lot of people. Um, it is one of those sort of maybe niche services that's uh, a little bit rarer, but uh, let me tell you uh, all about it. So um, welcome to introduction to Digital Twins and the Azure Digital um, Twin platform. My name is Alex Mackey. Um, Everything I'm going to show you today, I'll put up at my website, simpleisbest.co.uk, um, so you can go and get this stuff later. Uh, I work as a tech lead for an organization called Willow. Uh, at Willow, we're very much focused on digital twins um, and uh, for, for the building systems and critical infrastructure. So uh, if I do my job correctly, what are you going to learn in the next 45 minutes or so? Well, we're going to start off by talking what exactly is a digital twin in the first place? How are digital twins been used in the real world? Where did these things come from in the first place? And then we're going to look at the fundamentals of the Azure Digital Twin platform. So you can go and implement this stuff yourself. So before you nip off for lunch, one thing I do want to mention is that the global twin market is massive. Now, those crazy analysts, and some of them are a bit crazy, have estimated this is an area that's going to be growing to 17.4 billion US dollars by 2024. I think because of the size of this, there's a reasonable likelihood that if you're a developer or involved in some aspect of software engineering, at some point, you might quite likely will touch a digital twin um, project. So what exactly is a digital twin anyway? Well, simply put, a digital twin can be thought of as a virtual representation of a real world item or process. Let's take a simple example. We've got a, a cog, and this cog is equipped with a number of sensors. Maybe they measure the revolutions of this cog, and they send this data into some kind of digital twin system or platform. And on this platform, we create a virtual representation of this cog. Now, linking these two things, you'll find in the literature, this is referred to as a thread, which I think is kind of a nice analogy, given these two things are inextricably linked. Now. An important thing I want to get across is you don't necessarily need to use digital twins to model things like COGS um, or engineering or engines, which is often a lot of examples you see. These could be processes as well. And I'm going to show you a few examples of how this has been um, employed at the moment. Let's start off with a simple example um, of a digital twin. Now, let's take any typical large building. This building has several, um, probably 100 different systems operating inside of it. It's got electricity, um, it's got water, it's got heating, there's various security systems, um, all sorts of things going on there. We'll take one of these. Um, pretty much every building will be, uh, or hopefully, will be equipped with some kind of air conditioning unit um, on the uh, top there. Now, this air conditioning unit could have a number of sensors on it. And this sensor is providing various different details. And on a typical one, we might be able to pull out maybe the temperature, the humidity, uh, the air quality, um, fan RPMs, maybe even when this unit was last serviced. Now, this data could all be fed into um, another system where the building manager could see what's going on with this air conditioning unit. Um, what temperatures is it at at the moment? When was the last time it's been inspected and so on? Now, when I started working with digital twins, one of the first questions I had were, are digital twins just a form of dashboard? Well, I think there's more to it than that. And let me tell you more. So with all of these type of device, devices, there's an enormous amount of data they could be giving us. And it's almost too much to do anything useful with. There could be data from literally hundreds or thousands of um, different sources in a typical large building. And one of the things that I think digital twins enable us to do is to go and take this data We'll go and process it, blend it, get all the good stuff out, and then we can start drawing insights, which we can actually do something with, rather than actually just dealing with a large blob of data that's no good for anyone. Krishna et al, um, and that et al just means there's a number of other people involved um, in this study. Um, I don't know um, how they decide who's the main one. I like to think they fight it out Highlander style. 
divides digital twins into three different types. He talks about digital models or simulations, and that's where data ex is exchanged manually. Maybe, um, so for example, maybe in COVID, we're getting some stats each day. Someone's taking those stats and then plugging them into a model. Um, and that's a manual process. Then we have digital shadow, digital shadows, which are one way data exchange. So the real world item is sending data into the platform. And finally, the most complex and mature digital twin where we have bi-directional data exchange. So perhaps in our aircon um, example, then um, we have uh, the ability to go and control this aircon unit from our digital twin. Now, typical digital twins will give you four main functions. They allow you to visualize the current state of the item or process. How hot's this room right now? What's the uh, air conditioning unit operating at? They'll probably trigger alerts under certain conditions. Is that room getting too hot? Is it cooking everyone inside? It will probably allow you to review historical data. Maybe how hot was this room last year, this time and year? And the more advanced digital twins will allow you to simulate different scenarios. And there's even examples of people creating digital twins prior to creating the actual physical product. This can save a lot of money and time in product development. Summarizing the benefits of digital twins, I think digital twins can help you make better decisions. They can assist with maintenance um, and safety. They can reduce the costs of several things. They can improve efficiencies in your organization. Maybe you're building, you shut off different lights and rooms if they're not in use. And of course, making prediction. And I'm gonna show you some examples of this very shortly. Now, our product, um, one of our products is focused on the uh, real estate market. And I wanna show you a few key aspects of this. Now. This isn't gonna play so well um, over um, a stream. So um, I encourage you, if you just look up um, willowinc.com, you'll find this on our homepage, but I do wanna show a couple of key aspects to it. So we create complete models of these buildings down to very fine levels of detail. And what this enables you to do, the building manager can look at these models, um, they can zoom into them um, down to the level of individual pipes um, and uh, units and see where the problems are. We've got another product associated um, with rail. And what we're seeing here um, is some details of um, some rail track there, allowing the people managing these systems to quickly find issues. But where did digital twins come from in the first place? Does anyone know what this is? It's a bit of a grainy image, um, but uh, some of you folks probably are familiar with um, what this image is um, already. Now, this image here is of Apollo 13. I think even if you're not that interested into um, space, a lot of people were probably aware um, of the uh, somewhat ill-fated Apollo 13 mission. So, um, and apparently this was due to a technician, originally due to a technician carrying um, a uh, oxygen cylinder and accidentally dropping it, which would lead to um, a number of events and eventually uh, one of the these oxygen cylinders exploding. Um, Apollo 13 had some problems and the problem with this is that obviously Apollo 13 is really, really far away um, from those down on Earth um, who can go and help Apollo 13. Now, one of the unique things about this was that prior to this mission, NASA had set up 15 different simulators um, of uh, Apollo 13 and the lunar module. Apparently, there was four computers alone um, for needed in order to simulate um, the uh, rocket system. Now, what was unique about these simulators, and I'm not gonna claim a simulator as a digital twin, um, they're definitely not, is that these simulators allowed um, the controllers to specify various parameters in order to set the state of the system. And they could set these things up very quickly. So by taking um, the real world state of what's actually happening um, to Apollo 13, um, some of those details they'd uh, have on hand and some of them they might need to query from the crew, they were able to create a very accurate replica of what Apollo 13 was, allowing them to test various scenarios in order to help get these astronauts back to uh, work, uh, back to uh, Earth. Um, and um, I think this is probably one of the first, first examples of um, what could be considered a digital twin. Going forwards, um, we have this guy, um, David Galentria. I'm probably pronouncing your name, your name wrong. Um, he did a lot of work in parallel computing and the uh, Linda language. But what we're interested in um, is a book he wrote called Mirror Worlds. Now, bear in mind, this is in 1991. And I'm going to read the second paragraph of this. And he says, this mirror world you are looking at is fed by a steady rush of new data pouring in through cables. It is infiltrated by your own software creatures doing your business. And David kind of puts forward this idea of digital twins um, that we have today. 
Uh, we have John Vickers, who is widely credited for being the first person to coin the term digital twin. And depending on the source you look at, this is even 2002 or um, 2010. Um, but what we really find is it's this guy, Michael Greaves, who goes and popularizes um, this concept. Now, Michael's interested in how he can apply digital twins to the manufacturing process. And he um, proposes that we could create this digital construct um, that's linked uh, to the physical item um, and that this could create a lot of efficiencies, allowing us to test um, various proposals. But of course, digital twins wouldn't have been popular um, without several other advances. So we see all sorts of things from um, the proliferation of cheap IoT devices, because if it's expensive to implement these kind of things, then you know that's a bit discouraging to actually do it. And of course, these things are dependent on various things, such as processing improvements, um, comms advances, uh, even batteries, because if your um, devices are running out all the time, um, then that's no good to anyone. And then we see a heap of other things, protocol standards, uh, cloud hosting systems to go and process this data, um, down to um, 3D modeling, VR, um, augmented reality, and so on. I think you'd even argue recently um, that uh, our least favorite coronavirus is probably also accelerating some of the work here. Um, a great example, um, again, I'd encourage you to go to um, the link here. I'm going to um, uh, pick out a couple of key points, is a digital twin that's been created um, of uh, the state of uh, Victoria. Now, this digital twin kind of focuses on um, a couple of aspects. It focuses on planning aspects, so they believe this is going to assist um, get various building planning applications through a lot quicker. Um, they look at integrating uh, energy um, sources uh, into it, and also for disaster planning. So you'll see how they go and use um, flooding data uh, in order to look at how you know, uh, what might happen um, to this location had a, a flood occur. So I'm just going to play that and pick out a couple of points. So it's pretty cool, um, some of the stuff that's going on um, with this. Uh, Singapore, there's been a digital si Singapore since 2014. Um, if you go look it up, there's an immense amount of details um, in that model. They use it for urban planning um, and also, again, for um, disaster um, planning and modeling. Some recent examples. Um, these digital twins have been employed uh, in order to optimize um, vaccination centers, in order to get people through as quick as possible, but also in a safe, socially distant um, way. We see it used across nuclear power, solar car energy, and even in livestock farming. Now, this livestock farming um, is particularly interesting in that the um, people who um, put this paper together, they propose using facial recognition um, technology on cows in order to understand how um, the cows go in at the moment and uh, contribute to that animal's welfare. So it's quite a creative um, use of uh, some of these things. And you can see there's a lot of different um, examples here. Some of these things are quite abstract in nature. They're, they're more concepts rather than um, uh, a physical device that we're mirroring here. So um, hopefully um, I've convinced you that maybe this is uh, an interesting um, area and it's got uh, a widespread use of um, examples of where you could deploy this. And what I want to talk about next um, is how you can go about creating uh, digital twins yourself and using the Azure Digital Twins platform. Now, I also think it's fairly unique service um, to Azure, and I haven't come across anything um, similar that's going to offer some of the stuff I'll show you in a minute. Before we get into that, however, Azure offers another service called uh, IoT Hub. Now, a lot of you will be familiar with this service. You can certainly use this with uh, Azure Digital Twins if you want to, but don't feel that you have to. These are independent things. Um, and somewhat confusingly, IoT Hub has this concept of device twins. This is a completely different concept to digital twins. And uh, in IoT Hub world, uh, device twins, it's all to do with config and firmware management. So let's imagine we're setting out 
to create a new digital uh, twin project. Maybe um, we want to do something similar to our building example that we talked about earlier on. We've got lots of devices in our um, building. We're getting measurements from various different places. Um, what do we need? Well, at the start of it, you can think of, well, we're going to need to, a few things in order to create a digital twin of this building. One of the first things we're going to need is the ability to go and actually define a digital twin. Um, we're going to need to define what is this air conditioning unit? What are its capabilities? What measurements um, can we get from it? Also, how are these things related? So maybe there's some kind of plumbing system. It's going to be pretty useful if you know which pipe's connected to which pipe and this feeds into this component here um, and so on. We're going to need a way to go and update the twin state because if it's not reasonably up to date, well, it's not that useful. Um, we we'll probably want the ability to be able to perform uh, different uh, queries across the digital twins that we've set up. So, for example, we might want to know which uh, air conditioning units are operating above 30 degrees um, because that's really quite hot and we should go and check that out. We're going to want a way of securely integrating with these things and ideally, Maybe you've got investment in the Azure platform already. It'd be great if it's integrated with a lot of existing Azure services. So that brings us to Azure Digital Twin. Now, Microsoft Marketing say that Azure Digital Twin is an Internet of Things platform that enables you to create a digital representation of real world things, places, businesses, and processes and people. But what does that actually mean? Well, I think we can divide the Azure Digital Twin platform into five, maybe five and a half main things. Now, underlying all of this is a graph database. And this is going to store your twin models, um, the state of your twins, how they're related. But we're going to need a way of defining them. And this is where Twin Schema or DTDL comes in. Now, Twin Schema or DTL, DTDL is the equivalent of creating some empty tables in the relational database world. Um, we've created our tables, we've said how they're related, we've specified our fields and their types, but we haven't actually created um, any definitions of twins. So we're gonna need a way of doing that. And that's where the twin defin definitions come in. Now, if you want to work with any of this, the Azure Digital Twin Platform, and I'm gonna call that ADT now, because um, that's kind of a mouthful, Azure Digital Twin Platform, um, is, we've got this REST API that we can work with. So this means whatever language or platform you work with, you can work with this platform. Um, but of course, it's not that convenient to go and hand code all of these things um, ourselves. So Microsoft also offer um, a number of SDKs. So we have .NET, Go, Python, Java, JavaScript, and you can also perform some of the operations I'll show you through the Azure CLI. Let's go and actually go and create some digital twins. But Prior to that, let's have an obligatory warning the demo code. Now, what I'm going to show you today is not a good way to actually model um, your twins, and I'll tell you why shortly. It's done because it's simple. Now, in our scenario, let's take a typical digital twin. We've got a house, um, and this house is uh, using electricity. And we want to know which houses um, are using um, more electricity. So how are we going to do this? Well, the first thing we're going to need to do is actually come up with a way to go and describe our digital twins. So let's come out of the slides and look at how we uh, go and do this. Now, the way that you actually come up um, and define your digital twins um, is using a uh, language called DTDL, um, which is uh, formatted as JSON. Now, what I've got here is my definition of my house object here. And you can see the type of this is something called a interface. Now, interface is equivalent to a class um, in programming ter terminology. And it has a number of different uh, types of um, fields within it. So there's only a few of them that you're going to need to be aware of. We're going to look at properties. And these are data fields that hold the state of our entity. These are equivalent to classes fields. And there's relationships which link these classes or interfaces together. In our example, um, perhaps we go to a deeper level of detail and our house has rooms. And a relationship is going to allow you to define the rooms within the house. There's also two other types of property, which I'm not going to cover today, um, called telemetry and component. Just be aware they're there. Now, our example wouldn't be too interesting on its own. So we're going to build that up. So we're going to say we've got a house that's got an address property, and this house also has a consumption of electricity, which we'll define as electricity kilowatt hours. Um, I've no idea if that's a realistic measurement. I'm not an electrician. And we're also going to create another interface called street, and street has houses. So 
a street could have um, zero or more houses, if you will. And finally, we're going to have a district, and a district has streets. Let's look at how to go and actually define this um, in our DTTL there. So the topmost thing um, that we need to care about is this ID property here, and this specifies um, the name of um, the uh, class there, and this needs to be unique. This has a couple of parts to it. You can see this NDC bit here. You can think of this as kind of a namespace. It needs to pre pre be prefixed with DTMI prior to that. We then have the name of the object, um, in this case, house. That's kind of equivalent to class name. And then we have this number here. Now, this is the version of the model that we're operating here. So in ADT, I can have multiple versions of the same thing um, at the same time if I want to. And then house has um, a couple of properties. Uh, we have our street. Um, we have um, this new property here called relationship. And we've basically declared the name of the relationship here, and we've also told it um, what type of objects it's pointing at. The other item I just want to call out is this display name here. Now, this is used by some of the tools I'm going to show you in a second um, and can make it a bit easier um, to actually go and see what's going on um, with uh, your ADT models there. Now, this is a very simple set of models. And once you start getting into a few more, it's quite easy to go and make a typo um, or mistake. So Microsoft provide a tool called um, the DTDL validator, um, which will actually go and take all your files and go and tell you whether something's um, wrong with them. So I've created a, a bat file, which just goes and kicks this off, um, passing in um, the directory. And I'm going to run that there. Um, and you can see I get this uh, output here that it's gone and validated my free files, um, and everything's looking good. If I was to make a mistake, say uh, we'll change the type there to interface two, um, that's probably going to be enough um, to pick up, hey, look, something's not quite right there. Um, there's a, a bit of an issue there. You might want to take a look at it. So I'd highly recommend you use this tool, um, as it's going to save you uh, a lot of time later. Uh, let's put that back, because that's going to cause us uh, trouble later. So um, we'll run the validator again. Uh, I have, all our files look good. Um, OK, we're ready to go and load these into uh, ADT. So I'm going to bring up um, the browser here. And what this is here is this is the Azure Digital Twins Explorer. And you can get to um, this. There's a little button in Azure. You can click it, um, open Digital Twins Explorer, and you'll get this screen here. And you can see at the moment there's nothing in our Digital Twins graph. Now, the first thing we need to do is um, go and upload our models. So I'm going to click that Upload uh, button there. And you can see um, here's our three files that I was showing you earlier. And we're going to go and load those uh, in. So I'm going to go and select all of those. We'll go and open those. Uh, it will chug away a bit. And all being well, um, over on the left there, we'll then have um, these uh, items uh, loaded in. And we can see we've got our district, our house, um, and so on. Um, I have the ability to go and create um, a twin from the UI here. Um, I can go and click this uh, bottle here, this button here, and I can go and look at the information on the model. Um, and I can have a quick check what's going on. Now, let's say I wanted to make um, a change to some of this stuff. We talked about this version number. Um, I could declare um, version number two of the house there. Um, and I could go back um, and then I could go and upload that if I wanted to. Um, and you'll see that we now have um, two house, and we can see that's the second version there. Um, that's going to get a bit confusing, um, so let's go and get rid of that one. Now, at this point, we've uploaded um, our structure here. We've kind of got empty tables in database terminology, um, and we actually need to go and create our twin graph. Now, like everything um, in ADT, there's a number of different ways um, to go and do this. The way um, I'm going to go and do this uh, is I'm going to go and load, upload um, an Excel file. Now, this Excel file needs to be in quite a specific uh, format, um, and Microsoft specify the column order and structure of this. So what we have here, we have our model ID that corresponds to our class name. Um, we have the ID property. Now, this is the unique name um, of that particular digital twin instance there. So you can see we've created several different houses there. So we've got house 0 um, to 7. Uh, we've got three streets, two districts, and so on. Now, you can also set um, some initial data to define the state of um, these digital twin items here. So I'm just going to give it a simple um, numeric address there. Um, and we'll initialize electricity kilowatts um, to 0. We'll set some street names um, and district names. Let's get rid of that. Now, once you're ready with that, the way to um, actually upload it, I go and click this um, 
upload arrow there. Um, I'm going to go and upload this twin setup there. And then we get this preview here um, of what it's actually um, going to create. Now, this isn't created um, until I go and click this save button there to start import. So I'm going to go um, and click that start import there. Um, and all being well, that's going to load in uh, everything into our digital twin graph there. And we can see we've had 13 um, twins imported and 11 um, relationship uh, imported there. Now, you might be thinking um, that's going to get kind of unmanageable um, once you've got a, a very large number of items. Um, and I think you're right. And I'd actually, uh, unless you're doing some initial experimentation, um, I would discourage this way of doing things. The other disadvantage of uploading stuff through the UI um, is it really doesn't give you very many error messages. So whilst I was putting this, um, when I was putting this example together, um, you literally get something like uh, digital twin could not be created, which isn't really very helpful in order to understand what it is that you've done wrong. So. Um, ADT offers several different ways to um, actually update your and create your digital twins. You can use the Azure CLI. Um, you could use one of the SDKs. Um, my preference, I'd encourage you to use one of the SDKs. And you're also likely to run into a scenario where you'll start to get dependency issues. So you need to create certain things before, say, um, you need to create the house type before creating the relationship of uh, uh, a street um, has houses. So that will give you that fine grained control you need um, in order to uh, set up and go and create your twin graph. So that's my recommendation there, but it's great for playing around for small examples um, like this. So we've imported our graph here um, and you can see we've got um, this structure here. Uh, that's um, the structure that I showed you on the slide earlier. We have a district and a district is made up of streets um, and streets uh, have houses in them. Now, if I go over to um, the twin graph, I'm not seeing anything here at the moment. Um, and that's because I haven't run this query uh, bit here. Now, I'm going to go back um, to uh, the query stuff uh, in just a minute. There's something a bit more I want to talk to um, you about with uh, models. So we've defined our models and relationships, um, and we've now got everything set up. Now, you might be asking, it could take a bit of time to go and create some of these models. Um, and especially once you get into a more complex domain, like imagine you're trying to model uh, a smart city or a, a whole building. That's going to take a lot of time to go and create these models um, and also go and get these the modeling around it right. It's not easy. This is a, a fairly early days um, for how to how best to model these things. There's not a lot of, um, there are best practices, but we're still working out you know, what some of those things are. So one thing you can do um, is you can look at ontologies. Now, ontologies are a collection of models um, for a specific domain. And there's already some examples of many different domains. So there's an example for a power grid system already. There's an example for um, smart cities, um, all sorts of things. So you could go and take one of these models, and that's going to save you a lot of time um, from going and creating one of these things yourself. Um, and also potentially a, a lot of error, as um, hopefully someone's uh, worked out some of the issues and the approach they've proposed um, is going to work well for a lot of people. Now, Microsoft put forward there's three main strategies for using these models. You could potentially adopt them entirely. Maybe you convert them um, and you just take the bits you want. Maybe you go and extend them. But all in all, this can spend save you a lot of development time when you're working with these type of things. So I'd highly encourage you, if you're coming to a new digital chain product, um, go have a look what's out there first, because there's probably something that you can at least base um, your work on before you set about creating your own models. Um, we've actually um, got our, um, our own building based one, um, which is an extension of um, some of the smart cities work there. You can go and find that on the public um, GitHub there, and you'll see just how detailed and how complex some of these models can get. Um, here's a, a visualization of the, the smart cities one um, on the uh, Azure repo uh, there. So probably the next question is, OK, so we've got everything set up there. We've defined our instances of digital twins. Um, how do we go about actually updating these things? Well, again, you've got several different uh, options in. You, of course, have um, the uh, various REST APIs and SDKs, um, some integration with Logic Apps at the moment. Um, and then we have IoT Hub as well. Now, I put an asterisk next to IoT Hub, um, as you do have to do a bit of work yourself. Um, you can trigger an event which creates a function, which I'm going to show you an example of in a minute. Um, 
but you do still need to do a bit of programming um, yourself. So it's it's not completely plug and play. Um, in terms of getting data out of it, um, of course, you could create some polling mechanism via the REST APIs, SDKs, but you also have a number of different other options. Um, there's out-of-the-box integration with Event Hub, Grid, Service Bus. Uh, you can make use of um, events for um, various things occurring from tweaking, creative relationships changing, um, telemetry being received, and so on. Um, let me show you a simple example of how to integrate this from um, .NET. So um, I've got an uh, application here. Um, and the first thing you need to do is go and specify um, your digital twin endpoint. Now, I'm going to use the default Azure credentials to connect to this uh, in my example because uh, it's a little bit uh, simpler. Now, these are created when you go and log into Azure through something like the Azure CLI, um, and they save a, a bit of work, and also means I don't have to um, hide credentials while um, showing this to various people. So I've already logged into um, my subscription via the Azure CLI, um, so that's how that's authenticating to this. Now, of course, in the real world, um, you're, you're not going to do that. And you have two main uh, options with ADT for authentication. Um, if you've got something already running on the uh, Azure platform, you're going to want to use managed identities. And here, you basically um, find out, um, you tell Azure Digital Twins, hey, I want this um, Azure function that I've just created to um, be part of this role in this ADT graph and have these permissions. Uh, it sounds complicated. It's it's actually not. There's a couple of commands you have to run. I'll show you in a minute. Um, but that enables uh, ADT to authenticate that your service should have access and authorize the actions that they're taking on it. Now, if you've got something external, um, it supports um, the standard OAuth um, protocols. You'll need to set up an application in Azure AD and so on. Again, there's detailed instructions on how to go about setting this up. So uh, back to our simple example, um, I've got a simple uh, .NET Core um, CLI program here. Um, and we want to go and update um, the electricity usage of House Zero. How do we do that? Well, we go and create a new JSON patch document with this line here. Um, I'm going to set the electricity usage to um, 22 um, kilowatt hours, um, however much that is. And then I'm going to apply this um, to this property here, electricity kilowatts hours. And we, um, I don't know if you remember, we declared that um, property at the uh, top level here. So we can see the name of that. So that's mapping through to that property there. Um, and then we're just going to write out that it's successfully updated um, this value. So um, all being well, uh, we'll go and run that up. Um, and uh, hopefully that will connect. Um, and then when we go and look at the graph again, we should see that 22 um, in the uh, value. All done, so that all looks good. Um, we'll go over to Azure Digital Twins Explorer there. Um, now I'm not seeing any digital twins right now. Um, we'll go and um, run the query there, um, and let's go and get our twin graph. Um, there's all the twin items that we've created there. Um, I could go down and many go and select house zero there. Um, and we can see by selecting this, I can see the properties over on the right here. Um, and I can see that the electricity kilowatt hours has been updated to 22 here. Now, it's exactly the same approach um, if you want to go and update this uh, through uh, an Azure function, um, for example. So going to uh, a more um, complicated uh, example, and uh, this is based on um, some of the example code in the documentation, but I've cut it down a little bit to make it a little bit more simpler. What we're going to do is we're going to have a .NET uh, application, and that's just going to send in some random values to Azure IoT Hub here. Now, when these values um, appear on the Hub, um, we're going to raise an event, which is going to go and trigger. Um, we've got this Azure function um, that's listening out for. And this Azure function is going to use some very similar code to what I've just shown you um, in order to go and connect to Azure Digital Twins Graph and update the state of um, this item there. And of course, we could then write a .NET application, website, API, whatever it is, um, to go and read out um, the state of um, this graph. Now, there is one more step we need to do, and that's that security step I mentioned um, earlier. So we're going to use managed identities, and we're going to say um, we want this Azure function um, to have an identity, and we then want to put um, the uh, identity and associate that with um, the Azure Digital Twins data owner role there. That's going to give it um, quite a high level of um, permissions there. So you probably want to get a bit more granular. But it's going to enable us to um, go and update that uh, twin graph um, there. So um, just to show you um, uh, that working there, um, I have uh, my simple um, program. 
which is just a console application. And this application here is just going to send in some random values um, into uh, the IoT hub. It's triggering that event, um, which is triggering the function. Function is picking up. And then it's going updating the state of our house. So all being well, we should see this value change. Um, I'll click off it. We'll go and click on it again. Um, and um, let me close that one down. And we should hopefully see that value updating over time. So we can see it's changing there as these events um, are received and update um, the state of the twin there. Now, one thing I should mention um, is it will only hold the state of the um, the last value updated. So you're going to need to, if you want every single value of the history, you're going to need to implement that yourself. And it does kind of make sense when you think about the immense amount of data um, that could be sent and um, stored uh, on this item. That you're probably going to want some um, control and to choose how you go and store and what you do with uh, this data. So at this point, um, we've got everything flowing into uh, our graph, but how do we go about actually getting um, data out of it? Well, again, we have a number of different uh, options. Azure Digital Twin supports a SQL-like query language. Now, it's not SQL, so there's some things you can, well, there's many things you can do in SQL, which you can't do in um, ADT world, but some of the basic sort of SQL-like statements, um, it supports. Um, there's also some new keywords and um, digital twin specific functions that have been introduced to make your life easier. Um, and again, you can use this uh, through the REST API, SDKs, um, and uh, so on. So what do the queries look like? Well, you've got your standard SQL ones where we might do select star from digital twins um, and um, where we might specify a uh, where clause. Um, I can uh, go out of this uh, and we could go select star from digital twins. Uh, where address one uh, equals uh, 10, and then hit the run query. Um, I can also click this overlay results one, which is kind of an interesting thing. So that kind of filters out the other stuff and shows you where the results of um, your query uh, sit there. So that might be quite nice for some sort of visualization there. Um, so you can see it's quite easy to go and work, uh, work with uh, this graph there. Going back, um, there's a couple of um, more uh, complex uh, things or um, functions that ADT enables you can do. You can check where, where specific properties are defined, whether there are specific types, um, whether there are models. And of course, because this is a graph database, we can perform some more complicated things. So for example, if we wanted to only select houses within an individual street, um, we have the ability to do that. Now, it's probably fair to say that it's not um, as feature rich as some graph databases, um, at least right now. So, um, but um, it certainly enables you to walk some of uh, these these relationships um, that you've set up and defined here. So, in our scenario here, if uh, we might want to select, um, see what's going on in a particular district, but only see the houses within that. Now, you could certainly do that for a relational database, but I think it's maybe a bit more intuitive and it also enables you to do some types of queries that would be quite difficult um, in standard SQL once you start um, having nodes linked together and wanting to walk those nodes um, and their path. In terms of running costs, it's very, very cheap. Um, Obviously, this starts to add up if you add on 100,000 um, devices sending in data multiple times a second. So you'll want to do some cost modeling um, around this. But right now, in terms of um, AUD, I think um, this entire demo, which I've been playing with for a number of weeks, um, I've spent uh, $1.20 or something, and I've, I've sent it a heap of data. So um, it's not one of those services you need to be a bit scared of to play with. Um, it's very, very cheap um, to, uh, to run and uh, play with. Now, you might be wondering, um, when should you go and use um, ADT? Well, I think it's probably best um, used when you've got a large number of digital twins to manage. If you've only got 10 items, it's probably more complexity than um, you care about. Maybe you've got very complex relationships through between these items. Um, perhaps you'd benefit from flexible schema. It's a bit of a pain when you've got that standard relational database to have to you know, go and manage various fields, change the schema, and so on. And um, a willow. The ability to change this schema, add to it, um, it's very expressive. That certainly saved us uh, a lot of development time. Um, and it's been very useful. Perhaps you want to make use of one of these existing ontologies that are out there. Again, this I really can't stress this enough. This can save you a lot of pain and development time. So if you are working on these projects, please take a look at um, what these existing ontologies uh, can give you. As it's a graph database, we can perform uh, more complex graph queries. Um, and so that could be pretty useful. I 
working on a project at the moment where we have a, pro a process for modeling and um, it's enabled us to jump between the different nodes in the process, um, move horizontally, move laterally into how these systems are grouped. Um, and this would have been quite difficult, some of these types of queries with your standard uh, databases. And of course, um, if you've got a, an existing investment in the Azure platform, it integrates quite nicely um, with many Azure services. Now, in terms of um, challenges, there's a few things I just want to raise. I think a lot of people come to IoT um, and Digital Twin and they look at it and they think, hey, this is just taking in a load of data, um, processing it and doing something with it. Um, and uh, I must admit, I did too. And um, it, it's a very naive approach. Um, and you will very quickly find out that's not the case. So when you're working with these type of projects, you have to deal with all sorts of things like the in inherent unreliability of these devices uh, and sensors. You'll find data won't be transmitted at the times you're expecting. Um, the batteries will run out. People will vandalize your devices. Um, there's all sorts of different problems um, to, to work with here. Um, in terms of digital twins, depending on your use case, uh, it's quite important that your digital twin is an accurate reflection of what's happening in the, the real physical world. And of course, there's a delay from sending this data, processing it, um, and reflecting it in your digital representation. And that's going to be something that you're going to have to deal with. So you're going to need to be able to digest that um, data very quickly. It can be hard and expensive to add um, these digital version to an existing system or uh, implementation. Um, and it's probably worth noting that some of the things that these are employed in as well will very likely outlive um, the software that you write. And that's kind of unusual. So hopefully we'd expect a building to last maybe at least 50, 100, probably more years. Um, I can't think of many software um, examples where that's for, that's been around that length of time. The modeling of these things is difficult and it's evolving. Um, I think you can mitigate that to some extent by working with on ontologies. Interoperability and standards still developing, especially in the IoT world. Um, there's a, a number of pain points uh, there. Um, and of course, if you're creating a digital representation of something, you also need to look at the privacy and confidentiality, confidentiality uh, aspects of that, as it could reveal quite a lot of information um, about people and systems. Um, wrapping things up, digital twins are a virtual representation of a real world object or process. They bring together data in an easy to understand and actionable form. I think they offer several advantages around making better decisions, analysis, monitoring diagnostics, diagnostics efficiency, and ultimately the ability to even make um, predictions. The Azure Digital Twins platform consists of a number of components, a graph database, a language for describing the twins, APIs and SDKs. Um, and if you take one thing away from this, whilst you could implement all this stuff yourself, um, I really think if uh, ADT can save you um, a lot of time um, and pain from doing this. Um, finally, quick plug for my company. If this world of digital twins uh, sounds interesting to you, uh, we're looking for a number of folks. Please reach out to me if you've got any questions. Tell them I sent you. Um, and in terms of further reading, there's a great summary on an academic article here if you want to get more into the history of it. If you're wondering how our platform works and want to take a deep dive into the architecture of that, um, please consult uh, this link here. And we've got a, a great session um, with Microsoft and some of my Willow colleagues will explain in detail um, some of the projects and how we've implemented this. Thank Fantastic. you very much. That's awesome, Alex. Phew. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a question, and it's asked by this amazing guy called Lars Clint. Um, <laughs> there was actually oh, no that guy. <laughs> there, there was so much information in this session, and I have like one main question. I think is sort of like, holy moly, where do I even start? Like, is there a simple example where you can sort of just go? Is, yeah, is there, like, a setup thing you can, you can play if with? If this looks of interest to you and you want to have a play with it, maybe you've got um, a Raspberry Pi and some IoT devices in your mm, house exactly. so you want to play with it. Um, what I do first of all is I'd head over to um, the Microsoft Azure Digital Twin site. Um, there's extensive documentation. It's well written. Um, there's multiple examples. Um, some of the examples I've showed you there are based on some of the Microsoft yep. stuff. It's really very easy to get started with um, and play with this so stuff. You, so you can use a Raspberry Pi? Oh, As absolutely. Like yeah, if, cool. you, if you want to integrate anything um, into this, you'll, you'll have to write code to uh, either send it uh, into um, ADT world or maybe you send it um, via Azure IoT Hub. Um, sure. And then you'll have to write the, the bits that link those two things together. But sure, right. um, you could that's update your after code. code. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool. Uh, that's wow. That was a lot of information. Um, I just I like the graphical part of it. It's just 
appeals to me. You can, you, it's not all code, right? You can see what's actually going on. So that's it does, really cool. and it does this cool animation where it goes and arranges your, yeah, your yeah, yeah. graph as well. And especially exactly. on a more complex setup, um, like my example is fairly trivial. I think there's what 10, sure. 10 or so items there. Once you get yeah. into hundreds or thousands, you, you get kind of this spectacular graph, and it, it's quite easy to sort of navigate between these things. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for being part of NDC Melbourne. Thank you. Um, that was uh, very informative. And if you want to know more about this, reach out to Alex directly or put it in the YouTube chat or wherever else you can find him. So uh, uh, in a minute, there are dev news. But first, uh, a word from our sponsors. I love running this company. I love running it because uh, of the people I deal with. There's such a great team of people. From a career perspective, it's the best move I ever did. Being a great consultant, which we are, this is W, is half-half between technical skills and communication. It's given me the opportunity to work with lots of different types of technology and explore some stuff that I maybe only dabbled in at university or before. SSW is a company that makes enterprise software solutions, uh, and that's what we do. We build software for clients uh, on demand. We build bespoke solutions using the latest technology and the latest best practices. I've been involved in the development of some mining software, been involved in the development of software for a legal firm, and everything in between there. Even in just under two years, I've been working across so many different projects. It's just a really great place to come into, and I always look forward to coming to work. As an investor or wealth professional, you want a wealth provider that is flexible, smart, and tech savvy. A provider with fresh eyes who sees opportunity to present wealth solutions differently. A partner who can administer wealth your way. NetWealth was created with an entrepreneurial spirit to do all of this. We exist to help you see your wealth differently, to realise your potential, to inspire you to discover a brighter future. At our core, we are a technology company, a super fund, an investment specialist, an administration business. But in our daily lives, we are you. Mums and dads, call centre operators, sales and marketing professionals, analysts, netball teams, friends, technologists, developers, and most importantly, family. To investors, we provide award-winning superannuation and investment accounts, products, and services. To wealth professionals, we provide a market-leading platform to better their business. Underlying all of this is cutting-edge technology anywhere, everywhere. With us, you can see your wealth differently and more positively. We identify new opportunities with our fresh perspective and natural curiosity. We provide choice through our flexible approach to business and product design. We prioritise your security to give you peace of mind. We are involved in your world. In schools, we support financial literacy, helping our younger Australians also see wealth differently. We are a team of talented people working hard to make life better for more Australians. We are creators. We are curious, always looking to spot the change that matters. We are authentic and genuine. We believe that strength is in teamwork. We are agile and nimble, upbeat, energetic and optimistic about the future. With us, you can see wealth differently because we are different. In our approach, our attitude, our commitment and our spirit. Partner with us to see what's possible. And now it's time for some developer news. I have my, my news hosting jacket on and I'm ready to tell you about some awesome new things in the world of technology. So first up, Angular 12 was released last month. It's even smaller, faster, and easier to use. It enables the transition of the Angular ecosystem to the Ivy compiler. So the Ivy compiler they released in version nine and it's the next generation compilation and rendering pipeline. They've deprecated support for their, their old view engine, so make sure you get updated and get all the benefits from Ivy. Also with version 12, they have stylish improvements such as the support for the Nullish coalescing operator, and it will allow you to write cleaner code. 
They're continuing to work on the developer experience and adding all kinds of new learning resources, guides, and videos to help you get up and running. In addition to all of that with version 12, they also have released a new developer tool called Angular Dev Tools, which is a Chrome Dev Tool extension, which came out last month and will give you an improved Angular debug experience. So with Angular Dev Tools, you'll be able to inspect the structure and profile of your application's performance, visualize the component structure from within your the developer console, and help, it'll help you to understand the, the whole change detection execution. So you can install it now. It's available in the uh, extension place uh, for develop in Chrome. And you can visualize the structure of your apps, explore and expect edit components using a magnifying glass. And that has a really nice performance profile bar chart. So check out what's new in the world of Angular. Over to you, William, for more news. Wonderful. I just pulled off a Lars moment. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. I am William. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, the world of .NET, especially .NET 6. And uh, so I'm going to share my screen. So uh, about just over two and a bit weeks ago, Richard Lander released a, a post here about .NET 6 Preview 6. Uh, so we have you know all these previews coming out most of this year. And this is uh, this second to last preview. So uh, after this, we'll be heading in towards the RCs or the release candidates. So if you have any um, wishes to influence what goes into .NET 6 uh, around about November with .NET Conf, uh, you know, now's your chance. Because once it goes into RCs, all the, the features are pretty much locked in. Now, what's exciting is that um, uh, for preview 6, you know, it's mainly focused around uh, ASP.NET Core EF Core and .NET MAUI. And I think uh, somewhere they say there's actually a relatively small update uh, in preview six. But uh, if you look at the content, there's quite a bit there. Um, what would be very exciting is the, the x64 emulation update. So especially if you're on a, a Mac or ARM64. Um, now, it's not all quite ready yet. Uh, so you'll be able to run .NET uh, everything.NET 6 on your Mac, your M1, if you've got one of those new nice and fast M1s. Um, so hopefully with you know, one of the next updates, or we'll definitely by the, the final .NET 6, everything should be nice and smooth working for you. Uh, I would like to then just jump straight into the updates for ASP.NET Core. Um, so good friend Daniel Roth here, um, big boss at the uh, ASP.NET team. Uh, he highlighted some stuff that is coming in for Blazor and just general ASP.NET updates. And we can see here something very interesting, Angular 12, which uh, Melissa covered for us a moment ago. But starting at the top here, we can see that uh, we have this thing called ahead of time compilation. So for a lot of the Blazor develops, developers especially, this is going to be super, super nice. It's something that's been asked for, for a long time because uh, the DLLs that our Blazor WebAssembly applications will be downloading to the client will sort of be pre-compiled and you know, be executing a whole lot faster instead of being interpreted. So we're going to pretty much be running directly on WebAssembly without having to have the, the JavaScript uh, interpretation in the middle there. So um, I'm very excited to try this out. Uh, reading some of the GitHub issues, the sort of numbers people are posting there for performance increases, you know, 70 to 80 times faster execution. That is truly amazing. So I'm um, keen to actually try this out. So they've given us a couple of instructions here to install the uh, workloads for Blazor WebAssembly AOT, or ahead of time compilation. And uh, so the only downside of this is you may actually end up with a slightly larger bundle size at the end. Uh, in some cases, but uh, I think you know for the speed improvement, this will be quite quite nice. Um, they give us some instructions of how to update our existing projects. It's fairly straightforward. We just normally have to rename the uh, package references. You just bump up the version number to the current preview, which is preview six. And uh, you know, there's a few small breaking changes, but uh, you can check out this link here from uh, the dev blocks devblogs.microsoft.com and uh, sort of check those out if you've already built something with .NET 6. 
Um, they have some improvements in terms of accessibility. Uh, what I'm most excited about here is the focus on Navigate, so that when I route to a new page, um, I can actually set the focus to an element using a, the standard CSS selectors. So they keep adding all these small extra components over time into Blazor, and you know, that just like the file upload component, the input focus component, those are all getting Blazor WebAssembly in you know, a much better state. So uh, jump onto the GitHub issues, you know, add your requests in there, and you know, hopefully uh, uh, very soon, yeah, we can have a lot of those things in Blazor, and uh, I'm sure you can tell by now I'm a big Blazor fan. <laughs> Here's something else that's very exciting for Blazor is when you've um, scaffolded up a, a component or a form, for instance, you know the model model you supply must require a value. You don't want to have a null string or an empty string in there. So here's a nice new attribute called editor required. So you cannot, so from this example screenshot here, you must assign a value to this field and it'll get detected for you at build time. You can actually see here on the screenshot as well, the tooltip is from within Visual Studio uh, before you've even built your application. So that's doing it for you at, at even coding time. So it's really cool. Moving on, there's uh, a very awesome performance improvement here for when you want to try and pass um, data between the .NET and JavaScript interrupt. So instead of the, the data being encoded in Base64, which essentially nearly doubles everything you try and send, they've optimized away all that pain and that the decoding and encoding of Base64 directly into a, an unsigned integer array for you. So you know, that definitely will make a massive improvement on the passing data between your .NET uh, code and the JavaScript code. Because it's all on the browser, right? So C Sharp and JavaScript living together in a browser. Love it. <laughs> um, like Melissa mentioned earlier, we've got Angular 12. And the ASP.NET Core templates have been updated to use Angular 12. It's a one liner here, but this is a very big thing. There's a lot of news for Angular 12 as well. Um, so definitely go and check that out if you're a front-end developer. And speaking of front-end developers and JavaScript, the minimal APIs and uh, top-level statements that we have available in .NET 6 and even was at C Sharp 9, this is sort of heading towards the very minimalist, minimalistic applications you can write with uh, Node.js and Node Express, for instance. Um, so now you know they're also then adding Swagger support for all of this as well. So we can actually write some really awesome little microservices or nano services, even if you want to call it that. And we can then have it fully featured with uh, AM uh, Swagger, or we're using the swashbuckle extensions here to add that in. The very basic uh, code we need there to set it up. And when the application runs, they've got a nice little GIF animation here for us, or GIF, wherever you come from. So they navigate to the route here, they just. <laughs> Uh, go to the Swagger endpoint, and here's the Swagger UI, automatically built from the uh, exposed endpoints, and fantastic. So they even got a slightly more fleshed out example here uh, for a few things that's coming, even for Net6 Preview 7, which should be just around the corner. Now, again, with the, multi, uh, the, the minimal APIs, when we have um, the map.get, or dot map .get, when we're adding our routes to our application, we can even inject services directly into the, um, the, the delegate here to you know, implement that uh, route or responding to that request. So this is going to compress our application. It's really, really small. It's very nice, very easy to see all the logic that's going on there. And uh, I think this is all going to be very, very fun to use. What else have we got? Um, there's a whole bunch of security features around Signal R, WebSockets for compression and testing. It's very exciting. and Delayed client certif certificate negotiation. Should look into this one a bit more, but it seems interesting and a bit low level. I could do some uh, buffering and draining the async. Okay. So, definitely something for the security people to check out. And what we also have that is very exciting for .NET 6, it's not directly in this preview, but it's for one of the earlier previews, I think preview three, actually, straight from preview one. So we had um, hot reload. So directly in the uh, um, Visual Studio, once you see here, you've got some code. You've got the application running on the side as well. You've already pressed F5. You can go and make a code change, 
you can click the hot reload button and that would immediately recompile that part of your application and you can actually uh, see your code in action, which is really, really cool. Uh, I want to point this out because for, again, for the Blazor developers, uh, Blazor WebAssembly, this is going to get better and better as well. So currently it doesn't support the Razor files being hot reloaded, but hopefully soon that will be the case. And uh, one more very exciting thing that happened today outside of the Microsoft and .NET world, but for Melbourne, very exciting, is that GCP has now opened up a region right here in Melbourne. And that happened earlier today. It was very exciting for Google to uh, announce this. So please check out this page here. If you can just Google uh, Google in Melbourne, <laughs> then you'll get this page. Um, so yeah, this definitely is, if you have customers in Melbourne on GCP, this will be great for your uh, customer experience. Uh, you know, being right near your customers is always good value. And that's it for me. I will hand back to Melissa, who's got one more exciting piece of dev news. <laughs> well, that dev last piece of dev news is going to have to wait until after our next talk. But we're going to go on to our next speaker. So next up, we have Phil Nash. So Phil Nash is a developer evangelist for Twilio and a Google developer expert. He's been around the web playing with JavaScript and is always working with new technologies and writing open source code. I always see him online doing all sorts of really cool stuff. And he likes to make his own beer, which I think is really cool. Do you have any beers you're making at the moment, Phil? No, none right now. No, it's been a little bit while since I did that, actually. Uh, just enjoying the, uh, the, the local breweries instead at the moment. Awesome. Yeah, definitely support local. Melbourne has a lot of awesome craft beers craft breweries that I've really been enjoying checking out myself. Um, but today he has an awesome talk about four steps going from JavaScript to TypeScript, showing us how we can move an existing JavaScript project onto TypeScript. So take it away, Phil. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much, Mel. And hello, NDC Melbourne. I'm very excited to be talking here. I think this is the first time uh, in a long time I've given a conference in the place uh, that the conference is uh, even online located. Uh, so I'm kind of excited. Welcome from Melbourne. Um, yeah, as Mel said, my name is Phil Ash. Uh, I am a developer evangelist at Twilio. Uh, if you don't know Twilio, uh, it is a communications platform. Uh, that is, it's a whole bunch of APIs that you can use in your applications to do things from sending text messages and making phone calls all the way up to uh, video chat and full on contact centers. Um, if you ever want to know uh, anything about Twilio or ask me any questions about what I'm talking about today or whatever, find me online. I'm all over the place uh, as Phil Nash uh, or on the internet, or just drop me an email at philnash at twilio.com. I'd be happy to get back to you. But let's talk a little bit. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, let's talk uh, a little bit about moving to uh, moving things to TypeScript. Um, uh, by the way, do do shout out in chat uh, if you uh, have any questions as we go along and I'll try and answer things. But let's talk about moving to TypeScript. I do want to first uh, start and clarify that uh, I uh, I absolutely love JavaScript and that's what I have spent most of my career working with, uh, it seems. Uh, and that um, uh, and, and so TypeScript has been an interesting thing for me. I mainly got into JavaScript because I, I didn't like types. Uh, but I'm at that stage of my career apparently now where I'm back into types again. So I've got no problems with JavaScript and I love working with it. But um, what about TypeScript? How about moving to that and why would we want to? Well, modern JavaScript development, I mean, I was working with JavaScript back in the day when uh, a single thousand line uh, JavaScript uh, file was, was perfectly reasonable. Um, and that was not a great thing, I guess. Uh, but these days in modern JavaScript development, we have bigger projects, we have bigger teams, and uh, you know more tools uh, uh, than ever to ensure that we are writing uh, code uh, and writing our applications correctly uh, and can work well together. Uh, and, and TypeScript becomes just uh, one uh, one of those tools, of course. Um, so there are a bunch of reasons that you might want to move to TypeScript. Um, uh, and that first one is, of course, type safety. And I know uh, this is NDC, uh, so there's probably a bunch of people um, happy with uh, uh, type safety in, in C Sharp and the whole .NET world. Uh, and so moving that into the, the JavaScript world as well is an excellent thing. Um, the tooling around it as well. Um, the, uh, I'm using VS Code a lot, and we'll see that in a, in a bit. And just seeing that tooling and things um, uh, emerge and make things a lot easier, um, and we'll see it as we go through demos later, uh, is amazing. Uh, refactoring, of course, um, 
uh, becomes an important and easier thing to do when we have that type safety uh, backing us up, uh, regardless of who wrote that code in the first place. And ultimately, uh, I think all of these things lead to confidence, confidence in our applications, doing the things that we want to do. Um, there are, of course, reasons not to move to TypeScript. Uh, you know, or these are not the reasons to choose to move to TypeScript, if uh, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, so don't uh, uh, don't if you are scared of the learning curve, or if you have a, a team of developers who've uh, uh, you know just got in, involved in JavaScript and, uh, and and you're now trying to shift them on straight to TypeScript. Like there is a learning curve to go. At. This is not the same as writing JavaScript. Um, the overhead. Uh, you may already have quite a, a, a build pipeline uh, for your for your existing JavaScript applications, uh, and adding another tool in front of that, which is actually uh, compiling all of your code together, may well cause you problems. So that that is a good reason maybe not to move uh, to TypeScript. Um, don't move to TypeScript because it gives you the idea that you don't need tests. Um, like types are not a replacement for tests. Uh, I will always 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 say that, um, uh, and. Uh, uh, and finally, um, don't don't move to TypeScript just to pick up new JavaScript features. Uh, firstly, so many of the new JavaScript features have already made it into browsers or into Node.js, depending on where you're writing this. Um, uh, but otherwise, uh, there are other tooling uh, that you can use for that. So you know, don't choose these reasons. Choose the previous ones. Choose that confidence. Uh, but ultimately, it is up to you and your team uh, whether you want to move to TypeScript and how you want to do it. But what I want to do is show you, uh, if you have a JavaScript project right now, uh, kind of four steps that you might take that can lead you towards uh, TypeScript and, and perhaps greater confidence in that type, uh, in that code base. Um, so I have a demo application, uh, which I'm gonna quickly show you. Um, it is a relatively simple uh, Node.js application. It's running a web server. So I have a, a, a you know an index there that's running the server. I have a server, which is setting up some, some routes. Uh, and I have one single uh, messages webhook route, uh, which is going to fetch a uh, a dad joke. Excellent from my uh, from my dad jokes uh, file here. So I always like to keep myself amused whilst I'm working on things like this. Uh, and so if I do, uh, and so this is then uh, it works with webhooks. So it's it goes through Julio because that's of course what I spend most of my time dealing with. Uh, but if I send that uh, message off, it's going to go through this application and uh, and get me back a joke, such as, I am terrified of elevators. I'm going to start taking steps to avoid them. Good. So <laughs> that is the application. It doesn't do an awful lot, uh, but it is you know it's a bunch of uh, JavaScript files that we can um, move together. Let's carry on. Let's head on into step one. If you want to. Um, move to TypeScript, uh, one of the easiest things is to allow your, your tooling to kind of help you get along that way. Uh, and as I said earlier, I'm using um, uh, VS Code all the time these days, and I absolutely love VS Code and the things that it makes available to us. And that leads me to kind of the step one in which TypeScript is, is built into VS Code, right? It's the TypeScript, VS Code, it's all Microsoft uh, built, and, uh, and it's built in. So we can use it, and it's available for us. Uh, and what we can do, uh, and, and it's the first thing that I end up doing is uh, head into settings, uh, search for check.js, and uh, right here under JavaScript and TypeScript, we have implicit project config. That's a little small, so I'll read it out, check.js. And this actually allows the uh, VS Code itself to uh, employ the TypeScript compiler to ch check your JavaScript code uh, to see if TypeScript agrees whether it's uh, uh, decent or not. It can use JS config and TS config files, so I don't have those in this project right now. Uh, but it has already thrown me up an error. So you can see a problem down at the bottom or this little red tab up here. Uh, and I admit this is a this is not a bug, but it's something I snuck into uh, to the this project in the first place. In that uh, this this uh, function here does not take any arguments. Um, it's like empty thing there. But uh, uh, VS Code itself via the TypeScript compiler has told has decided to show me that I've made a mistake. I've added an argument to a non-argument uh, taking thing. So I can do that. That's cleared my problems, uh, and the application is fine. Now, the thing is, I don't have to clear that problem. Uh, it's just inside my editor that these complaints are being made. Uh, and so this is a really nice way to at least have TypeScript uh, via VS Code, in this case, check on your work um, without kind of impacting uh, the end result necessarily. Uh, you know, nothing's failing to compile here. There's no com there's no compilation step for the actual project. It is just checking and giving me warnings, giving me notifications about that. And so that's I think really cool. Um, 
there are some downsides to this. Um, it is only in the editor, so it's not actually affecting the thing uh, ultimately, and you can ignore any of those warnings if you want to. It is native in VS Code and Atom, but um, not as far as I'm aware in other IDs or editors. Um, uh, if you do decide that uh, this is an important thing for you, but then you can't get over the fact that there's a, a red squiggly line in there, you can include sort of TypeScript comments to ignore lines or ignore entire files if you want to. Uh, but leaving TypeScript comments in a JavaScript code base could well be confusing to other developers on your team if they're not on board with uh, with this change yourself. Um, but I do recommend, in general, uh, turn on Check.js globally uh, in your editor if you can. Or find, you know, find if you're in another uh, editor, find a, a, a plugin that's going to work for you and do this as well. Turn it on globally and just have that extra check from uh, the type uh, from TypeScript's type system and why not? It can only help improve your code. Uh, so let's move on. Step two is actually to get the TypeScript compiler involved slightly. Um, this is time to actually install TypeScript to your project, uh, installing TypeScript using NPM uh, into your dev dependencies, and then initialize it with uh, MPX TSC. This is going to create you a tsconfig file, tsconfig.json file that looks uh, a bit like this. I mean, it will have a bunch of other options in it. Uh, there's a lot of commenting out. There's a lot of um, good commenting and documentation inside this file, and that's really useful. However, uh, this TSC init and this initial tsconfig file is pretty much built for creating a, a JavaScript project, uh, sorry, a TypeScript project from scratch. And so it comes with options like, um, uh, like these ones. <laughs> um, but we want to probably change a few of them. So for a start, uh, I'm going to change the target from uh, ES5 to ES next, and what this means is that this is um, this is stopping the TypeScript compiler doing any um, uh, cross compilation down to lower versions of, of JavaScript or, or ECMAScript, I suppose in this case, um, because you may have your existing build uh, pipeline uh, in between this. Uh, we don't actually want TypeScript to be doing that work. If you already have Babel involved, we don't want TypeScript to be doing that and then Babel do it again. We can move that out. But at this point, we're not we're not putting TypeScript involved. So keep it as ES next, and you can use your existing pipeline as, as you were. Uh, at this stage, we want to put allow JS onto true. This is because we still have JavaScript files, or in fact, our entire project is made of JavaScript files. And so we actually want those JavaScript files to go through the TypeScript compiler themselves. Uh, but for this stage, we're going to turn check.js off. And this is actually the opposite to our previous step. Um, but it's just allowing us to send our JavaScript through the TypeScript compiler and make sure it's OK. We'll also change uh, our root directory and out, out directories to make sure that those are getting right. And we're going to turn strict to false as well, just to, just to make sure. One other update we have to do once we've added TypeScript uh, to this is, uh, is we're going to change um, change the uh, package.json. A couple of things here. Like initially, that main was probably source and index.js. Now we're going to change that to dist and add a couple of scripts so that we can do this compilation. And I, you know, I'm just going to go back to the uh, demo project and do that. So I'm going to npm install uh, to my development dev dependencies TypeScript which happened nice and quickly. And then I can npx tsc init. And uh, that has created me uh, a type ts config file. Cool. So like I said, this has a load of commenting in, and that's really useful. Uh, but let's make our little changes that we were going to do. Let's not compile away um, uh, some of the later JavaScript features. Let's turn on allow JS. So JS files can go through the compiler, but they won't actually be checked for now. Uh, we're going to change our oops, root dir and out dir. So the out dir, we're going to set it off to head to dist. And root dir is where the, the files all are right now. Uh, and yes, we don't want it to be strict right now. We'll get to what strict does you know, later. Uh, we've done that. We now need to get into the package of JSON uh, because that is no longer going to be uh, dist index. And that's crashed my file there because um, Node1 now doesn't know what it's looking at anymore. In fact, I don't have a disk directory yet, so that's fine. Uh, so I will need my extra scripts here to both build, uh, just TSC, and I like to have a watch script as well. You can pass the watch argument through to the build script, but I, that, that might make this easier. Uh, so if we do that, I can then run npm run watch in my bottom hand, uh, left hand, corner there. That's going to do my compilation. Uh, 
Uh, and Nodemon now picks up the dist index file, uh, and my application is running again. Uh, and it's now being uh, TypeScript compiled, not checked, but it's TypeScript is taking all the JavaScript and then compiling it into the dist directory. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we have our output here. And what's really nice about this, actually, is if I go and take a look at the output, really it hasn't changed uh, anything, which is kind of nice. Um, this is the this is the output. This is the original source, and all that's really changed is my white space. Um, you know, which is fine. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I don't have to look at four spaces, which is too many spaces if you ask me. Um, so it, it's putting it through there. Uh, we are making uh, we are we are taking our JavaScript and pushing it through the TypeScript compiler without having to check it. Uh, we can make sure this entire thing works again and get ourselves another joke as well. I always like to ensure things are. Still hilarious on the uh, dad joke side of things. Uh, why didn't the number four get into the, the nightclub? Because he's too square, of course. Um, cool. So yeah, TypeScript is compiling our application, uh, and it's not checking it. That's fine. Let's head back to the slides. Next up, we actually want to bring that checking back in, of course. Like, we've managed to push our application through the TypeScript compiler, but it's not really done anything. And you know, if we have been previously pair programming with VS Code and with TypeScript uh, in the in your IDE, this stage is probably not going to cause you too many problems, uh, which is kind of nice, uh, because you've already checked it. And ideally, your, your project is uh, as a JavaScript project that uh, TypeScript already agrees with. Um, so in this case, we now have to back in and update our TS config to check the JavaScript uh, and make sure it's it's OK. Uh, and at this case, this stage, you might find that, uh, that that things start to come up with errors. Um, now, I, I, this has confused me recently because this doesn't necessarily happen. Um, but <laughs> uh, TypeScript has either taken in all the types for Node, node already, or uh, or it, it's figured all this out for itself. But uh, in the past, this was definitely something that's useful, and uh, and it's not something I'm stopping doing yet. Uh, so you probably want to install the types for for Node itself. Uh, that's if you're doing a Node project, of course. If you're in the browser. Uh, you maybe need something different. Um, but if we uh, include the, the types there, uh, these types come from the definitely typed project. Uh, if you've not heard of that uh, before, it is a phenomenal open source project to go alongside uh, TypeScript, uh, where uh, where the community decided that typing modules was um, uh, was a job to be done and uh, and started uh, creating all of these uh, under the at types um, uh, organization uh, in NPM, all of the types the for modules that didn't have them already. Uh, it's absolutely wonderful. I've got a link at the end of this, which gives you a, a history of uh, definitely typed. And it's a really interesting read as a uh, as an open source project that also now has some kind of guidance and, uh, and, and protection from the actual TypeScript project. So let's go back and head into tsconfig.json. And we are turning check.js on. On. There we go. You're going to check stuff and see it's not complaining. But I will just, for completeness, uh, install uh, types node to my dev dependencies um, just to make sure. And uh, let's put that back into comp compilation. And we're away. Yes, uh, good. So that is now loaded again. And uh, jokes should continue to come in. Now, as I said, um, because I ran this through check.js in the first place, uh, it is um, uh, this this project is now actually fairly happy. Uh, if I was uh, to put back in my uh, unnecessary uh, method, uh, that would actually stop the compilation uh, over the, the butt there. So we've got an error, and it would would kill it. So we can take that back out again, and uh, and we're back online. Cool. So this was a nice easy one, but that's only because we we uh, pair programmed with uh, VS Code on step one. Now, we could stop here. At this point, the TypeScript compiler is taking the JavaScript. It is um, it is checking it and outputting it to our disk directory. Uh, and we have now, as best uh, as it can, TypeScript's uh, thumbs up appreciation for our JavaScript. Um, and that's cool. Uh, and we could you know, then start to work on our pipeline. If you did already have Babel, we could change that out for um, uh, compiling to ES5 uh, using our tsconfig file. Uh, if we wanted to, we could stop there. Um, and there's actually yeah, some more benefits to this. Uh, 
we have type checking in the JavaScript, we can actually add further type annotations using JS doc. So we don't have to stop writing JavaScript. We can add extra types with JS doc. And I think this is really cool. And I'll come back to it in a second. And finally, you actually don't need to output anything either. Um, this output disk directory, that's fine. Uh, but um, if you don't output it, it's still doing the checks. And you can still have uh, like a CI system or something fail. Uh, and this is actually what the Webpack project does or, or has been doing for a while now. Um, rather than uh, uh, outputting to a disk directory, uh, you can just have the no emit true um, setting. Uh, that means it's not going to emit anything, but it is going to run the compilation and check everything uh, and throw errors if it if it doesn't work. So that's uh, that's really useful. Uh, and uh, and web web <laughs> when Webpack did this, they both caught errors in the Webpack. Um, code base and call errors in the uh, TypeScript code base at the same time, which I think is kind of a, a great symbiosis between the, the projects there. Um, so at this point, you could have JavaScript, um, your JavaScript application, and you still run the JavaScript that you wrote, uh, but um, TypeScript is keeping an eye on it. And that's nice. And like I said, JS doc, I think, is kind of amazing. It's TypeScript without writing TypeScript, uh, although uh, it is with writing some types. Um, JS doc, if you don't know, looks a little bit like this. Uh, it's um, uh, you know it's surrounded in uh, comments, and you can set types on, uh, for example, um, a uh, just a just a variable here. If we say this is type string, if later in our program we try and set foo to a number or an object or something, TypeScript is going to have a problem with it. Um, and we can do the same for functions, um, typing the parameters and returns. Like if you've ever been, if you've used JS doc to just document your code, you're actually a step ahead again here in which um, you can uh, you can use the TypeScript compiler to then take those types and, uh, and work with them. So let's just show that uh, in action as well. I'm going to go to my, uh, my actual dad joke um, function here. And uh, what am I going to do? Well, so I, we've seen in the, uh, in, the, in the slides there, you can just type regular uh, um, you can type regular um, functions or um, variables. Uh, but what I want to do is just, uh, I can create myself a full on type here. I'm going to create a dad joke type. Uh, and in this dad joke, uh, we're going to have um, a property, a property that's a string and it's a joke. And it turns out that uh, this API actually returns two other things, which is a, an ID, a, a string, which is an ID. and and a property, which is a string, which is a status. Uh, and we can know about that. Uh, and what we can say is uh, that uh, if we just actually move this slightly, we can get the, uh, we can get our dad joke, const dad joke uh, is uh, result the body. Uh, and then we're going to return uh, dad joke dot joke. Cool, but we still don't know what this actually is. It's still down as any uh, in, in TypeScript's mind. Uh, but this is where we can now actually type uh, this uh, right here. We can just say the type is uh, a dad joke. And that is going to tell you know TypeScript um, and the compiler that this dad joke is now a dad joke object and result uh, and dad joke dot joke is a string. Uh, and that then flows back through our application. Uh, so this message becomes a string um, rather than uh, before we before we added the type. Oops, where did it go? Before we added the type, I just commented out a comment. That's possible. How about that? Before we added the type, this is just any, uh, and you know, removing anys and, and and adding types is pretty much our our aim here, so we can be more confident with this code. Um, so yes, uh, this this message is now a string, and that is cool. Uh, you know, we could also, you know, we could be typing this function as well. I'm not going to carry on right now. Uh, we've got this new type, and we're using it, and it is implying things about uh, the application, uh, and and TypeScript knows about that. And so it can fail the build based on this kind of thing as well. And I think that's that's pretty exciting, TypeScript without actually writing TypeScript, just, just by documenting your code. Um, I <laughs> coming out of code is nuts. Anyway, um, step four, moving to actual TypeScript. Um, finally, right? Uh, we could have stopped at that last step, and I kind of like that. Uh, but if you really, really want to go all in on the whole thing, uh, then we need to move our JavaScript files into TypeScript files and uh, and do do something with that. 
Um, I'll, I'll just go back to the code for this because I'm going I'm to start at the top. I'm going to start the end kind of of our uh, things and start changing. Just change this file to TS. And when you do that, um, it now has problems uh, because a couple of reasons. One, um, TypeScript wants to work with ES6 imports. Uh, so I'm going to change that to import superagent from superagent. Um, and then we want to export the same thing as well. So um, uh, in this case, I'm going to export this as default. Uh, that's where it came from. Uh, and that's fine. That's now a TypeScript file, which is working for me. That's cool. And these uh, types uh, from JS doc is still applying, which is also cool. But um, webhooks, which is importing uh, the dad joke, is now having a problem with this. It's like this doesn't exist. And that's just because of a difference between default exports and um, setting module.exports to a, to a function or an object. Um, so what we can do here is either uh, if we want to keep uh, this in JavaScript for now, because at this point we're quite good because we've got, because in our TypeScript config file, we are both allowing JavaScript and checking it, and we're now sending TypeScript files through, um, uh, we can we can actually have this hybrid application. Uh, but in order to do that, we do just have to um, change our default uh, import there to require default, and that's made it work. Uh, compiling happily at the bottom there. And we've moved one of our files to TypeScript. It's pretty cool. Um, but let's move Let's move another couple. Let's, uh, let's rename that to TS uh, and see if anything else comes up. Uh, there's a bunch of then imports that I have to, uh, uh, have to change. Let's see how far I get with this. Um, yeah, we'll import that as well. I just know that the next line is not an import, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to confuse me otherwise. Uh, and then we can actually let's let's import our dad joke properly, um, dad joke module properly uh, from there, and we don't need default anymore. Cool. And one more time, we need to uh, export that properly as well, and that's going to change it in the server now, and it's going to have a problem. But I'm just going to set that to default right now. I don't, I don't think we have time necessarily to go through all of our all of our files right now, but uh, you can see, um, you know, this is a nice one we can change. Like rather than exporting a whole uh, module, we can change this to export default uh, port uh, equals that. And, you know, this is something you may not have to have changed either in your uh, in your application if you are um, building with ES ES modules um, default const, of course. And uh, once we do that, it's not happy with me. Well, all right, I'm getting that wrong today. Um, I would like to undo that and just put it back to whatever it was before because clearly I've got something wrong. Anyway, moving on. Um, we now have our partial TypeScript, partial JavaScript uh, application, and we can continue working through this um, uh, uh, as, as bits of the application become good for uh, time for refactoring or working on. We can change it to TS, move it. If you need to change default imports, then you can change those as we get through. Um, but uh, this is quite good. Um, I don't think we're done just yet, though. We have, we have moved to TypeScript, but strict mode then becomes uh, of importance to us. Uh, because we turned that off originally, uh, and Strict is allowing us to do a whole bunch of things right now that uh, maybe we wouldn't want it to. And so TS Config and, and TypeScript actually has a bunch of, of Strict options, um, uh, such as uh, no implicit any, and this is probably one that you will find you are um, failing all over the place. Uh, no implicit any uh, means that you can't kind of import or use or return just um, uh, the any type um, without being explicit about it. Uh, and so we'll see in a minute that we are already importing a bunch of uh, implicit any's. Uh, we don't want to, we don't want to do that. Um, there are a bunch more options here, and I recommend you kind of read through them. Uh, the nice thing about uh, our TS config file is that we can just kind of uncheck them one by one, pick the ones that we think are important to us, uncheck them, or sorry, or uh, turn them on uh, until we get all of them done, and then we can just turn on strict mode, and we're fine. Now, let's go and have a look at that. Uh, I'm going to put strict mode on in uh, my TS config. 
uh, let's, let's, I'm going to enable it for everything. There's not too many problems here, but I should see a, a problem coming up. There we go. Haha. <laughs> so over here in my uh, in my dad jokes um, module, um, I am importing uh, an implicit any effectively. There's no types. There's no declaration for what super agent is. Um, super agent is my HTTP uh, module here in this case, um, but I don't have any types for it. So this is sort of implicitly any. So if I just uh, npm install, um, and again, this is one that definitely typed has uh, sorted out. So I've got at typed, and this is a bit small at the bottom of my screen, but I'm importing, uh, sorry, installing at types uh, super agent, run my compilation step again, and it is now happy with me. Cool. Um, yes, and so we actually have this whole uh, type system set up for it. Now the thing is, like full strict mode is not required. Uh, it's not required in TypeScript. Um, uh, you know, it depends on how far you want to take uh, the abilities of TypeScript through to your application. Uh, it can be a goal, uh, and that's the point. Um, strict mode, uh, in its in its absolute strictness, uh, when we are changing an application over from this, making that a a goal of the uh, of the eventual transition um, will allow you to have. TypeScript do as much checking as it possibly can. But in the meantime, as you are moving, it does not have to be that full strictness. Uh, if you are starting an application in TypeScript, I recommend like setting strict mode to true from the very beginning. Uh, and that way, uh, you know, TypeScript can do its best work all the time. And then we can start adding more types. Once we're done with this, we can add more types. Now we have already, uh, we've already sort of started typing up um, our dad joke uh, here. Uh, but now we can actually make it sort of TypeScript official, right? And we can instead uh, make an actual type, um, which you know will have a joke, which is a string, and then we've got uh, you know an ID, which is a string, and a status, which is a string. And we start to get um, TypeScript to uh, get into our actual application here, and now we can specifically say that this is a this is a bad joke. Um, the result is that. Um, I, one thing I wanted to mention actually about um, uh, turning strict mode on is that uh, things like, um, ah, yeah, I, I'm going to show you this just quickly because I forgot about it. Um, one of the strict modes is that uh, this function here, uh, you know, may return a string, but if something goes wrong, it's just going to log and return nothing uh, or undefined. Uh, but over here, TypeScript is just like, no, fine, it's a promise, it'll return a string, we're, not, we're okay with this. Um, moving to strict mode, um, moving to strict mode is gonna mean that that actually now understands that it is a promise, uh, which is a string, it could be undefined, um, which is which is fine. Uh, so we know we should handle that. So here we can, you know, this is what this uh, conditional is for, handling in case we don't get a message back, uh, not crashing the application. Um, so yeah, now I'm now I'm returning this dad joke uh, properly, and we know that's going to be a string, and the result is string undefined. Uh, so you know we can start typing uh, this function as well, which is cool because we are taking nothing and returning a promise that will eventually be a string or undefined. Um, nice. Uh, so we're starting to see more and more types. I like to go back to the webhooks one as well because we can start typing things like our our, our routes here. Um, so we could we can add from Express, we can get its request and response types. Uh, and whilst the request here is not that useful in terms of typing it because we're not actually using it in this particular version, uh, the response is quite good because we can start, uh, response is a generic type, uh, and we can start telling this that ultimately the response will be called with a string or indeed uh, undefined. Um, and that is you know, either a string here uh, or right at the bottom, oops right at the bottom, if we don't respond with any actual text. Yeah, move the G over somehow. Um, uh, and that's important because if we then try and return a number, for example, it is also gonna have a problem with that. And like you said, this is gonna be a string or nothing at all, and now we have a number. Uh, and so we can keep adding these things um, as we move on through our application, just adding more and more types and and just beefing up the power and the understanding of, uh, of TypeScript's uh, compiler. Um, yeah. Finally, um, we got to uh, if if you're doing a library development, uh, this is an important one. Um, 
uh, especially if you're moving a library from, from JavaScript to TypeScript, uh, is to, in the compiler options in tsconfig.json, put that de declaration to true. Uh, and that's going to, once you've compiled and output the JavaScript, it's also going to output those .d.ts uh, declaration files, which um, you know uh, provide TypeScript types to uh, the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, super important there. So we made it, and uh, you know, I, I I feel like that deserves one more one more uh, dad joke just to uh, just to end uh, the fact that we've turned this project almost entirely into TypeScript. Uh, I've got a few files there to go, um, but there you go. What do you call a cow with no legs? It's ground beef. Excellent. Um, <laughs> we made it. Let's have a recap. Let's have a look back at, uh, at what we did. Um, so first up. Pair program with TypeScript. This is something you can turn on in any project, even projects that you, uh, in, in any JavaScript project, even JavaScript projects that you have no wish to turn into a TypeScript project in the end of the day. Uh, adding uh, uh, or turning on in VS Code or in Atom, uh, check JS and the TypeScript thing, or finding in another ID uh, a plugin that will add TypeScript checking for you, turn on check JS, and it will give you those warnings to tell you um, that TypeScript might not agree with this. and because it's only in your editor, uh, it's just telling you as you program with it, and so you can take that and use it as you will. But for the most part, TypeScript is normally right about things. Um, set, uh, step two, we can then uh, get the TypeScript compiler involved. At this point, it's about um, making sure your application can go through the compiler um, with all the, the JavaScript files you already have, uh, and and you're re kind of reasserting how your application uses that. So you then have your your output uh, file, uh, your output directory, as well as the input directory. Uh, and we start working, uh, running the output file, but uh, but working on the input directories. Uh, that's still all working in JavaScript still, but TypeScript is just taking a quick pass through and pushing it out somewhere else. Step three then becomes making sure that TypeScript compiler will fail if uh, if there is JavaScript that fails its typed situations. Um, so checking JavaScript. And as I said, we can stop here. It's what a bunch of projects do. And it's real useful to kind of show um, that TypeScript agrees with this, but we'd still only read it in JavaScript. And at this point, again, we can use JSDoc. Uh, and, um, uh, and TypeScript is going to read those types and listen to them. And then finally, move those JavaScript files to TypeScript files. Uh, if you have requires, uh, if you have common JS requires, move them to uh, ESX imports. Uh, and uh, and then start adding more types uh, until you are happy with your system. So I've got a demo repo. I've got this uh, application. Uh, it even shows the thing that I couldn't apparently do right myself whilst uh, I was trying to change the config file to TypeScript. Uh, but check this out. I'll link all of these in the slides, uh, which I'll publish later. Um, we have the demo repo here. There are some really good resources. If you want to take a more slower and at your own pace read through this than actually my, my colleague, uh, Dominic, uh, wrote the blog post, uh, wrote a blog post on this um, under uh, on the Twilio blog. Go check that out. It also has another example project that you can kind of work with and work through uh, as well. If you want to know more about uh, using JS Doc to JS Doc to add superpowers to your JavaScript and uh, and and use TypeScript without actually using TypeScript, uh, check out uh, Stefan Baumgartner's um, blog post on this. Uh, just search for TypeScript without TypeScript. That normally brings it up. Uh, and then um, uh, TypeScript actually has, uh, the TypeScript documentations has a bunch of uh, JavaScript projects that use TypeScript. So that's like Web, Webpack uh, and other projects that, that use TypeScript but don't actually get written in TypeScript. They just use the compiler to check their work. Uh, it's, really, uh, it's really interesting to see what other people do. Uh, there's some other move, uh, other links. Like I said at this uh, earlier, definitely typed is an amazing project, uh, but it, um, given its importance to the uh, to the entire ecosystem, uh, has been through a lot. So go check out the uh, the, the the blog post. or definitely typed the movie, uh, and then uh, finally Eric Elliott uh, published quite a good uh, blog post on on the TypeScript tax. Uh, and this is uh, this is sort of interesting if you want to look into. Uh, the, those reasons that you wouldn't move to TypeScript uh, as you're weighing up this decision, if that's the kind of thing you're going for. Um, so that's all I got for you uh, this afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining me to talk uh, about uh, about TypeScript, about moving JavaScript projects to TypeScript. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of NDC Melbourne. And as I said before, uh, hit me up online. I'm uh, Phil Nash everywhere all over the internet, or drop me an email at philnash.twilio.com. Other than that, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Phil. Can I just say that I absolutely love that you used a dad joke API for your demo. I'm gonna have to start using that in all of my future demos. And um, we do have a question on Slido. So this is a question from David. It says, yes. as you convert, should you aim to get rid of all any's in your code or are some of them okay? Oh, that's a good one. Um, are some any's okay? Because of course uh, the TS config like no no implicit any just means just stops you from uh, like not acknowledging that there's an any, um, but uh, but having some any's, I don't think you can uh, entirely get rid of them. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting one. I mean, if you think about uh, an API result like um, uh, like calling off to an API, uh, that is bringing you back uh, something you expect to exist uh, in the form that you can give it a type of, but really it starts as an any anyway. Um, now we we merge it into something that then looks like an object that we have, but um, uh, you know it's, you can never get rid of everything, especially at the edges of your systems. Um, on the other hand, though, I do, I, I think it's a it's a good aim to to kind of remove that as much as possible. Uh, it, again, it's it's as much as moving everything to strict mode is not uh, the the ultimate necessarily not necessarily your ultimate goal, but a useful thing. Same for kind of removing. Uh, any's as well. I think if it's useful for you to to ensure that this is in fact this type, then um, then yeah, get rid of it. That's where I go with it. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> good take. Uh, look, I absolutely loved your talk. I'm definitely going to go check out all those resources that you shared with us. So so thank you very much for joining us today, Phil. And next, we're going to have another fun little quiz. So I will be handing over to our next quiz master, which is William. Welcome, William. Hello, Melissa. Thank you very much. Yes, we have the Melbourne quiz. Uh, so, but before we kick that off, I would just like to have another word from our sponsors. The idea behind Distinguished Engineers is really to assemble a diverse team of our top level engineers and some of the best engineering minds on the planet to really solve the most complex problems, both for CBA and for our customers. Our Distinguished Engineering program started internally by us having a good look at who'd really shown amazing engineering leadership or technology leadership already inside the group. And we basically started assembling those people and focusing them on a really important problems both for us and our customers. I get to actually roll up my sleeves and actually really help solve some really tricky problems in the bank. One of the, the big challenges we have right now in X15 is how do we get small teams of engineers to be able to, within just like a few months, go for an idea and get it into our customers' hands? If we can crack that, I think that's an incredibly tough engineering problem, but also means that we can make a massive difference in Australia. One of the main reasons that engineering is important at ComBank is just the scale of impact that we have across Australia. For Commonwealth Bank, we're the largest lender in Australia. And so the scale and importance of digitising a process like that has an impact on all Australians. The thing for me that's really appealing about engineering at ComBank is the combination of really important problems for Australia and really difficult engineering problems. Everybody, so hope you like my uh, cat in the hat. Hat. <laughs> so need to wear this when we're doing quizzes. So what I'd like you to do is head over to Slido.com and type in the event code NDCMEL, NDCML, and uh, I am going to get the quiz started. 
I'll wait for you to join. So if you join, please put in uh, something that we can identify you with, preferably like a Twitter handle, and um, we'll give everyone a bit of time to, to join in. Now, to be aware of, if you're watching this on the live stream, there is a 20 or more second delay. So please use the, the slider.com site directly. So you're going to have the up-to-date results. You're going to be in the race to win one of these awesome hoodies. Hey, Lars. <laughs> uh, Lars has got the next best hat. It's covered in glitter. Once you have glitter on, you will never, ever get that off. So, <laughs> Okay, so we've got 16 people joined already. So let's give you another, let's say, another 20 seconds or so. Now, this quiz is all about Melbourne. Uh, for our audience that is not from Melbourne, it might be a little bit tough, but I think you could probably learn something about Melbourne. And uh, when all these restrictions and everything uh, go away, come visit us. It'll be great. All right, we're 21, 22 participants. Yeah, people are jumping in. Great, great, great. We got ah, some familiar names. I think people have come back from the first round to try and win another hoodie. More advertising, Lars. Yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. I'm just covered in glitter now. Ooh, stay away. Yeah. All right. All right. 24, 24. Okay. It's slowing down. I think uh, we are good to 25. Oh, last minute. Sergey, I think. Oh, I'm just guessing someone just joined in. Okay. Okay. You guys ready? Let's do it. Starting the quiz right now. Which church would you find opposite a train station, a pub, and Federation Square? Got four options. Whoa, whoa some quick starters there. Whoa. And I think there is no timer on this quiz, so we are, will be timing this a little bit, uh, let's just judge by that and see how the answers are coming in. I think it has stabilized. All right, let's lock the voting. Let's go on to the next question. The popular choice from everybody was St. Paul's Cathedral, right, or St. Patrick's Cathedral. Let's see which one was the winner. St. Paul's Cathedral, Whoa, there we go. So let's see who is in the lead first up. Oh, there's no leaderboard. Oh, I think this is going to be uh, interesting. I have to wait till the end. Next question. The Yarra's longest river in Melbourne, but how long is it? Ooh, yeah, split between the choices here. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> All right. All right. We've got some people coming in trying to figure this out. Yeah. Still jumping up and down a little bit. No. Okay. I think we are now stable. Oh, one more change. Who goes in for the last second? Got to be quick. All right. Let's lock in the votes. Let's see. Popular guess is 242 kilometers. Was it the correct one? Is it 224? It is. Cool, cool. Yeah. Let's see. What's next? Which well-known Melbourne market is named after a famous queen? And there are four queens. Here we go. Let's see. Ooh. Ooh. I can see the results coming in live. It's very exciting. Be a big surprise, this one. All right. There we go. Let's lock that in. I think everyone's voted. And everyone likes to, Queen Victoria. Is that correct? Sure is. This is the, there's the Queen Victoria market here in Melbourne. It's very famous. Everyone knows it. And uh, there are a lot of cool things you can get there. Next question. What was Melbourne's original name? Some interesting names there. I'm sure uh, we've heard of all of them, actually. <laughs> I like the way some people think. It's getting more interesting. I like this. All right. Oh, 
All right, here we go. Let's lock this one in. And the popular choice, Batmania. Was it Gotham? Was it Smallville or Central City? I think the answer is Batmania. Doesn't mean Batman is from Melbourne, but uh, you know it would have been cool if he was. <laughs> and where would I find the Eternal Flame? In Fed Square, the Shrine of Remembrance, South Bank, or in Odin's Vault in Asgard? What do you think it is? Oh, I can see people changing their mind. Interesting. You're not Googling the answers, are you? I hope not. <laughs> All right. Ooh, very last second vote here. Let's lock it in. What have we got? All right. Uh, Federation Square is a real place. Shrine of Remembrance, uh, South Bank. Odin's Vault. I'm sure it's real somewhere. So uh, Shrine of Remembrance, a very uh, beautiful site here in Melbourne. If you haven't been there, go and check it out. It is uh, uh, definitely worth seeing. Now, bit of sport. Which team won the AFL Grand Final in 2020 last year? So for the footy fans, this should be an uh, easy one. And uh, let's see, let's see. Ooh, good guesses. Some good guesses going on here. Mm. There might be a couple of rugby fans in here as well. Let's see. If you guys could see the answers I'm seeing, oh yeah, it's very exciting. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's lock that in. Uh, popular choice is Richmond, and I think yes, Richmond won. Uh, from memory, I think they're roughly 31, 32 points that they won over Geelong. Very exciting game. Let's see what happens uh, this year. We don't have long to go. Every year in Melbourne, uh, hosts the Australian Tennis Open. Which stadium is home to Centre Court? Some popular ones there. Hmm. May have made this one a bit easy. Or oh, everyone from Melbourne is playing the game. <laughs> okay, we're nearly there. We're nearly there. Ooh, -hoo. let's see. Okay, I think I am ready to lock it in. Here we go. What was the popular choice? Rod Laver Arena was 90% of choices. And yes, it is the correct one. Rod Laver is home to the ATO, Australian Tennis Open, not the tax office. According to the Crimes Act of 1958, in Melbourne, you may not do any, some of these things. What do you think it is? There's some crazy options there. <laughs> what do you think it is? I'm sure this is going to trip a few people over. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You sure you want to answer what you've got in there? Ooh, answers are very split. I think this is the one people are guessing the most. The answers are jumping in and out. It's pretty cool. Ooh, neck and neck. All right. I think we've stabilized here. I'm going to. Oh, no, no. People are still thinking about it. Oh, keeps changing. That's interesting. I'm giving you too much time. You're Googling the answers. It's okay if you do. I had to. <laughs> All right. I'm going to lock this one in. Here we go. Uh, popular choices, you're not allowed to trade with a pirate, drive a goat uh, attached to a vehicle, that kind of sounds weird, or change a light bulb without an electrical license, wear pink pants, or all of the above. Well, the answer is you're not allowed to trade with a pirate according to the Crimes Act of 1958. But in fact, all of those things are all illegal in Melbourne. You're not allowed to do that. Pirate lars, lars. <laughs> And uh, let's see, what have we got? Final, I think this is the final question. In which month is the Melbourne Cup held each year? Let's see. Mm. 
Might be the favourite month of the year for some people. Mm -hmm. The leaderboard is going to be very interesting. We don't see the leaderboard yet. It's going to be a big surprise. I think the top three players gets to win an awesome hoodie. Okay, okay. I think we have stabilized the answers. Let's lock it in. All right, popular choices, November, followed by September. Eh, let's see what happened. Who won? If you chose November, you win, which is great. Let's see what's next. Oh, there's one more question. In which year did Melbourne host the Summer Olympics? There's a whole lot of years there. I'm sure you can work that one out. Hmm. This must have been in the news recently, if everyone's picking the same one. Or everyone's just very good at history. Hmm. <laughs> this is interesting. This definitely must have been in the news. <laughs> Okie dokie. I don't think any, there's no one changing their mind on this one. All the votes have gone in and let's lock it in. All right, popular choice, 1956. Was it correct? Sure was. There you go. Everyone knew that answer. That was great. So let's find it. Now we can see the leaderboard. Who was on top? Nelson, 10 out of 10. Matt, 88, 10 out of 10. Tim Comport, 10 out of 10. So there's three the three top players all win an awesome hoodie, NDC branded hoodie. Uh, great. Thanks for playing, everybody. So I have to remind you, there is more prizes to win today. Go to the expo.ndcmelbourne.com page. Check out the sponsors. Fill in your details. We're going to draw some prizes at the end of the day. And uh, definitely looking forward to, to that as well. So um, now, next, we have... Pete Myers. I can take off my hat. Let's change my fashion. <laughs> hey, Pete, how are you going? Hey, William, doing well. And, oh, uh, look I, at was, that. I was tempted to join you in that, uh, in that quiz, but it would be a little unfair being a Melbourneian myself. You should already have a hoodie though, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's in the mail. <laughs> It's on its way. <laughs> now, Pete, you've got an awesome piano in the background there. I, I thought you were more of a data guy rather than a like musician. You know, I'm multi-talented, believe it or not. All right. So, so can you play for us a uh, sort of Power BI jingle on that piano at the end of the session? Uh, look, you put me on the spot. So the answer is today, <laughs> no. <laughs> With a 45 I'll, I'll wait session, for YouTube I'm, version. I'm concerned that I don't even have enough time to talk about all of the awesomeness that I want to talk about. Uh, I've had a peek at your, your talk abstract there. So you're going to be talking to us about uh, Power BI and some rich interactive visualizations. So can you give us a quick hint, uh, tip of what's coming up? Right. So, so if you're familiar with Power BI, awesome. Um, if you're not, in the shortest possible definition, it is a data visualization service. Now, the topic that I have is how can we take those awesome data visuals and embed them into our apps? And why would we do it? And, uh, and if we do need to do it, how could we go about it? And that's really what I'm looking to explain in this 45-minute session. Oh, that sounds great. I'm looking forward to it as well. I'm very, very interested in all of this uh, visualization stuff. Um, so please, Pete, take it away. I will do. Um, from a point of view of the microphone, is that all sounding good on your end? I'm going to take that. That, that was a yes. So Yes, from uh, me, it sounds perfect. I can hear you loud and clear. Fantastic. All right. So are we sharing my presentation? There we go. Power BI Embedded Analytics Explained. So welcome. Uh, my name is Peter Myers, and I'm very privileged to be speaking here at NDC Melbourne. And so let me briefly introduce myself. So I work for my own company, Bitwise Solutions. I am a data platform specialist with a focus on business intelligence. And I've been working alongside Microsoft for well over 20 years now. Um, uh, originally as an instructor and an MVT, teaching people about SQL Server 2000. 
Uh, but having evolved uh, alongside Microsoft Stack, you know, that's meant a journey of not just SQL Server BI, but moving into Office BI with Excel and Power Pivot. And in more recent years, of course, the evolution of Power BI, um, which is the leading, you know, data analytics service available in the market today. Um, so many years ago, I was a developer. And in fact, I remember being on a project the very day that .NET got released. That was some date in February 2002. Um, so this topic brings the worlds together of a developer and business intelligence. And so what I would like to do is know a little bit more about who you are, and this could be intriguing. Um, what I have here is a survey. Um, you can either use the bit.ly link across the top uh, or the QR code, and you'll be presented with, I think, four questions that tell me a little bit about who you are. Uh, this is important for my demonstration, so I need some data. You're going to help me. Uh, go ahead, answer the questions as honestly as you can, click Submit, and then what you'll see before you here is a Power BI dashboard that has been configured for real time. All right, so as you click Submit, we should see some results coming up here in the dashboard. So I'll give you a moment to tell us about who you are by your role, your country, your Power BI experience, and what would be the most important topic for you in this presentation. All right, so far, count of seven coming in. Uh, so as a data visualization service, it has a full capability to deliver real-time analytics as well. Um, this is being delivered through what we know as a push data set. Um, so programmatically using the Power BI REST API, we can push rows of data into a data set and a dashboard will reflect real-time updates. Um, you can also leverage Azure Stream Analytics or um, there are other capabilities like direct query modeling that provide you automatic page refresh. All right, so as these numbers come in, I get a grip, um, mainly Aussies in the audience, which probably makes sense given the time zone. Uh, but we see some from Europe, some from Africa. Looking at the by role, uh, really, uh, it's not a surprise here for this conference that software developers are the major group of people. So welcome. It is a session targeting software developers, and in particular, app developers looking to embed analytics in their apps. Now, as the results are coming in, um, take a look at the column chart along the bottom that tells me about your self-rating for Power BI. And welcome to those eight that have confessed that they have no background in Power BI. And that's certainly a great starting point for this presentation because I'll launch into the fundamentals in just a moment, uh, right up to the fact that we've got some um, uh, ninjas. All right. so. A question that someone might have when looking at this dashboard could well be, yes, but what is the average Power BI experience? Okay, so as those results are still coming in, what I can do is close the full screen mode. And at the top left, you'll see that I can ask a question of the data. And Power BI has its own, uh, what could we say? It's like a search engine. You can sort of enter a natural language question, like what is the average Power BI experience? And look at the way Power BI already suggests. And the answer to that question could be delivered to me here as a single value. And because that's a value that I want to monitor over time, I can at the top right corner, click pin the visual, and then I can pin it back to the dashboard, whereupon that can now be monitored. Now, as to why it said 6.5 and now it's 2.74, I think the 6.5 was my earlier test and it cached the result, but the genuine result based on the fact that we have 35 submissions is that we're looking somewhere between a rating of two and three. Now, just returning to Q&A, um, the map is a great visual, but sometimes it doesn't give you the detail at a glance you want. So I could also say, what were the you know, survey count by country? And I can see here the 30 from Australia. Next runner up, we're looking at Germany by two, Ethiopia, India, and Norway. So welcome. And thanks for participating in that survey. 
Uh, the other thing I'll point out is that this is a Power BI dashboard. Um, yet when I click on a tile, what Power BI is doing here is navigating or clicking through to an underlying report. Okay, so we can see the same data as a report. This is a very different experience. While it may look similar, the report is designed for interactivity of your end users. And so often when embedding Power BI visualizations into apps, it is going to be the report, not the dashboard, but a report experience. And a report comprises one or possibly multiple pages. But just look what I can do here by clicking on the bubble for Australia. This is what we know as a cross highlight. So from Australian uh, survey results, I can see that 19 uh, of, the, of the 20 software developers are Australian. And I also get an idea here across the Power BI experience, including that the average self rating for Australians is 3.09. Uh, if we try that again one more time, and we've got a couple of people from Germany, then I can see here that the two people from Germany that have come in uh, have given themselves a self rating of zero and three, giving us that average of 1.5. Now, page two of the report um, gives me an idea about what is most important for you. So the top ranking topic for you in today's session is the fundamentals of Power BI. Not surprising given that eight of you were um, coming in with zero experience. The next one is Power BI Embedded Fundamentals, which really is the heart and the soul of what I'm going to talk to you about in these 45 minutes. And client APIs will be covered and data permissions will be covered as well. All right, so switching back to my presentation, that pretty much sets me up for an agenda of introducing Power BI and Power BI Embedded, and then describing the client APIs and how data permissions can work. I'll wrap up quickly with a discussion of automating solution management, leave you with some resources, and then open up for any questions that you might have. And by the way, I'll be sharing a link at the end of the presentation that will allow you to download a PDF document of these slides, including any links that I've included. So let's begin from the very beginning about what Power BI is. So I've already mentioned that it's a data visualization service. Uh, and so it's from Microsoft. Uh, if you're already working with Microsoft and uh, Microsoft 365, that you've got your Outlook and your whole productivity suite set up, Power BI works within the very same tenant of Microsoft 365. Um, bottom line is this, the most common way to use Power BI is as a cloud service, is that you're going to publish data to the service. And uh, the way that you create these data solutions would be using a tool like Power BI Desktop, which is a freely downloadable uh, application for Windows. Uh, and thereupon, that tool does two things. It allows you to connect to your data and create a model over your data. And a model is a way of taking your source data and structuring it in a way that's going to support the analytic requirements that Power BI needs. Uh, it also allows you to create more friendly and intuitive experiences to support your application users when navigating through the data. When Power BI Desktop creates these data solutions, they are published to the service, they become what is known as a data set. And then that data set becomes the source of data for reports and potentially dashboards. Um, now, just a word about keeping that data current. Uh, if those data sources are accessible by the internet, then generally speaking, Power BI can, on an automated frequency, can refresh the data to keep it current. Or if you're working with data behind your firewall on premises, uh, there are gateways that you can install, uh, allowing Power BI to securely communicate with that data as and when needed. Lastly, from an access point of view, uh, my demonstration there with the dashboard was using what we call the Power BI service, which is really just a web portal. So any of the major supported web browsers, so we're talking Edge, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, all you need to do is go to powerbi.com, sign in to get access to your data. Uh, there are native mobile apps as well for iOS and for um, Android. Um, so it's pretty simple just to install them from their respective stores, sign into Power BI to gain access to your reports and dashboards. But really what we're here to talk about is beyond the portal and beyond the native apps is that you can embed rich analytics directly inside your own apps. So from a product portfolio perspective, I'm just going to touch off on the authoring perspective, there are two free tools that you will use to create and publish your solutions to Power BI. 
The Power BI service is critical because it is the service that hosts your data and is responsible for all of the rendering and delivery of reports. Power BI Premium is a license uh, available to you, and it could become relevant depending on the scenario that you use to embed. More on that coming soon in this presentation. Power BI Report Server doesn't deserve a mention here because it's an on-premises delivery of Power BI, uh, especially targeting customers that uh, perhaps aren't ready for the cloud or there are some uh, legal or governance concerns about using the cloud. Uh, it doesn't form part of my discussion today. Lastly, and highly relevant to what I'm talking about is that Power BI Embedded is a product um, allowing you to package up rich data visualizations, embed them in your apps. Okay, so let's start the discussion then with embedded analytics. So in the digital workplace, embedded analytics should occur within a natural workflow. We don't like the idea of sending users outside your app potentially to get distracted by doing something else and forgetting what they're doing. So there shouldn't be this need to continue to move in and out of apps. Yet statistics are telling us that up to 22% of employees um, are accessing the data that they need to make informed decisions. Um, they're having to, uh, you know, either do without good data to make a decision or they're having to move outside the environment. So as a minimum requirement, what you're looking to deliver is obviously good quality, up-to-date, credible, consistent data. And then the best way to communicate from data to your users um, is often through data visualization. It's far easier at a glance to gain an understanding of the data than it is to look at a lot of detail or a lot of numbers and attempt to make sense of them. And of course, the last requirement would be that you've got some app that has some genuine requirement to have data visualizations embedded. So what it comes down to is this, is that you have basically two options. The first option is, well, do you build it? Do you go and create these data models and these visualizations from scratch? And yes, you can do it. And perhaps you've done this or you've been reliant um, on this in the past, but your experience might well tell you that it's very time consuming and therefore expensive. And it's a shift of focus of what you're really there to do as an app developer. So the other option is, just buy it. Uh, so if an existing service exists, then embed it. And this approach is simple and easy and faster time to market, cost effective. And of course, as a product like Power BI evolves, which it does very rapidly, you know, it's in its sixth year, but still we're seeing month by month incremental new features taking the product to even higher levels. So you can leverage those new features in your app as and when they're released. So now would be a great time to switch from the fundamentals of Power BI to talk about, well, what is Power BI embedded? So what it means is that Power BI content, whether it's a Power BI dashboard or a report, or even that Q&A experience where the natural language can be used for uh, by the user to look for the answers that they need. Um, this is often uh, good because sometimes as an app developer, you may not know what questions to answer. There are probably some obvious questions to answer and you can build pre-built reports and dashboards to support that. But what about the other questions that you haven't anticipated? Well, the answer is that Power BI would let you embed Q&A into your app to allow that free form questioning. So Power BI Embedded lets you embed rich visualizations into your apps. You can embed any Power BI content and essentially it works by adding an iframe to your web page. It relies on web standards like HTML5 and JavaScript, and it works in web apps, mobile apps, and even thick client applications. As I'll describe shortly, you can then seamlessly integrate Power BI content using the Power BI client APIs. Now, there are SDK resources to support you uh, and different development platforms. So officially .NET, .NET Core, JavaScript, and TypeScript, and there are also samples available in Node.js, Python, and Java. So they can provide you a, a quick start or a, a great educational experience to take an existing solution and perhaps reverse engineer it to learn from it. There are five different types of content that you can consider embedding in your apps. The reports or even a single visual from a report page, 
Power BI also supports paginated reports. And if you already have background in SQL Server reporting services, you can think of paginated reports in Power BI as being the new generation of SQL Server reporting services. In fact, it's almost identical. There are a couple of things that are different. But you can think of them as being the same. And therefore, paginated reports hosted in the Power BI service can also be embedded in your app. Next, we have dashboards, like the dashboard used to uh, analyze your survey inputs. Or a single tile from a dashboard, even if it's real time, can be embedded in your app. And lastly, the Q&A experience. Now, one other thing to point out here is that if you're going to embed Power BI reports, which, by the way, is the most common content type of Power BI to embed in an app, uh, is that it can also uh, be used as a creation experience. So your app can allow users to create new reports or edit reports and save them back. All right, so it's not necessarily just a consumption experience. Now, there's an important distinction to be made that when you're embedding content, is it being embedded for your organization? In other words, for the users in your org, or is it for your customers? And the difference comes down to um, development methodology will differ, but licensing. Okay, so just to cover off on what it means that if you're embedding Power BI for your organization, they're basically users within your org, right? So from a licensing point of view, it's very straightforward. They just need the licenses to act access the content. And therefore, from an app perspective, there's no special consideration for licensing or to pay any more. The point is that if they can access the content through the uh, Power BI service in the web portal, or if they can use a, a native app, um, excuse me, a mobile app, then they've got permission already. So the reason that you might consider embedding for your organization is that you want to create a custom experience rather than relying on Microsoft's uh, portals. All right, so it's targeted at your internal users. Authentication happens through Azure AD. End users will require Power BI licensing. Uh, it uses an interactive authentication flow. And in documentation, you might see this being discussed as the user owns the data scenario. Now, the other scenario targets more the ISV, and that is for your customers, where the user base are external users. And this allows your app to use its own authentication store and its own methods. And the whole concept here is that your end users do not have licenses to access the Power BI content. It uses a non-interactive authentication flow using either service principle or what's known as a master user. And it goes by the name of app owns data. So the difference is internal users versus my app users do not have access to the Power BI content that we're hosting. All right, generally speaking from a development methodology and just to fast track the flow that might take place is that in Power BI, you'll create what's known as a workspace. And a workspace is a container for Power BI content and it allows you to uh, prepare your data and to create reports, dashboards, and so on. It is also a security boundary. So you'll provide sufficient security for your app to gain access to the content within the workspace. Next, you're going to build up that content. So at a minimum, you need some data and perhaps one report, if not more. Then you need to move into um, Azure, and you need to register an Azure AD application, which will be used as part of the authentication flow in your app. To bring in the required libraries, um, you'll import various NuGet packages, and I have a slide on that shortly. Um, in your web app, you'll configure app settings that set the settings to the Power BI service endpoints, but also set the workspace that um, contains the content that you're looking to embed and other um, identity information. What is the identity that will be used by my app to authenticate with Power BI on behalf of users and to gain access to content? Next, you're going to then add that iframe into your web page. Uh, and with client-side libraries, you're going to call methods that are going to embed content. Now, what will happen server-side is it's going to have to embed tokens that gain access to content. So the first thing is authentication requires an access token. If you're embedding on behalf of your customers, then the additional development step will be to generate what's known as an embed token. And that embed token represents claims for particular Power BI content on behalf of the user. 
Next, you can enhance the user experience. So you can do whatever it takes to embed that in a meaningful way. And we'll talk about this in a little more detail when I come to the client APIs. And then lastly, configuring data permissions. Now, actually, security should never be a last consideration. But in the list here, data permissions comes down to the fact that your user base might all have access to the same reports, but not necessarily to the same data. And so therefore, it's possible to use what we call effective identity to limit data visibility for various users. For example, the manager has the ability to see all of the data, but individuals can only see their specific projects that they're working on. All right, so we'll talk about that in a bit more detail shortly. Now, just to provide you some uh, resources that if you are looking to explore this, there are some sample solutions available on GitHub and I'll share the links with you shortly. And when you go into the sample solutions, you can either um, download a zip file containing a pre-built solution to embed for your customers or to embed for your organization. All right. Um, Sorry, by the way, there's a workflow set up. So you can follow, I think, four to five different steps. And the result of you setting everything up, perhaps uploading your own content or using sample content, the result is it will download a zip file that contains a Visual Studio solution and everything's set up, ready to go. All right, so. Once we've got the embed happening, um, there's quite an amazing suite of things that you can do client side. So at this point, let me switch across to what I have here. So something that's very, very useful for you to be aware of as a developer is that we've got these, what's known as the playground. So I've just got to find here on my desktop where the playground is sitting. Here it is here. Again, the link will be shared in my presentation. Now, Microsoft have gone to great lengths to build this playground, and the name suggests it is a little bit fun uh, because it provides you this experience to really explore and try out embedded without a lot of effort, certainly no very little investment in time and certainly no investment in money. So coming to home, um, what I like to do is say, let's do this. Let's go straight to the explore the APIs. And what you can see happening right here is that a sample Power BI report is being embedded. Okay, and if you want to switch and look at the other options you've got, like show me what it's like to embed a specific report visual instead of an entire page, or a paginated report, then those options have already been set up for you. All right, and this paginated report being, of course, multi-pages, there we'll go. The next option is a dashboard or a single tile from a dashboard or let's embed the Q&A experience. Now, noting that if you're going to embed a report, you can also check out what is it like if I want to allow the user to edit and therefore save changes back. And now you can see here in the embedding frame that they've got that ability. What I really want to point out to you though is that once an embed's been achieved, take a look in the Explore Our APIs pane where you can see that there are an enormous number of operations that you can run client side to navigate between pages, manage the authoring of reports, apply filters and so on. Now, what's pretty cool about this is that the developer sandbox allows you to use a sample or to select your own report. So what I want to show you here is that I'm going to come into my own Power BI tenant and I have a workspace called survey and the data that you um, submitted in your survey has um, come through to this report, the PBIE NDC Melbourne. And so even here in the playground, I can embed my own report and, and here it is. Now what's pretty cool is that you can start to play with the code here and then you can run the code and see the result that is being embedded. And so I thought I'd share one example with you um, and that would be on filtering. What if I go ahead and 
filter the page. So I'll go and add a page filter. Now, if I click on the little eye icon here, I can see that this adds filters to the report page. If I click on the ellipsis, I can show a code snippet. All right, so then it's just a matter of copying and pasting it and adapting it for use in my own app. But this is so cool, is that what I can do is actually drag that into the code window here. And for example, I can just adapt this to say, filter the survey table, and there's a column named country, and I'm only interested in a filter on Germany. And let me go ahead then and run this, to which we can see client side, we've been able to filter the page. All right, so think about it. It might be you're navigating from a customer's record, and now you want to do some analysis of the customer. So you can pass the customer key in as a filter. All right, so what we're describing here is that we have this ability to work with lots of client-side operations. How it works is your client application hosts the iframe. Your embedded report is inside that iframe, and the client APIs are bi-directional, allowing you to communicate in and for Power BI to communicate back out to the app. All right, so there are many supported capabilities. And as one example, user interactions are natively supported by report view. Users can, can do anything like cross-filter. They can download data. They can sort. They can... Uh, interact in every way that Power BI supports. And your application can subscribe to these events. And in response to the user clicking on something, the application can then do something. All right, so dynamic report layouts are a possibility as well. Working with bookmarks that capture state and allow the replaying of state can also happen. And report visual creation and personalization can also take place within the app. All right, so consider what we call an in-context analytics workflow, where the user navigates within the app. The app shows the report filtered to a specific view. The user interactively filters the data in the report. They click on a button, and then the app does something in response to clicking on the button. Well, switching back to the playground, um, it allows me to come back to the home and say, Let's take a look at the showcases. In fact, you'll find the showcases here on the left. And that very scenario that I've described quite quickly is available for you here in a sample report. So for example, embedded, we've got this list of uh, customers and their purchasing patterns. We can interact by modifying slice of values. And using the client side APIs, we've enhanced this visual that when we click on campaign, all of the filtered customers are now available here. And then I could narrow it down further and say, OK, these are the customers that I want to target uh, in a uh, marketing campaign. Go ahead, send them a coupon. Here is the subject of the email. And here is the detail. Click send. OK, it's obviously just a sample, but it's this concept of working in a report, but having your application respond to your behaviors within the report. All right, so while time doesn't permit in this presentation, there are further showcases. Um, for example, um, personalizing top insights, uh, customizing report colors within the app itself, allowing the user to determine uh, what works best for them. Okay, so next topic. Remember, this is high level, giving you an idea of what Power BI Embedded can do for you. In that scenario where we don't want all users to see the same data, we've got this ability to enforce what we call row level permissions. All right, user one, when they access the report within your app, gets to see Australian sales. But the very same app that a different user signed in accessing the same report gets to see German sales. So this is achieved in Power BI by what we call row level security. And in Power BI Desktop, as the data modeling tool, you can create what are known as roles. And these roles enforce permissions under certain circumstances. And when you add these roles into your model and publish it, 
when your application needs to generate its embed token, remember the claim that it will present to embed the content, it will also embed the effective identity of your current application user. Now, remember, these users do not need permission to your Power BI content directly. And therefore, when you define effective identity, you're able to map them to the appropriate role. For example, this is the sales director. They will be mapped to a role that gives them permission to see all sales territory data. But when an individual sales rep uses the same app, your effective identity will map them to a role where they can only see the sales territories to which they've been assigned. So Microsoft has a very mature data modeling technology. It evolved from SQL Server analysis services. And today, what we know as the tabular engine for analysis services is available in Power BI as its data modeling engine. Now, that says a couple of things, um, mature technology. Uh, but also, the fact is that these models can be developed in Power BI Desktop, or if you have existing models already with either Azure analysis services or SQL Server analysis services, then these can also be used by Power BI and therefore their data can be embedded in your apps. All right, the next topic is automating solution management. And so we'll give consideration to what we can do and what libraries are available, but also relevant for ISVs where you might want to create you know, multiple instances and yet maintain them as independent for each of your individual tenants. We'll talk about workspace-based isolation. So when it comes to automation, this is pretty important for us as, as developers. Uh, it can be used for lifecycle management uh, in the way that you might manage your Power BI content and deploy it for onboarding a new customer in a multi-tenant solution, or for IT operations and maintenance. So you can work with the Microsoft Graph API when working with Azure AD. Power BI has its own REST API that allows managing content and the service itself. And then there's the Azure Resource Management API as well. Now, with the Power BI REST API, we use it to access and manage Power BI content, like creating new workspaces, assigning workspaces to the capacities, which is a licensing discussion, granting permission to access content within a workspace, or importing new content, be them new data models, data sets, or reports. Relevant for the ISV, then, is where you must have separation of tenants. And this can be easily achieved in Power BI by using the workspace as a boundary for each individual tenant. So that way, you know, when you want to absolutely make sure that there is no potential mix up, uh, is that you will just create one workspace per tenant. But because you're likely to leverage and repeat the content that you already have, the way automatic to be set up is like this. You create what we call the golden workspace. This doesn't belong to any tenant, but it is like the template of which is your perfect data and reports. What you would then do is through scripts, you would create the identity that Power BI will use to access, and then you will use it to create a workspace and then clone or copy all those data sets and reports. You might also do things like update connection strings if you need to point to a separate instance of your data source. And then you will assign it to a capacity, which is a licensing concept I'll talk about shortly. Now, what this means is every time you onboard a new tenant, you're just going to run your script that will then copy the golden workspace into a tenant dedicated workspace. And then it will have its specific identifiers that your embedding app will use to connect. I want to finish on the discussion of licensing. Uh, so licensing will differ according to whether you're embedding uh, on behalf of users that belong to your org or their customers. Remember, if it's embedding for your organization, the licensing discussion is that they need licenses themselves because they're the end users within your organization. You're welcome to embed that content, and there's really no um, special requirement beyond that. But if you're embedding for your customer, um, well, then you will need some licensing from Microsoft. So embedding for your organization requires that your application users have a Power BI Pro license. Uh, they will require Power BI Premium per user licensing as well if they're dependent on specific features for what we call PPU or Premium per user. Um, 
it's possible that they do not have these licenses, yet if you're using Power BI Premium and the content that they're accessing resides in a workspace that is in a premium capacity, then they do not need these pro or premium per user licenses necessarily. All right, so there's a, a greater bit of research that you'll need to do, but at the end of the day, from an app perspective, you're not concerned with licensing. You will generate an access token, which will then be used by your app to access content on behalf of your user, and they either have access or they don't. Now, when embedding for your customers, there are two options that you can purchase what's known as a P SKU or an A SKU. Now, there's some good news for you as an app developer that if you're wanting to trial or evaluate and you don't want to invest in um, buying any licenses, then what happens is that every user in Power BI that has a pro or a premium per user license, they have a limited number of what can we say, free tokens that can be generated, all right? Now, providing that you do not use them for production workloads, then you can go ahead and use these free tokens to experiment with embedding for your customer. There is an API method that will let you determine what the usage percentage is. All right, so a quick comparison between ASKU and PSKU. The ASKU is actually an Azure resource. It is named Power BI Embedded, and you will purchase it in the Azure portal. It's billed hourly. There's no commitment to, um, to uh, use it for any period of time, and it provides full elasticity. So you can scale up or down according to demand. You can even pause it and therefore uh, turn the cost off. And this can all be automated as well through the ARM API. Now, PSKU is Power BI Premium, and it's purchased through Office 365. Um, it provides you the ability to generate embed tokens, but there is a monthly billing and a monthly commit and a yearly commit for working with Power BI Premium. In addition to embedding content, however, you get Power BI Report Server, and you get the ability to do some other cool things. Now, the guidance that I would provide you at a very high level as a developer, if you were interested in embedding for your customers, your Power BI content, then generally speaking, enterprises buy Power BI Premium because they want to benefit from the ability to share content with non-licensed users uh, and other features in Premium. Whereas ISVs generally purchase the Power BI embedded product or the ASKU. But it's not set in stone. You don't necessarily have to do it because you're an ISV. What you would do is weigh up what are the capabilities and features on offer and what makes the best sense for what we're delivering. But there is a final word that I'd like to give you. And again, if you're moving into that territory of we're interested, we want to evaluate and test, is that at very low cost, remember, once you've uh, you've used those free embed tokens, um, and remember, they can't be used for production workloads. But if you want to start testing it, the cheapest option available to you today is to purchase an A1 node, which is US $1 per hour. And remember, you can pause and resume this. So it comes to about $720 US a month, allows you for, for small scale to start out. And it'll also allow you to determine, well, according to the workloads and the number of users and the demands that our application is making, um, that if the A1 might be sufficient, or maybe we need to at some point scale up to an A2 based on the demands that are being made from customers. All right, so for those that are intrigued, want to know more, and uh, want to trial it, um, this is the low cost option, $1 an hour while you're working with embedded content. In my final minutes then, very quickly, because you can download the PDF, is that there are resources like the Embedded Playground link. There's also the Embed Setup tool. NuGet package links are available. Sample applications available from GitHub and samples for all of these um, technologies as well. I'm going to leave this slide up now and then open for any questions there might be. But if you click uh, on this link or use the QR code, you can download the presentation and all of the resources that I've talked about are available to you. Now would be a great time to know if there are any questions that I can answer. Uh, William, I'm not hearing you. Oh, I've done a second last moment. Now I'm we hearing go. you. He's got to press two unmute buttons these days. Um, <laughs> that was a great uh, 
presentation, Pete. Uh, there's a, a lot of Power BI that I didn't know existed. So um, I, I'm definitely going to be looking into the, uh, the playground. I think that's, for me, going to be a good start. Um, there aren't any questions in the, uh, the Q&A section, but I've got one of my own. So when we're building a visualization in Power BI, and I've got a, a data set that, or a component that doesn't quite fit what I'm trying to show. Is there a way? Can we build our own visualizations? You know, custom. You know, yeah, absolutely. So, great question. So, there is a complete framework um, for custom visuals, allowing you to build exactly what you want. Now, it's not a trivial thing to do, by the way, William. So, uh, if you do have skills in, you know, HTML and uh, working with graphics libraries, working with TypeScript. Um, and CSS, if you have all of those skills, then yes, Power BI will allow you to package up your own visual, and then you can use that in your embedded apps as well. Oh, so are you talking like libraries like, say, D3 or... Um, Correct. Or, yeah? well, well, at the yeah. end of the day, you're rendering HTML, so any graphics or drawing library that you want can be used, and then you can package up your own visual. There's also a marketplace out there. There are some very um, sharp individuals that are producing their own custom visuals and, um, and mm. profiting from that. Okay, so there's ones you can pay for, the free ones as well? Lots of free ones. So if you go into Power BI it. and you edit a report, in your visualizations plane, there'll be a dot, dot, dot button. When you click it, you can then go to the app source and you can import from Microsoft's and the community, by the way, a very, very lot of custom visuals mm. there too. Mm. Uh, do you happen to have a link to that um, library uh, or the marketplace? Uh, look, I Power BI marketplace. If you just do a quick search on Power BI custom visual, you would pretty much land custom quickly visual. on Microsoft Docs and it would uh, lead you from there. Uh, Pete, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, you know, telling us what we can do with our boring data, making it look <laughs> awesome, you know, turning that, that, that data into some digital gold, I think is super valuable. There's uh, a lot for us to learn from uh, your talk today. Uh, so thank you very much, Pete. You are very welcome. Thanks for having me, William. <laughs> No, no problem. Now, uh, next, we're going to hand over to Roaming Lars because he has disappeared from the studio. But first, we want to just have a word from our sponsors and then we'll find Lars. The idea behind Distinguished Engineers is really to assemble a diverse team of our top level engineers and some of the best engineering minds on the planet to really solve the most complex problems both for CBA and for our customers. Our Distinguished Engineering program started internally by us having a good look at who'd really shown amazing engineering leadership or technology leadership already inside the group. And we basically started assembling those people and focusing them on a really important problems both for us and our customers. I get to actually roll up my sleeves and actually really help solve some really tricky problems in the bank. One of the, the big challenges we have right now in X15 is how do we get small teams of engineers to be able to, within just like a few months, go from an idea and get it into our customers' hands. If we can crack that, I think that's an incredibly tough engineering problem, but it also means that we can make a massive difference in Australia. One of the main reasons that engineering is important at ComBank is just the scale of impact that we have across Australia. For Commonwealth Bank, we're the largest lender in Australia. And so the scale and importance of digitising a process like that has an impact on all Australians. The thing for me that's really appealing about engineering at ComBank is the combination of really important problems for Australia and really difficult engineering problems. everybody um yeah i thought i'll just show you some of what melbourne is really about so hello 
I'm in a coffee shop. I know it's quite novel. And um, I'm here with Alex at the, at the uh, Cartel Roasters, Coffee Roasters. Thank you, Alex. This is awesome. Right. And we're just getting coffees for the crew. So I'll just take you for a quick walk. All right. Thanks, mate. Easy done. Thanks. Cheers. All righty. See ya. I'm just going to walk out in here to the alley. Have a look at this. So this is as Melbourne as it gets, people. If you're not from Melbourne, we love our little alleys of coffee shops and weird things in all the little nooks and crannies. But, um, whoa, make sure I don't drop them. Got the coffees, peeps. Got them. So I'm just going to walk back to the studio, and I will see you there. Thank you, Lars. I'm looking forward to that coffee. <laughs> so, team, I promised you another piece of developer news, and it's all of, still all about .NET 6. We'd be amiss to talk about .NET 6 coming out without talking about .NET MAUI. So .NET 6 is all about the .NET unification plan and bringing in those final bits. And .NET MAUI is the .NET multi-platform app UI, which is the evolution of Xamarin Forms. And it builds upon and extends Xamarin as part of that .NET 6 unification. So it's a cross-platform, mobile-first, native UI framework for Android, iOS, Mac OS, and Windows. And it's something that I'm personally super excited about. And it's they've been launching previews all alongside uh, the different .NET preview releases. The latest one is all about supporting Visual Studio 2022 in Preview 2, which is cool. So it now has .NET MAUI workloads. You can go out and build your .NET MAUI projects. You can get started. And I'm super excited about it because it supports both XAML and Fluent C Sharp UI. So you can now write your UI mobile applications in just pure C Sharp if you wanted to, which is really cool for me as a, as a .NET developer who hasn't used XAML before. And now you can use, oh, fly, you thank go. you, Lars. No <laughs> so I got my, my Melbourne coffee delivery. Um, but yes, with Maui, you can now do .NET workload installs within the latest preview. There's support for native alerts, gestures, and clipping. So that's the, the latest piece of tech news. So now I've got my, my Melbourne coffee. And we have Lars setting back up in the studio. And he's gonna get us get all ready, and I think he's gonna bring on our next speaker. Let's see, can you hear us, Lars? <laughs> You're on unmute. There we go. Yes, I can hear you. Ooh, ah, coffee. Mm. Ah, delicious. All righty. So all caffeinated again, and ooh. All out of breath. I'm not used to all this up and down stairs. I live in the country. Um, now, please do go and check out the expo at expo.ndcmelbourne.com. There's still a chance to sign up, and there's an awful lot of prizes to give away. <laughs> I just had another look at them. It is, I don't know, 40 or something. So there's a lot. Um, now, our final speaker for the day is an American, a longtime Sydney cider, and she now lives in Munich in Germany. Yep. Um, she's part of the developer relations team at AWS and has taught a bunch of machines to code and take over the world, I think. Anyway, she's here to also talk about knitting for some reason. And um, please welcome from halfway around the globe, Chris Howard. How you doing, Chris? Hey, Lars. <laughs> uh, hang on, my screen sharing. One second, one second. Ooh. It's 7 a.m. here. Did you mention that? You didn't mention that. No, no. I'm, I'm going to send you a box of tissues. You know, so you can, you know, just cry and quiet. Oh my gosh, I might have to disappear for one second and come back oh, to give screen oh, permission. Okay. Give me one, well, talk, talk about knitting for one minute. There you go. I will talk about knitting. So my first experience with knitting was actually in primary school because my mom wanted me to start to learn to knit. I wanted to do crocheting and I'm not even making this up actually. My grandma was a crocheter, my mom was a knitter and there was this big fight, but um, I didn't either. And I liked sand pits. So there you go. <laughs> Have we lost Chris? She's not. She's not back. Oh well. Um, now we could. Oh, here we go. You're back again. I yeah, wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. Was <laughs> Did you want me to do your presentation or? No. Well, I know you offered this morning, but uh, <laughs> no, that that will be unnecessary. Thank okay. You. Fair enough. How are you doing this morning? That looks delicious. I am drinking my coffee because, as I said, it is seven o seven a.m. So I've. I, I don't yes. know why I agreed to this, really. 
I really doesn't... wanted to speak at NDC for years. And so time zones be damned, really. Yeah, but just think how much you get out of the day. So now you mm. get this out of the way and you got the whole day to enjoy the post-presentation high. You're going to get a full day of work after this. Oh, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. All right. But so I... I did share. Can you Can you see that now? Yes, oh, nice. Fantastic. So there is knitting in this, and I promise you all, this is not a talk to miss. Um, There's always <laughs> knitting within arm's reach of me. You talk, you know. <laughs> exactly. Just um, you did once knit the genome of a certain virus, did you not? Oh, it's around here somewhere. I didn't quite See? finish it. You know, the original thought was I was going to knit the genetic sequence of the COVID virus last year <laughs> when we first went into lockdown. And, uh, yeah, I, I thought I'll knit it throughout lockdown. Gave up on that pretty quick. Glad you know I did. What? I've still mm. got it. I'll finish it one of these days. Yeah, and then you can just cover the whole building probably. It would be enormous. Yeah, I worked out the math. It would be like several football fields, just the section of it that I had. Oh, dear. All yeah. right, well, we better get to this talk then so you can go back to knitting. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> All, All right, right, no worries. I'll see you after. Okay, cool. Well, uh, good day, everybody. God, it's been a while since I've said that. Thank you so much for having me. You know, for those of you who don't know me, as Lars said, my name is Chris. Um, I'm an American Australian. Thank you. I do have two passports. Uh, if you want to tweet at me, uh, my username's at uh, web underscore goddess. Um, uh, they're in the corner. Uh, it should be in the corner of my slide. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so I've spent the majority of my tech career in Sydney working for companies like Nine Digital and Canva and then AWS. Uh, but yeah, last year, Rod and I decided it would be fun to move to Europe for a while. Um, so yeah, that was complicated, but we did get to Munich in August. And, uh, nowadays I'm a manager in the AWS DevRel team. Um, and, uh, it is 7 AM here. I did mention that, but as I said, I've always wanted to speak in NDC events, so I'm not going to let moving halfway around the world stop me. Um, so in my career, I've been a web developer, a BA, um, a tech evangelist, a people leader, but what I have not been is a machine learning expert or a data scientist. Uh, but it's a topic that interested me and, and maybe like you, you know, I'd see talks at meetups and at conferences over the years that I kind of hoped would, would show me an easy path to get started. Um, I actually remember attending one uh, developer conference in Sydney uh, <coughs> um, that where I went to a talk uh, that was billed as machine learning for software developers. And I got there and it was a full room and I'm very excited. And within five minutes, literally, it was slides of nothing but calculus. And I remember looking around the room at the other people who were looking at me and we're all like, this is a bait and switch. Like, did, did you know that was what it was going to be? I didn't actually get much out of that talk. Um, so don't get me wrong, though. If you actually want to get a job as a machine learning expert or a data scientist, you need to have that foundation. You need to do the calculus. Absolutely go back and do that. But this talk isn't aimed at you. This talk is for folks like me who, who were curious, who were interested, who, who wanted to do something practical and just starting out um, and, and do it as simply as they can. So I promise you no calculus today. Um, I just want to have some fun, uh, show you some of the things that inspire me about machine learning and show you a project I've been working on. Hopefully, hopefully get your juices flowing and get you to do one yourself. So this is what we're going to cover today. Um, I'm going to cover some of the cool stuff people are doing in AI ML, some of the stuff that's personally really exciting to me and is maybe outside of the examples that you see normally when people talk about this stuff. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about how you can get started, a few, a couple few resources. I'm going to briefly cover the AWS machine learning stack. Not really trying to do a sales pitch here, but it's kind of relevant to understand some of the tools I'm going to use in my project. Um, we have different tools that cater to different levels of, of expertise, basically. Uh, and then I will show you this project I've been working on, which, uh, you know, Lars sort of gave you the, the hint there. It's about knitting. It's an attempt to teach a computer to reverse engineer knitting patterns. And no, you don't need to know anything about knitting for that part. Okay, so state of AI ML. You know, like every week there is some new breakthrough. There's a new video of robots dancing to some song or, you know, defeating the world champion in the game of Go. And those are all fine. Um, but one that's particularly relevant to me and to all of you right now was the success of DeepMind's AlphaFold 2 at the 14th CASP competition. And that stands for a really long acronym that I can't remember because it's 7 a.m. Um, but the goal of this competition is to use AI to predict the structure of proteins. And yeah, proteins are made from a really long ribbon of amino acids, and it sort of folds itself up into twists and turns and tangles. 
And the structure of a protein determines, you know, what it does. Uh, but there's an astronomical number of shapes that each sequence can fold itself into. Um, and researchers have been grappling with this challenge literally going back to the 70s for 50 years. But at last year's competition, end of 2020, AlphaFold predicted the structure of dozens of proteins with a margin of error of 1.6 angstroms. That's 0.16 nanometers. That's atom-sized. This is a massive, shocking achievement. Like if you read news articles about this, like other researchers in the field are like, this is a big deal. And it's going to help researchers understand diseases, design new drugs. So as an example, what you see here in the slide, um, the actual molecule is in green there and the predicted structure is in blue. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but it's pretty close. And incidentally, of course, this protein happens to belong to coronavirus and is implicated in immune evasion. And even more massively, just a few weeks back, DeepMind published the paper and the source code for AlphaFold. It's actually on GitHub. You can go look for it. Um, and they also released predictions for the shape of every single protein in the human body, as well as proteins for like 20 additional organisms that scientists often use in their research. So far, I just looked it up last night, they've released 350,000 newly predicted protein structures. Of course, not all of them are accurate, they're predictions, uh, but it's a really good start for scientists. And they say they'll predict and release the structures for 100 million more in the next few months, more or less all proteins known to science. So that's an example of AI solving really serious problems, important to me and you, uh, and that's awesome. But let's look at some less serious examples. The other area that I really love is using machine learning to generate art. If any of you went to LinuxConf uh, 2018, when it was back in Sydney, I actually organized one of the mini confs that day on art and tech. And I had a whole day uh, with speakers around. Uh, we had someone from uh, uh, talking about procedurally generated landscapes um, using music that they'd written. We had uh, someone talking about Nano Genmo, National Novel Generating Month, which happens every year and is where people try and create a machine learning model that can uh, use code to write a 50,000 word novel. Um, I remember uh, Boing Boing described one attempt as uh, surprisingly plausible. But um, so one of the early techniques that artists really jumped on back in 2014 was called Deep Dream. And you may have seen this, you know, the gist of it is you have this convolutional neural network uh, represented by this very simplified diagram here. And you've trained it to recognize different animals and objects uh, like dog and cat and mouse, you know, uh, all those labels, those output classes on the right. So then if you give it an image of, of a puppy, like this little puppy here as an input, what you expect to see is that the corresponding output neuron for the dog class that lights up. That's why it's yellow. Now, suppose that we give it an input that it's not trained on, some animal that it's not trained to recognize, like a jellyfish. So what we can then do is try and make a series of modifications to this image of the jellyfish to try and get the dog neuron to fire. And after several such iterations, you get something like this. You actually get recognizable dog parts, like snouts and legs. And there's some really cool, very dreamlike art that's been uh, created by this method. Uh, in 2016, neural style transfer sort of exploded. You may have seen the, that Prisma AI app that everybody was using for a while on Instagram. You know, the technology behind this is to separate the elements of an artistic style from the underlying content. So you can sort of like cut and paste the style of one image onto another. Um, so I actually went to a TensorFlow workshop at the Google Sydney office back in 2017 and, and learned about this. And so I have this, hus this is a picture of my husband out on Phillip Island, actually, um, with a horse. And I've applied the style of different, uh, different paintings, uh, which is pretty cool. Another big breakthrough uh, was the development of generative adversarial networks, or GANs. You've probably heard of this, um, where systems can generate realistic looking fake images that don't actually exist in real life. You know, there are horror stories everywhere about, uh, I think it's these people do not exist, uh, where there's all these people who, who are not real. They're completely computer generated. Um, but forget people, this is the internet. Uh, I want you to go to the website, thesecatsdonotexist.com, um, which does the same thing, but for cats. And this was built using the uh, popular style GAN uh, on Amazon SageMaker. And some of them are virtually indistinguishable from reality, um, while others of them are, are a little bit more nightmare fuel, that one in the upper right there. 
But the application of GANs don't need to be limited to just photorealistic output. So this is a piece designed by my friend Jay Rosenbaum. Um, some of you may know Jay. Jay is an artist living in Melbourne, and Jay keynoted at that Art and Tech mini conf I did. They also keynoted at, I believe, uh, DDD. Was it DDD Melbs a few years back as well? Um, so Jay works with 3D modeling, with AI ML, with extended reality technologies. And Jay created these artworks last year during the initial COVID lockdown in Melbourne, the big one. Um, and started with drawings of faces and bodies and then had a neural network generate a landscape from the sketch. Uh, the series is called The Isolation of Being. Um, you should check it out. It's really sorry to see you guys are back in lockdown again. And this is one of the magical machine learning use cases I love the most, getting pizza to people faster. Um, Domino's Pizza, and I don't know if you know this, there are different Domino's franchises around the world, but Domino's Pizza Enterprises Limited is the biggest Domino's franchise holder. It represents Domino's uh, back there in Australia. I think headquarters might, might be in Brisbane. Uh, also randomly here in Germany, where I live now. But so even before the pandemic, you know, Domino's had 70% of their orders uh, coming from online. And so they, they did a lot of study uh, of this data and, and basically made the surprising connection that if they could get pizzas to people faster, they were more satisfied with their meal. So back in 2019, they launched a project called Project 310. It was an initiative that aims to have a pizza ready for pickup within three minutes or safely delivered within 10. So some of the stuff they did that, you know, they had more efficient cooking methods and transportation. They, they physically opened stores closer to where customers live but also they used predictive technologies to help reduce pizza making and delivery times. So they built this system, and I believe there's, there's talks about this and a case study online if you want more details, but they used Amazon S3 as a data lake and Amazon SageMaker to build machine learning models. And basically the stores that have this have this heads up display where as, you know, uh, they can see at any time the likelihood of certain pizzas being ordered and they can start making them ahead of time so they're actually coming out of the oven just as Lars gets the urge to ring up and order his uh, his Hawaiian pizza. And at one store, they actually managed to get delivery times down to just like five minutes. So that's amazing. Okay, so for me, the current interesting stuff happening in AI ML is art, it's cats, it's pizza, and, you know, the survival of the human race. And I don't know about you, those are pretty much the only things that I can actually concentrate on these days. Um, and they're personally more impactful and meaningful and inspiring to me than, than dancing robots or, or self-driving cars or, or ever more realistic chatbots. Um, you know, P.S. Please, everybody get vaccinated. I want to come visit again. So hopefully this has you feeling more inspired. Um, and if you are, you know, you might be wondering how to get started. There's a lot of material on this, obviously a lot of courses and stuff like that. But what one resource I can recommend, uh, just part of the day job here, AWS's Ramp Up Guide for Machine Learning. It's on our website. It links to the free resources and training courses that we have that you can use to start building your skills. Uh, back in February, we also did an event, an online event called AWS Innovate. It had more than 50 sessions about the latest innovations in AI ML, business use cases, architectural best practices. So if you Google AWS Innovate, I believe you can actually still register and watch those sessions on demand if you missed it. Okay, I'm briefly going to talk about AWS's machine learning stack here. Not a sales pitch. It will actually help a little bit when I go into my project to understand sort of the different, the different types of, of tools that we have. Um, but really, AWS has a lot of tools because our mission is to put machine learning in the hands of every developer, every, every software developer. How do we do this? Uh, we do that by building a lot of different AI ML services that cater to different skill levels. And I know this, this looks like a ton, and actually, it's probably out of date already. I, I, there's probably more. Um, but it's roughly three layers. We got frameworks and infrastructure there at the top. We got machine learning services in the middle and we've got AI services at the bottom. So just in real brief, what that means. Those AI services at the top, and I am gonna use one of those in my pro project. Um, this is where models are largely pre-trained for you. And you just access, pre access predictions basically with an API call. Um, so we've got like image recognition of like basic everyday stuff. We've got natural language processing, speech to text, text to speech. Um, and actually at reInvent last year, you see all those new labels. We launched a new suite of anomaly detection tools under the Amazon Lookout brand. In that middle layer there, we've got what we call machine learning services, which, which basically for the most part means Amazon SageMaker. 
So we've got an IDE called SageMaker Studios. It's got all the tools that you need to develop, train, debug, deploy, monitor machine learning models. I'm going to make heavy use of this uh, in my in my demo. Um, and as you can see from all those new labels, again, we, we're bringing out a lot of new features for this every year. And lastly, down there at the bottom, if you want to roll your own, if you're an expert, you know, of course, you you we have the foundational options uh, in the frameworks and infrastructure layer. This is where you can launch a deep learning AMI or a container on whatever hardware you need and manage it however you want. But I'm not going to demo that part because, again, not a machine learning expert. And that brings me to my project. So when I am not uh, messing around with computers or looking at cats that do not exist on the internet, as Lars said, I am often knitting. I took it up as a hobby. Actually, when I first moved to Australia uh, many, many years ago, I've been doing off and on ever since. In fact, uh, when we were, I actually do have knitting right next to me, always have it next to me. Um, when we were in lockdown last year, and we were in lockdown for five months, by the way, last winter, I actually started live streaming my knitting on Twitch, which no joke, I've got 123 followers for my knitting live stream. So knitting underscore with underscore Chris, if any of you want to follow me, or you can watch like 30 plus previous episodes on my YouTube page. But because you all know me as a knitter, all these, these geeks in tech, sometimes I get tagged on tweets like this. Um, and so this is a real tweet uh, uh, from last April, uh, just like, you know, a few a few months back, actually. Um, it turns out this guy's mother uh, turned one of his favorite jumpers into a couch cushion. And he wanted to see if the original jumper could be recreated. And of course, in the replies, somebody jokes, there's got to be an app for that. Um, but actually, and I did comment in the thread for an experienced knitter, um, this is a not an, an, an uncommon thing to do. This is a photo I took in the AWS kitchen back in Sydney uh, in 2019, you know, not long before um, I was thinking about moving to Europe. Um, so I, this is my colleague, Mega. This, she's wearing this beautiful blue jumper. And I'd seen, I'd never seen this stitch before. I'd never seen this particular design. And I took a photo of it because I'm a, I'm a knitting dork and that's what I do. I've done it on the bus. Um, but if I look at this, I can tell you that the background there is, uh, is what we call reverse stocking stitch. That's the sort of background uh, part. Um, those raised zigzag, zigzag lines, those are made up out of three knit stitches. And they use a combination of increases on one side and decreases on the other. And that's why you get the slant. Um, and some of that I get just because I can recognize the texture of what reverse stocking stitch looks like. Um, and some of it is knowing how stitches work, uh, especially if, you can, if you've got a good image or you're looking at something, you can zoom in and read it stitch by stitch, almost like deciphering cursive handwriting. And so, yeah, that's literally reverse engineering. It's taking a man-made object and studying it to deconstruct its design. And of course, you know, we do this all the time in technology and software engineering. But turns out, if you didn't know it, knitters love doing it too. So that's what got me thinking um, about two years ago uh, about this problem. Like if I, if a skilled knitter can reverse engineer a pattern from a, a finished knitted object or even just a picture of a knitted object, why couldn't I train a computer to do it? Turns out I am not the only one who has had this idea. Um, this is a paper that was presented at the International Conference on Machine Learning in June 2019. Right after I started this project, I reached out to an AI ML expert at AWS. She's like, oh, yeah, somebody's already working on that. Um, so the goal of these researchers was to take a photograph of knitting, uh, reverse engineer the pattern, feed that into a knitting machine, because that's also a thing. You know, a lot of the jumpers you buy in stores are, are machine knit on, on knitting machines, and get an identical swatch back out. So they're basically trying to build a knitting replicator a duplicator. But they recognized pretty early on in the project that one problem is that photographs of knitting suck for computer vision, to be frank with you. Because knitting, you know, it's it's floppy, it's stretchy, uh, it's depending on the yarn, it's often fuzzy and hard to see. Um, so they had a breakthrough and their breakthrough was to use both, yes, real knitted swatches in their, and a swatches piece of knitting, real knitted swatches in their training data, but to actually augment that with simulated knitting as well. Um, so those industrial knitting machines I mentioned, a lot of them have really complex software that can actually simulate what the knitted fabric would look like. And they actually managed to get their hands on, these machines cost like hundreds of thousands of dollars, but they got their hands on the software and were able to generate lots and lots of swatches that they could use in their training data as well. And that gave much better results. And so the papers online, 
it has a lot of calculus in it. And I promise you no calculus. Uh, but from what I can tell from the results, they haven't quite cracked it yet. They're getting close. Um, back then, they were, they were about 80% accuracy in their experiments. Uh, and they used both adversarial and generative. They used both convolutional and generative adversarial neural networks. So no, there's not an app for it yet. But we're getting there. And so I decided to try it for myself. I'm drinking my coffee still. All right. So rather than output, though, on reading a pattern stitch by stitch, like I said, like reading reading cursive handwriting, I decided to de-scope, of course, make it simpler, treat it just to start as an image classification problem. So that's where you take an image as an input and you output a class label. It's that slide I showed you with the puppy going to the puppy label. So like how with my with my brain, I can recognize the texture and know that that's reverse stocking stitch and that's garter stitch. I just wanted to build a machine learning model that could do the same. So this was the plan as I saw it. I'd get some training data. How hard could that be? Label it, train a model, deploy it, maybe build a nice web front end for inference and then dance on the grave of the knitting industry, you know, problem solved. Again, had zero, zero practical experience in machine learning at this point. All right, get training data. Uh, this is the first thing you learn. Everybody told me, oh, when you start with machine learning, you will spend 80% of your time getting data and cleaning it up. Um, and I was like, yeah, right. I'm sure I can, sure I can, I can, you know, get that down. So I went and looked at what other researchers had done. If you've ever done this, you know that there are websites like Kaggle where you can download data sets. Um, I couldn't find any knitting ones on there, but it turns out that the folks who wrote that paper I mentioned, uh, they actually did make their training training data set available. So they knitted, I said, they used simulated data, but they also knitted about a thousand pattern samples, really knitted them on that industrial machine in five by five grids. And they had this great idea um, to try and counter some of those problems I mentioned with the floppiness and the stretchiness. They, they knitted a grid into it and they inserted steel rods into that to help it lay really flat and even for photography. Uh, but of course, they, as you can, see, you can see there how they took photos of it. They realized that was not going to scale to the number that they were going to need. Um, so that's when they, they hit on the simulation aspect. But you can download. There's their simulated data set here. It's these researchers at MIT. There's the URL. Um, so I had a look through them. As you can see, they're, they're little sort of different lace and, and different uh, textural patterns. And I, I decided that was probably overkill for what I wanted. I wanted to just identifying like five basic stitches. I didn't need to go to this level. I was going to aim for, if you've ever knitted, uh, stockinette, reverse stockinette, garter stitch, moss, and seed. These are just five very basic combinations of knits and pearls. And so I thought, forget this. I'm going to collect my own data set directly from knitters. You know, I don't know if you know this. There are a lot of us knitters online. We post pictures of our knitting. And I thought, I can leverage this. Um, but I didn't want to spend hours like manually scraping and downloading pictures myself. So I thought I'll build some sort of a, a, a pipeline, a little application that would allow people to send me, send me their images via email. So I'm not going to go through this in time. I've got no time uh, in detail. But the idea, I built a little, a little thing on AWS. The idea is that emails would come in with attachments. I would, you know, check them for viruses and stuff. I would save it in an S3 bucket. And I had a database table where I sort of recorded the details of who sent me what. Um, but the goal was to get them in S3 because I knew I'd need them there for my training jobs. And that saved me having to individually handle every image. So I got this working. And then, of course, I put out a tweet. This is the tweet I made. You may have seen it. You may have retweeted it. It did kind of go viral uh, back in October 2019, asking for knitted samples. Um, so I did write a full blog post. I talked about what I wanted, what I didn't want. You know, I wanted images like this, where it was just a close up of a particular stitch pattern. I also said what I didn't want, you know, all the all the types of images I didn't want. I put the email address and I put this, I put this out on Twitter. I also put it on Ravelry, which is like GitHub for knitters. And yeah. Lots of people started sharing it. They started tagging in their knitting friends and forwarding it. I got a retweet and a reply from, you know, Janelle Shane, who does that uh, AI weirdness blog and newsletter, which she's like the rock star. Um, so it was great. And more importantly, images started to arrive in the bucket. Random human beings around the world, random knitters were actually doing the thing, you know? It's working. Um, and, then, and then I look in the bucket at the images and uh, they weren't all great. You know, sometimes like, people get excited, they don't read quickly, you know, they don't read closely. 
you know, they sent me stitch patterns I wasn't looking for, or they sent me pictures of whole garments, which are really beautiful, but don't really have the resolution I need to see the stitches. Sometimes they'd mess up and attach the wrong images. This one nice lady was like, I think I sent you Halloween candy. You did. So yeah, the first lesson is even with the best of intentions, crowdsourcing your data is uh, not the magic bullet. It is going to result in a lot of cleanup. And I'm not trying to shame or embarrass these folks. They were so nice. They were trying to help me out. Um, but it did mean I, I spent a lot of time cleaning these images up. So I threw out all the dodgy ones. I cropped the rest the best I could to just show the stitch pattern. And then it was time to get them labeled. You actually have to label them so that you can feed them into the machine to train. And so rather than do it myself, I thought, again, I will turn to my fellow knitters. So one of the services we have in that middle layer of the AWS machine learning stack is called SageMaker Ground Truth. Um, and it helps you build accurate training data sets for machine learning by coordinating public and private workforces. Basically, you set up a project in this little UI, and then you can put it out on Mechanical Turk and, and pay people to actually label your images. Or if it's a specialist sort of domain like knitting, you can actually uh, set up your own uh, workforce and have give people a login so that they can log in and do it. So I did that. I put out the call for a volunteer task force and I set up the job. And this is normally where I'd switch to the browser and show you, but I don't want to risk. I've got too much going on here. So I've just got some screenshots if you want to see what the ground truth interface looks like. Um, basically, down the left side there, I had some instructions that you can customize and showing you know what they were looking for. It would give them a random image from the data set. And then it's got labels on the right. Um, and that they picked the, the right option. And you see, I've actually got six options on there. I've, I've got reverse stuck and stitched, stuck in it, um, which is the backside of stuck in it stitch, as I mentioned. I also added other, you know, because I said people did send me some stitches that weren't in the, uh, in the set that I was after. And so other is used for anything other than those. And I also set this up. You can configure it so that every image had to rev be reviewed by at least three people to minimize the chances somebody would, would get it wrong or hit the wrong button. And that was a good thing uh, because I quickly ran into problems um, without spending too much time on this. These are two of the stitches I was trying to review. This is garter stitch and uh, reverse stockinette stitch. Um, they look really similar. In real life, they don't because one's the same on both sides and one's different. Um, but in a flat photograph, I suddenly realized they're really hard to tell apart. I had trouble telling them apart. Um, and so I realized that my labels for these two in particular we're not gonna be very helpful. Two other stitches that I had uh, that I wanted to identify were seed stitch and moss stitch, and they look very different, thought that would be easy. And then I discovered that in British patterns, they use both words to refer to the same stitch, the one on the left. Um, only Americans call the one on the right moss stitch. So again, uh, I realized that I was going to have uh, unreliable labels for those two stitch patterns. So again, like what's that? Like four out of my <laughs> four out of my five are now useless. So time to descope even further. Can I just identify a single pattern? Can I identify stockinette stitch? Let's build stockinette or not. That's what I landed on. Time to train the model. Okay, so I showed you that slide of all the different all the different tools we had. Back in 2019, that slide was a little bit simpler. Um, and basically my best option to go with was Amazon SageMaker. That's that bit in the middle. It's a fully managed service that covers pretty much the whole machine learning workflow. Um, you can use Jupyter, Jupyter workbooks, notebooks, you know, all that stuff. But you can also do it directly in the console, which is what I did. Because remember, pretty much a beginner here. Um, so I ran my training jobs on a single P3 instance, um, and that has GPUs to accelerate your machine learning jobs. And again, I would switch to the console here, but I'm just going to show you screenshots instead to, uh, to save switching around. But basically, when you go to create your training job in SageMaker, you know, you give it a name, you give it roles, you select uh, which algorithm you want to use. It's got a whole bunch in there. I went with the one for image classification. Um, and I was pretty much relying on some blog posts and tutorials that other people had done to show me how to do this. Uh, you set up your um, training data source. You can point it at your S3 bucket, which because I already had them in there, that part was actually pretty easy. Um, you actually create both a training data set and a validation data set. Normally the rules you use about 80% of your data set for training and you set aside 20% of it um, that it will use afterwards to go through and gauge how accurate the predictions are. And, and so you just point it and tell it which bucket and it'll, it'll work that out. Um, 
And <laughs> as you can see, it took me reading up from the bottom. It took me about seven attempts before I got a training job that actually completed. Uh, there's a lot of fields in the UI. I'm not an expert. I'm not going to lie. It's This is a tool that experts use. Um, but I did finally get one that ran. Great. Time to test it out. So then you've got to deploy your model um, so you can host it in production so you can actually use it. Uh, this was the simplest part. You know, in SageMaker, you got to create an endpoint that takes a few minutes to be created. Um, then you can start passing images to it and getting classes back. As I said, like, like almost like calling an API. Um, so this is, you can see, I actually ended up throughout, I ran many training jobs, but I created, you know, three different models. You've got to create an endpoint for uh, an endpoint configuration uh, pointed at a model, and then you create an endpoint that you can actually then uh, have your code talk to. So then I wanted to build off something pretty so that I could show it off and test it out um, with a little bit of a web front end. So my colleague, uh, Gabe Hollenby, who's at AWS in Singapore, uh, some of you may know him, he comes out to Australia or used to pre-COVID fairly regularly. Um, he had this little React app he'd built that he helped me out with. Uh, he's got, he had the code up at the time. Uh, the only tricky bit, just side note, if you're doing this, SageMaker endpoints aren't exposed to the public by default. So I just set up a little Lambda function to act as the intermedi intermediary. It wasn't too hard. And so once that was done, I fired up my little React web app. I pointed it at the endpoint with that first trained model that I had. And I fed it the first image, which was a stuck in at stitch. And oh my God, it got it right. I'm like, I, I nailed it. First try, right out of the gate. Great. Maybe I should try a second image just to be sure. That's not stuck in at stitch. That's garter stitch. Oh crap. It, it got one wrong. So I'm thinking that's, that's not good. I'll, I'll try something else. This, this isn't knitting. That's crochet. It, it's thinking these are all stuck in edge stitch. Something has clearly gone very wrong. Um, so I tried one last image with a sinking feeling in my stomach. That's a cat. That is not stuck in at stitch. So uh, cancel my machine learning PhD. Turns out this is often the case with machine learning. It is extremely unlikely you hit the jackpot. Um, I had to go digging in my logs and I could see that my validation accuracy was 45%. It was like worse than a coin flip. Um, so back to data cleaning and more training. So you saw in that screenshot, I ran lots of different trading jobs, uh, trying to figure out the magic combination of, of different options that would give me the right result. Um, so to minimize the effects of image size and color, I wanted to rule those out. I cropped them all to a fixed size. I converted them to grayscale, so I got rid of the color information. I also rotated every image 90 degrees, uh, which had the added benefit of doubling my sample size. So I think, yeah, I had 368 in that, in that first lot. Um, so I rotated them. I also added in clutter. I learned about this from someone. Um, clutter are images of the things you're not looking for. Uh, dinosaurs and accordions and airplanes. Um, I found a, a set of these images that I could download online. And the idea is to train. If you train the model that everything you give it is knitting, it thinks everything in the world is knitting like a cat. So you got to give it images of stuff that aren't knitting. Um, that got my sample size up to about 900. And I also ran a hyperparameter tuning job, which um, sounds really fancy. But the idea is that, you know, rather than me going in and trying out <clears throat> thousands of combinations, ooh, excuse me, <clears throat> rather than me trying out, you know, thousands of, of literally tweaking little hyperparameters, SageMaker has a thing where it will actually set up a job for you, a tuning job. It will try out hundreds of combinations and figure out the one that works best, like run a little competition. Um, and so I, I did lots of jobs, as you saw. I will show you <clears throat> the best one that I got back in 2019 using SageMaker. Okay, so this is my little um, React app. I recorded this video uh, to show you. Um, and so I'm actually going to drag in, oh, start the video. I'm going to drag in some uh, images here. <coughs> So that's stuck in at stitch and the prediction is stuck in at stitch. So right away, okay, now garter stitch, not stuck in it. This is better. This is already better. All right, I'll draw, drag in a few more. That's seed stitch. Again, not stuck in it as expected. Uh, this is some lace uh, crochet, not stuck in it. Brilliant. Our old friend, the cat, also not stuck in it. I'm feeling pretty good about the model at this time. 
So I gave this talk. One of the places I gave this talk was at Build Stuff Europe. And I actually ran around at the conference and I would be doing this if I were with you and we were all together in Melbourne. I took pictures of people's sweaters on my phone and actually used them in the talk. And so these are these are actually samples of people who are at this particular conference. Um, and it's getting these right. Um, uh, there is at least one that it gets wrong. I think so these are all correct so far. Uh, I think the next one, and I might need to, uh, it doesn't quite fit. I think I clear it and do it. There's one that it gets wrong. Like it's not perfect. It gets, it, there's a, some images, this particular one, it gets wrong. It thinks it's stuck in it. And you can see why stuck in it stitch sort of makes little V's. That's kind of the characteristic I think of when I look for it. Um, and this particular stitch, I don't know what this girl's sweater stitch was. It's probably a brioche or something like that. It's not stuck in it, but it kind of looks like it. So I, I think, I think that's why the model is calling that stuck in it. Um, but anyway, just to give you the stats, uh, my validation accuracy got up to nearly ninety-five percent, um, which is pretty good considering, again, complete newbie at this. Now you are probably sitting there thinking, "Yeah, Chris, you promised us simple, and that all sounds." really complicated. You had to do 15 different jobs. You had to tweak hyperparameters. You'd be 100% right. You know, even with SageMaker taking on a lot of the heavy lifting, I still needed a lot of help from experienced folks to get these results. But I am happy to report that there are other options now. Uh, AWS is always innovating. And literally one month after I went through all of this, uh, I saw this. We announced the availability of Amazon Recognition Custom Labels. So Recognition is one of those AI services at the top layer of the stack. Um, out of the box, it allows you to identify common objects, people, text, scenes in images and video. We actually just release the full list of labels that it can recognize out of the box, and there's thousands. I did note, by the way, it, it claims it can recognize knitting and weaving. It doesn't have crochet. Obviously, I need to test this out. But the reason I didn't use it is you can't use it for custom domains or you couldn't at the time. It could only recognize those things that have been pre-trained on. But we brought out this feature called custom labels where you can build your own specialized image, capability, image analysis capabilities and detect your own objects, different types of objects specific to your use case. So you don't actually have to train the model from scratch. It uses transfer learning. And you can get started with, according to, to the documentation, as little as 10 images. So I couldn't resist the opportunity to see how this compared to my experience using SageMaker. <clears throat> All right, so this is the recognition custom labels interface. And you can tell right off the bat, this is a lot simpler than SageMaker, right? You got like two options. You got projects and you got data sets. Uh, as you can see here, I ran, I did this last April. I ran about five different, uh, different each of these projects is essentially a training job. And you can see that the model performance there on the right. Um, you basically create a data set and then you just click the button. You literally just click a button to train it and it does it. You don't have to, you don't have to do all that configuration. It will determine the best algorithm. It will determine all the hyperparameters it needs and it'll just go off and do it. So here are some of the different data sets that I created because I was testing out different combinations of stuff. Um, as you can see there, the number, number of images. I'll, I'll show you the results of a couple of these. Um, so to create a data set, you actually don't even need to uh, use an S3 bucket. You can drag and drop them into the interface in the console. But the convenient thing was I could actually point it at the labeled training data set that I used SageMaker Ground Truth with before. So it was super fast. If you already have a labeled uh, training data set, you can just literally point it at it. Um, so that was very helpful. Uh, and this is what it looks like in the interface. You know, as I said, you can drag in uh, images. You can actually, it's its almost, actually got a little labeling interface in there. So, you know, if you drag in 50 of your own images, you can actually just label them yourself in the UI. You don't have to use ground truth uh, as I did. Um, so that was really nice. I could go in and tweak the labels on some of my data sets as well. And then when you click train, you see you get the, uh, this is an evaluation of one of the, the, projects that I did. You can see it's got some scores. It tells you I had two labels stuck in it or not stuck in it, 900 images. And you can see here uh, some of the results. And I'll um, I'll show you how to actually, uh, how, how to demo this. Um, we actually have on the AWS GitHub page, uh, some code. There's an Amazon recognition custom labels demo. 
Um, if you scroll down on this, there's actually a, a cloud formation stack. You can just click a button and it will deploy this application in your AWS account. Uh, it, it's very fast. Um, so I didn't have to, you know, get my little React app and doing the doing the the intermediary Lambda function, all that. Didn't have to do any of it. Literally, it was one button click and it created this app for me. This is what it looks like. Um, it creates this nice little UI. It will automatically pick up all of the different projects that you have in your recognition custom labels um, in your account, uh, depending on the region. And you can start and stop models for inference just by clicking uh, on the buttons there. Pro tip, it does, when you click start a model, it does take uh, several minutes for the model to actually be ready for you to start testing. Um, but this is actually what it looks like. So this is the little uh, interface. And so first thing I did, I tested it out with just 10 images to see how that worked. I didn't get great results. That's when I moved to using my whole full um, full training data set that I did with SageMaker. But this is using that same data set. I dragged in here a picture of stock in it, and, and it gives me stock in it stitch. All right, how about garter stitch? Not stock in it. This is looking good. How about our friend the cat? Not stock in it stitch. So I actually found that using recognition custom labels, um, taking that exact same data set, creating a model with this, I got comparable performance. You know, it still misidentified that one girl's sweater stitch, um, but it was basically comparable performance. And it took me like 20 minutes and five clicks to actually do this. It was so fast. Um, the metric, it uses slightly different metrics uh, to, to, to derive the performance. It's like the ratio of true positives to false positive rolls those up into an F1 score, not an expert. Basically, it's not a like for like comparison to the numbers you get out of SageMaker, but you get the idea here. We're looking at like 97, 98. Amazing, way simpler, way, way, way simpler. But wait, there's more. I was so blown away by this and that that I got comparable results with like so little, so little effort. Um, I thought, hey, why don't I spend a little more time trying to actually expand my scope, back up, go back to trying to actually identify more than just stuck in it or not, trying to identify different stitches. Um, so I spent a couple hours in that little interface, uh, creating another data set and going in and actually relabeling different stitches um, for garter, seed, moss, and other. I left out reverse stock in that stitch because again, even I can't tell that one apart. But after training that on the different stitches, so this is, uh, you can actually just select a different model in the app to test out. So this is using that. So you can see here, it knows that this is stock in that stitch. It's got that uh, correct. How about, uh, this is moss stitch. It actually distinguishes between moss and seed stitch. This is a rib. So it's actually identified this as other. Um, so you can see it's got the Vs. That, that are in stocking stitch, but it, it mixes up the knits and the pearls. Um, so this is not stuck in that stitch. And I'm re actually really impressed that it got this one correct. Um, so I've actually been able to go back and expand my scope out. And this is looking really promising. I'm, I'm still working on this. Just to sort of give you an overview of, of how these two different methods uh, compare. So remember, we had recognition custom labels, which is that pre-trained up at the top. <clears throat> I gave it my, my, my training data and it just does everything for you. Um, versus SageMaker, which is in that middle level where you have to, you know, it does a lot of the heavy lifting. You don't have to roll your own completely, um, but you do still need a sort of lot of custom knowledge. Um, this just shows you a little bit of the comparison here. Uh, training time um, was one. Again, with SageMaker, you can choose what sort of uh, instance your training job runs on. As I said, I ran, <laughs> I mean, I work for AWS. I threw like some rather large machines at it. So it took 33 minutes. My hyperparameter optimization training job, I actually let that run for 13 hours. You know, I think you can, you can run it for, you know, as long as you want. Recognition custom labels. When you click the train button, it just goes off and does it. You have no control over it. Um, and so the one I did, uh, the comparable, the same lab, data, data set here took 50 minutes. Um, in terms of cost, that's one of the big, big differences between these two methods. Uh, SageMaker, you pay. Um, so the ground truth labeling job was the same. I, I, you know, it was the same for each. There is a free tier for ground truth. Um, you get, I don't think I have it on here. Uh, oh yeah, you do. Um, you get your first 500 labels in the first two months you use it for free. Um, but it starts uh, at eight cents per labeled image for less than 50,000 images. 
That's not counting if you use Mechanical Turk. Obviously, if you're paying someone to label for you, that'll be more. But so basically, my training job for 900 images cost me about 80 bucks. Um, then the actual training of the model itself, um, uh, you pay for provision storage, you pay for data transfer, you pay for the time running the instance. Um, there is a free tier for StageMaker. You get 50 hours on an M4 extra large or M5 extra large. You get 125 uh that the sorry, no, that's for inference. For for the free tier for training, you get 50 hours on one of those instances. Um, but I added it up here, and you can see it's about 50 bucks for training that I spent. I didn't run this on spot. You can run these jobs on spot instances that can save you huge amounts. That can save you like 90%. Um, I didn't do that on this particular one to give you the, the sort of maximum there. And then for inference, um, that's where you pay for storage, you pay for data transfer, that's where you're actually hosting hosting the endpoint and, and running uh, predictions against it. Um, and so it's about $1.12 an hour for running my inference instance, um, plus storage and data transfer there. It's a lot simpler on the pricing side. Over on recognition custom labels, you basically got um, a flat fee of $1 an hour for training. Uh, but as I said, you don't really have control over how long that training job can, can run. One of my training jobs actually ran for four hours. Um, and it will actually decide, it can, it might not match clock time because recognition does this cool thing where it will decide how many instances to use. Um, and so it may run multiple resources in parallel uh, to train your model more quickly. And so, um, you know, it, it might take one hour on the clock. It might actually, that might equate to two or three hours of instance time behind it. But we do see that like 90% of the models need less than 24 hours to train. Um, if it goes on longer than that, if it hits 72, they will actually, it will automatically shut down and you won't get charged for that. Inference is where you pay a lot more on this. We pay $4 an hour flat fee for while you have those, uh, those models running. So this is not something where you want to turn it on and leave it running 24 seven to run your, your predictions against. You want to turn it on, run a bunch and turn it off again. That's where recognition custom labels really shines. If you're building something where you want it to be on all the time, then maybe you want to use SageMaker. But ultimately that last line, like the last two boxes here, I got comparable results and recognition custom labels was so much easier to use that for a non-expert, I, I can't help but recommend it. It's so simple. Um, and you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, this was a blog post last November from one of the AWS heroes, Luca Bianchi. He's um, he's in Milan. And so Luca did the same thing I did. Luca had built out a model with SageMaker and then he compared it. Um, his use case was like snapshots of heating and ventilation systems to check cleanliness and air quality. And so he had a data set of like 2,300 images. He got them labeled. He's a bit of an expert. He used PyTorch. He used the fast AI library. Um, he deployed a model on SageMaker and he got accuracy of like 92%. So then he took that same training data set, did exactly what I did, fed it into recognition custom labels and found that it gave comparable accuracy without needing the help of a data scientist. Um, you know, I think he, he he calls it like pretty, he's pretty shocked in this blog post as well. And this, incidentally, this is kind of the perfect use case uh, for something like recognition custom labels because, you know, you can actually just spin up the model for inference, batch up all your images and run them through and then shut it down, which will help optimize on the costs. So I'm coming up to the end here. Um, I just want to give some thank yous. Uh, 53 knitters around the world sent images to me for my training data set. Uh, maybe some of them are watching right now. Um, 14 humans collectively spent nearly 15 hours labeling and clicking more than 3,000 buttons to label all these images. Um, and I also benefited from advice and guidance from some of my colleagues, Gabe Hollenby and Aparna Alangaban. So this is what we covered today. I talked to you a little bit about the state of AI ML, some of the cool stuff that's happening. Really look up um, AlphaFold and DeepMind. As I said, you can check out their source code and look at some of the predictions for uh, human protein structures that they're actually now making public. Talk to you about art and cats and getting pizza to people faster, which is really all that's getting me through this, this time that we live in right now. I pointed you to the AWS ramp up guide for machine learning just as one way of getting started. And remember, if you Google AWS Innovate, that was our recent AIML conference. You can actually see some of the videos online if you want more examples from people who are experts in this stuff. I gave you a little overview of, of the stack at AWS, as I said. 
and, and I know other providers have, have similar tools where you've got pre-trained models that you can just use out of the box uh, just by calling APIs. We have SageMaker that in the, across the middle where if you, are, uh, if you know a bit, um, you can really have a lot of control over how you train and deploy your models. And then of course, we've got those foundational services around the bottom for machine learning experts and data scientists who, who want control over every aspect of, of their machine learning workflow. And then I walked you through my knit ML project to try and teach a computer to recognize different knitting stitches. And I'm actually really pleased with how this is going. So I've, I've after descoping it down to just stuck in it or not, I've gone back up to being able to identify multiple stitches. Um, so now I'm going to continue on with this. And uh, my new project is to see if I can actually use a photo to count the number of rows because I'm lazy. And when I'm knitting, I just want to take a picture and have it tell me how many rows I've knitted. So that's that's the next iteration of this project. All right, I think, uh, I don't know how much Q&A time we have, but if you would like to ask me uh, questions for Q&A, we do have a uh, Slido here um, and you can jump over to there. But Lars, you're back. Hello. Hey. Hey. Yes, I'm back. Um, oh my yeah, gosh, so I finished my I, coffee. It's getting cold here. Yeah, I finished mine. It's, it's right there in front of me. You, um, yeah, I think you just mesmerized people. I, I find it fascinating, the ML world, I think. So I used it recently. I think I used it anyway. Google has a feature on the Android phone called Google Lens, I think yes, it is. Yes, I've used that for translation here in Germany. I've, I've yeah. used that for trees because we have a bunch oh. of trees and I live in a farm and one of them had died and I was wondering why it died and I tried to, to recognize it. And I recognized that one on the leaves, which I thought was kind of cool. And I also I now know I have an Algerian oak tree. There you go. But you could also use the bark. So it was all different oh, wow. things that it would recognize it on. So I thought that was kind of useful. Like you said, yeah. hey, laziness solves many things or encourage you to solve many things, right? So <laughs> there's so many examples of like, you know, when you see a lot of these talks, it's like, now we will predict the cost of housing. And it's like, ugh, that's yeah, not interesting uh, to me. No. Identifying a tree, that's cool. Oh, you know? oh, yeah. oh, oh, sorry. Um, recently, sorry, I'm a total Lego nerd, right? There oh, was a I saw your video. Your video oh, went. You did. I did, of course. Everybody was talking about that. <laughs> it was amazing. There's an app called Bricket, yeah. and you, you, you just take a photo of your pile of Lego blocks, right, which are on the floor, and and it figures out what you can build from them. It's amazing, and it doesn't have to be the right colors or anything. It's it's quite, and it's a, like a beta. It's a really early thing. Yeah, I did have to use an Apple device to run it, but you know, we'll gloss over that. Um, so yeah, I just I was amazing. It was just so good. The whole oh, oh there's a question about what we. Where can we get knitML? <laughs> oh, um, that's a good point. I can put my training. I actually have not made a training data set available, but I will. <laughs> I absolutely, you're right. I crowdsource this. I should make it available. I don't know why that nobody's asked me that before. I there will put it up on my GitHub if people yeah, yeah, want to yeah. play with it. I will absolutely do that. Um, okay. I mean, there's no real code for it. You know, I did it in the in the console. That's right. Um, but I can also uh, give you, I'll tweet out the URL to that recognition custom labels app. Yeah, that do I that. Use. I'll do yeah, that. Yeah, that'd be well. good. Um, yeah, we are. <laughs> oh, there's so many applications on there. I was, um, I've set up a, a camera that just films my llamas, right? And it's just streaming online. But I wanted to use machine learning to tell people when there is a llama, because most of the time there isn't one, because it's a big paddock. That's and so why you were tweeting about llamas. I know. And uh, I haven't quite finished it yet, but basically I have a model that will tell you whether it's a llama or not. Um, so if there's, you know, something in the picture, it'll tell you if it's a llama or not. It even recognized it wasn't a llama when it was an alpaca. I thought that was impressive. And oh. again, I didn't do any coding. That's yeah. all just machine learning, right? So. Well, I, I am working interesting... on another project, um, a sneak preview for reInvent. I'm working with a couple people Ooh. on um, on a beer recommendation engine. Because, oh dear. you know, in the old New world, testers? we would go places. Yes. So, see, you'd travel places. You'd be in another city and you'd be like, I wonder what local beers I would like. And, you know, I've yeah. got hundreds of beers in Untapped. Why can yeah, I yeah, not yeah. actually get myself a prediction? So, uh, mm. a few of us are, uh, I'm working on this. We'll see how well, we go. Well, um, Germany is the perfect sample <laughs> market. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, so much goodness. Yeah. Oh, that's beer awesome. Pizza and art. All the important things in life. <laughs> And, and alpacas. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Chris. That was that was really good. I, I, oh, really, thank you. I genuinely enjoyed that. That was, and you know, I'm not a knitter, 
but yeah, it's just the application of a real world thing onto something that's a bit more abstract just really makes it come to life, I think. So um, that's that's all we have, um, I think, from, from Chris Howard, unless you want to add something at the end. Where can we see you next, Chris? Oh, gosh. Um, do I have Reinvent? any Aussie? I'm st I mean, the good thing is because the time zones, I'm still getting to do the occasional Aussie Aussie thing. Um, probably oh, yeah. reInvent will be the next big one, I, I'm guessing. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. sounds good. Look oh, forward to that as no, well. Femtech oh. Conf. Femtech Conf is coming up. I'm speaking at that one. It's a conference online for for women, women in tech. Um, oh, it's really, okay. it's a global one. I'll share, I'll tweet that out. Please, people come to that one. It's going to be pretty I good. can't go then. Um. <laughs> No, that's You're allowed awesome. to watch. Come on. Yeah, okay, then. Uh, no, thank you so much, Chris. And um, right. thanks for joining NDC Melbourne. I uh, miss we'll you see... all. I can't thanks wait to see much. you again. I can't wait to visit. <laughs> all righty. So next up, we are going to have a bunch of prizes. But first, just a quick word from our sponsors. I love running this company. I love running it because uh, of the people I deal with. There's such a great team of people. From a career perspective, it's the best move I ever did. Being a great consultant, which we are, this is W, is half-half between technical skills and communication. It's given me the opportunity to work with lots of different types of technology and explore some stuff that I maybe only dabbled in at university or before. SSW is a company that makes enterprise software solutions uh, and that's what we do. We build software for clients uh, on demand. We build bespoke solutions using the latest technology and the latest best practices. I've been involved in the development of some mining software, been involved in the development of software for a legal firm and everything in between there. Even in just under two years, I've been working across so many different projects it's just a really great place to come into and I always look forward to coming to work. As an investor or wealth professional, you want a wealth provider that is flexible, smart and tech savvy. A provider with fresh eyes who sees opportunity to present wealth solutions differently. A partner who can administer wealth your way. NetWealth was created with an entrepreneurial spirit to do all of this. We exist to help you see your wealth differently, to realise your potential, to inspire you to discover a brighter future. At our core, we are a technology company, a super fund, an investment specialist, an administration business. But in our daily lives, we are you. Mums and dads, call centre operators, sales and marketing professionals, analysts, netball teams, friends, technologists, developers, and most importantly, family. To investors, we provide award-winning superannuation and investment accounts, products, and services. To wealth professionals, we provide a market-leading platform to better their business. Underlying all of this is cutting-edge technology anywhere, everywhere. With us, you can see your wealth differently and more positively. We identify new opportunities with our fresh perspective and natural curiosity. We provide choice through our flexible approach to business and product design. We prioritise your security to give you peace of mind. We are involved in your world. In schools, we support financial literacy, helping our younger Australians also see wealth differently. We are a team of talented people working hard to make life better for more Australians. We are creators. We are curious, always looking to spot the change that matters. We are authentic and genuine. We believe that strength is in teamwork. We are agile and nimble, upbeat, energetic and optimistic about the future. With us, you can see wealth differently because we are different in our approach, our attitude, our commitment and our spirit. Partner with us to see what's possible. Alrighty, we have a bunch of uh, prizes to go through here. So they're all uh, listed on the expo.ndcmelbourne.com if you click on the uh, NDC prizes. And I'm just going to read them out so we know what we're playing for here. Uh, there's 20 digital keep cups, six Xiaomi Mi Bands, and an Apple smartwatch from SSW. We're just going to draw 
a band and the smartwatch. The rest of them will do after the fact because otherwise it gets a bit long, but we will notify all the winners. Uh, Combank has a $250 Uber Eats voucher and Apple AirPods. Telstra Purple has a $200 Amazon gift card. Uh, NetWealth has $250 Amazon gift cards. Azanex has $200 gift pay vouchers. Webjet has $150 and a $200 Amazon gift card. And NDC is giving away a free pass, all access pass for next year's NDC Melbourne as well. So um, with that, if we can uh, bring up the wheel of many names, that would be awesome. There we go. Tap to spin. So uh, I'm just going to go for it. So the first one we have up is a Xiaomi Mi Band. And we will note all the names as well. Sadar so Kilic has won the band. Oh, it even does all the... Uh, um, clapping everything. I don't know if you can hear that. All right. So then we have a Apple smartwatch from SSW. And the winner is Ian Thompson. Congratulations, Ian. And I'm not watching the YouTube stream, so I'll let my colleagues shout at me if I'm missing something here. Uh, Combank has a $250 Uber Eats voucher, and that is won by Dom Miller. Congratulations, Dom. And also from CBA or from Commonwealth Bank, we have a uh, some Apple AirPods, and they are going to Michael Madry. Congratulations, Michael. Fantastic. And we keep going. Telstra Purple has a $200 Amazon gift voucher. So we spin the wheel. And that's Sebastian Boisbazier. I'm sorry, I just butchered your name, Sebastian. Um, congratulations with that. Then we have NetWealth has $250 Amazon gift vouchers. So the first one goes to Ram Ramanathan. There you go. Congratulations, Ram. And the second $150 gift voucher from NetWealth is goes to Matthew Wicks. Congratulations, Matt. Fantastic. All righty. And then Azenix has $200 gift pay vouchers. Now, gift pay is uh, it's kind of like a a gift card that works in a million different places and stores. So you can kind of choose where you want to use it. Um, the first one is won by Devanshu Singh. Congratulations, Devanshu. And the second $100 gift pay voucher from Azenix goes to Ruben Bond, who also won a hoodie earlier. Fantastic, Ruben. Well done. And we'll remove Ruben from the listing here. Now we have the $150 uh, Amazon gift card voucher from Webjet, and that goes to Sihan, Chihan. Sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. So Budak, well, well done. And then we have a $200 Amazon gift voucher, which goes to Manoj. I'm not even going to try the last name. I'm sorry, <laughs> but congratulations, Manoj, from the $200 gift voucher for Amazon from Webjet. And then the big prize, the all-access pass for next year's NDC Melbourne, which is, I don't know how much that's worth, a lot. Um, Jakob can probably inform me of that. But, yeah, it's so for next year, 2022, NDC Melbourne, all-access pass, which means you can go to workshops and the, and the conference itself in person. Fingers crossed. We really want to do that. And the winner goes to Stephen Carter. Well done, Stephen. Fantastic. Very good. So those are all the gift prizes um, for now. We can go away from the uh, from the screen share if you want. And um, all I have to say is congratulations to all the winners. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining and being part of NDC Melbourne here as a live stream on YouTube. It's been a fantastic joy just to uh, you know have everybody join tonight, tonight, today. And um, just if you can bring in my co-hosts as well, if they're still here. <laughs> there we go. We got William and we got Melissa as well. Thank you so much, everybody. There might be a bit of echo here in the audio, but um, thank you. It's been yeah, fantastic. And um, with a whole bunch of echoing, see everybody and thank you. And uh, hope you have a great day and see you next time.